Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be reconnected with my co-chair, Senator Lieberman, and the rest of my fellow commissioners. I, uh, I don't think I'm gonna speak for all of them, but I'd like to think they at least share this point of view. This, is, I think, is our fourth Zoom meeting. And while I very much appreciate the, the quality of the technology and its enabling powers and uh, capability to continue our work we've been doing together for over five years, I am anxious for the days when we can uh, do it in person together. But uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, before I begin, I think it's important to note uh, and express my gratitude to the Hudson Institute. Uh, they continue to serve as our fiscal sponsor. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity they have provided over the years to the commission as we conduct our activities, particularly in these very, very challenging and difficult times. Uh, it goes without saying, all of us, all of us on this commission are very, very grateful for the extraordinary support we've received uh, from our donors. Uh, their work addressing biodefense uh, and our work addressing biodefense couldn't possibly uh, be achieved without their uh, sustained generosity to our effort, and so we want to thank them as well. Uh, we are here today to discuss the status of the commission's recommendation in light of, unfortunately, uh, global events. Uh, when we first issued our report in 2015, remember a national blueprint for biodefense, we included 30 recommendations and 87 very specific action items uh, we, we thought would uh, enhance the federal government's ability to identify and then address biological threats. Uh, five years ago, we identified these problems that we felt required uh, solutions. And uh, frankly, we were proffered uh, to uh, political people in this town uh, a pathway to those solutions. Uh, unfortunately, the threat still caught the nation flat-footed uh, when Mother Nature finally threw uh, her terror at us through this pandemic. The blueprint was a tool we felt could help the government actually put its house together, get its house in order before the nation actually faced a large scale biological incident. I might uh, editorialize, we anticipated that the potential economic impact on our economy could reach the unfathomable amount of a trillion dollars. And we know that uh, we're now beyond that 3X, 4X and more is to come. But more importantly than the uh, fiscal impact, we now approach uh, 250,000 of our fellow Americans who no longer are with us due to COVID-19. To the members of the commission are very grateful to those in government uh, who heeded the call and took up some of our recommendations over five years ago. Uh, but obviously uh, more work needs to be done. The job is incomplete. There are still many recommendations in the blueprint uh, some of which we will have we will have the opportunity to discuss today, which haven't been implemented. And, and as we felt all along uh, five years ago that the, any pandemic would certainly not be the last biological threat we would face, and certainly COVID-19 is not the last biological threat this country or the world will confront. Uh, Mother Nature has a way of uh, returning from time to time, sometimes with even greater fury than the previous episode. We need to learn from the tragedy, because it is a tragedy, and apply these lessons to further, to future biological threats. One of the speakers we have today, I might add Dr. Hillary Carter, who hails from Stone State, had a principal hand in drafting the National Biodefense Strategy. The creation of the National Biodefense Strategy was a key recommendation we issued in our blueprint. And we're grateful and very pleased that our Dr. Carter, and many others. The strategy was finally issued in September 2018. We know there's a long way to go from strategy to implementation. There's a huge gap there, and hopefully the commission can be supportive of any and all congressional efforts to close the gaps which we identified over the past five years. So with those introductory comments, I'd certainly like to turn it over to my friend and colleague, co-commissioner, co-chair, uh, Senator Levin from some opening remarks. Uh, Joe. Uh, thanks, Tom, uh, Governor. Uh, great to be with you and our colleagues on the uh, commission. 
uh, again, we're meeting uh, at, a, at a particularly uh, ominous, critical uh, time period in our efforts to respond uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. As you said, the number of deaths is now in the hundreds of thousands and the number of Americans uh, who have been infected is in the millions and uh, going up uh, rapidly right now. Uh, this is clearly the worst infectious disease outbreak our nation and in fact the world has experienced since the 1918 Spanish flu influenza during which uh, at least 50 million people uh, died, were killed by the flu worldwide, including about 650,000 Americans, uh, which as I've said to my colleagues on the commission, included um, uh, my paternal grandmother, who obviously I never therefore was able to know, nor, nor was my father. Um, we now seem to be entering um, hard to believe after all we've done and seen and tried to do, uh, the, the most devastating phase of the pandemic. Um, so it's critical as um, government turns from one administration to another, from one Congress to another, that the incoming administration and Congress begin the difficult but necessary work of assessing uh, what went right in, in responding to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, what went wrong, and uh, how we can prevent the incalculable loss of life when, not if, uh, the next biological uh, attack against America occurs, whether it is natural uh, or man-made. Uh, in the National Blueprint for Biodefense, which was our foundational report issued in 2015, we concluded right at the outset that America was, and I quote, dangerously vulnerable to an infectious disease pandemic or a bioterrorist attack. And we said, while biological events may be inevitable, the level of impact on our country is not, end quote. In other words, there are things we can do to get ready for it. Um, in, in predicting that a, a biological uh, attack, including an infectious disease pandemic, were coming, we were just reflecting what we learned from the experts uh, who we met with. Uh, and from the history uh, we learned of uh, what used to be called plagues, and now um, I think appropriately are called uh, uh, pandemics. Um, so we, we issued our report that Governor Rich has talked about to make specific suggestions to motivate federal government uh, reactions to try to close the dangerous gaps that we found in our nation's ability to address uh, biological pathogens. To some extent, uh, Congress uh, has recognized the severity of the threat since then and uh, acted on some of the solutions uh, we uh, offered. To date, 27 of the 87 action items from our uh, blueprint, re blueprint report of 2015 have been addressed, at least in part through congressional action, but unfortunately, uh, many have not been implemented of those that are, uh, have been enacted. Many have not been implemented or funded adequately. Uh, uh, the executive branch has also taken steps to address the biological threat. Federal departments and agencies adopted policies to address 15 of the 20, I'm sorry, of the 87 action items from our uh, 2015 report, including significantly in the fall of 2018, uh, President Trump issued an executive order outlining, as we had uh, recommended, a national biodefense strategy. But again, implementation and funding uh, was inadequate. So when uh, COVID-19 struck uh, earlier this year, um, we were painfully unprepared uh, and um, that's what we, we really cannot ever let happen again. Today's meeting uh, has a wonderful group of witnesses, guests, uh, and we will explore with them several of our 
2015 report's recommendations that have not been addressed uh, by the Congress or the administration. These recommendations uh, in particular are ones that we feel could, if implemented, uh, have blunted the impact of the current pandemic and will, if implemented in the near future, make America better prepared to deal with the next pandemic or bioterrorist attack. Uh, as the current Congress comes to a close, our country's elected leaders really must start looking for answers to the problems revealed in the federal government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Politicians on both sides of the aisle cannot afford to let this moment pass without aggressive and uh, urgent remedial action. And we on this commission are ready and eager to help Congress and uh, the incoming Biden administration in this uh, review and reform process in any way we can. I, I wanna say in that regard that among the witnesses, I'm very uh, happy to say is um, uh, our friend and former colleague, at least for Tom, Peschel and me, uh, Senator Lamar Alexander of uh, Tennessee, uh, who will be joining us to discuss some of his ideas to strengthen the uh, biodefense enterprise, particularly with regard to the medical supply constraints that have plagued um, COVID-19 pandemic response efforts. And I must say um, that Lamar has, um, I'll repeat this when he's here, <laughs> but he has had a wonderful record of, of, work, of really trying to work across party lines to deal with um, real problems. And um, it, it's unfortunate that he's leaving the Senate now, but uh, I'm sure he'll be helpful in other ways. Uh, also among our witnesses are people who will talk us, to us about uh, the preparedness, uh, both at the beginning and now, of, of hospitals in America. And this is a real uh, current fear, as all of us know that the surge in COVID-19 cases around the country uh, is beginning to overwhelm the capacity of many of America's hospitals. So we'll ask those witnesses uh, if that is true and if it is what we can do uh, to make sure that we don't uh, uh, have to experience the nightmare of uh, intensive care unit um, beds being all filled with people uh, unable to get uh, care for COVID-19 or other uh, urgent uh, illnesses. Uh, it's been five years since our 2015 report. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, just as we said at the beginning of it, unfortunately, we are still vulnerable. But the, but the painful experience of COVID-19 uh, has taught us a lot. And uh, of course, we've responded with a fury. I think Tom Bridge of your comment about when somebody asked you at a hearing on our committee, what was it like to be the first Secretary of Homeland Security? And you said, it's like being asked to pilot a plane that's still being built uh, to some extent because we weren't ready when the when the COVID-19 struck, um, our government and the private sector just uh, rushed frenetically to get it done. And a lot has been done but it would have been a lot better uh, if we were ready. Our, our commission, I, I wanna say, is in the final stages of work on an implementation status report, examining what additional work we think is needed to address the uh, recommendations of our 2015 report in light of our experience with uh, COVID-19. Um, and we're, we're gonna use the testimony today as part of that report. We. Uh, intend to release in January. Uh, as we've said elsewhere, we're also, we've also commenced work on what we call an, the Apollo Project uh, to uh, uh, build and support public-private uh, partnerships to develop uh, with the extraordinary technologies that we're seeing succeed in the development of a vaccine for COVID-19, universal vaccines and better testing systems. So we're ready uh, uh, the next time um, this danger strikes. Um, anyway, with well, thanks to all of our witnesses, all of our colleagues, uh, uh, and to our staff um, for all their work, I, I turn it back to you, Governor Tom. Well, thank you very much, Joe. You know, it's. I just want to highlight uh, again. We're preaching to the choir, but uh, given some of the the political. Uh, 
political environment we're under, we're under these days, a great polarization. I think a great tribute to this commission has been its uh, sustained bipartisan uh, effort to address in a very serious, comprehensive, and substantive way uh, a, a problem uh, that we felt existed a long time ago. And as we've seen uh, with the impact of COVID-19, it doesn't pick uh, uh, political sides. It's a, it's a basically uh, ravaging uh, Republicans and Democrats alike. I just, right. in, this, in this polarized environment, I would like to think that uh, going forward, uh, that we can find the same kind of uh, bipartisan support for some of these recommendations we've made in the past and, and find out they'll find their way into legislation or regulation. It is, uh, it's a real challenge for us as a country from a political point of view, but it certainly has been a, not been a challenge for us internally with three R's, three D's and experts from around the country. So I'm very proud to be associated with it. Thank you. Bain, I'd like to introduce the former Senate Majority Leader, your colleague and friend and mine as well, Senator Tom Daschle. Tom? Thank you very much, Tom. And I would just say that the reason we have the environment we do working with uh, Republicans and Democrats is because of the leadership that you and Joe have set and the tone and the example that you both set each and every time we're together. So. Uh, I applaud that and applaud the remarkable degree of commitment that you two have made to this effort. We're, I don't know that there's words to express the dismay, the disappointment, the anger, the frustration that many of us have with regard to our current circumstances. Uh, I work a lot with Japan and uh, Japan has 127 million people. And so far in this entire crisis, they've only lost 1,900 people. Uh, we've lost 250,000. They've lost 1,900. Uh, that says all you need to know about the degree of incompetence, the degree of extraordinarily dysfunction, dysfunctional uh, institutional reaction that we have experienced now these 10 years. And I, I, I think there are four buckets that we have to think about as we as we look to how we address this going forward. The first is the one that obviously we have to address and that's the proper infrastructure and, and the funding for that infrastructure. We've spent a lot of time and that was really what our first report was about is uh, assuming that it would be competent and assuming we'd have leadership, here's what the infrastructure ought to look like. Uh, and so we're, we're certainly a, appropriately focused on infrastructure and, and the resources around the need to to provide that infrastructure, but that's just the beginning. Uh, the second is you have to assume and you have to figure out a way for the institutions to work. Uh, I think we're at a state of dysfunction in Congress that we haven't seen in all of American history. Uh, just to remind my colleagues, and I don't, I know you, none of you need to be reminded, the last time we passed a COVID relief bill was in May. We've had to go through June, July, August, September, October, and now all of November, and it looks like now December, and we will not see a COVID relief bill. So we can do all the planning, we can build all the infrastructure we want, we can call for all the resources we want, but if Congress is gonna be that dysfunctional, what does that say about this country? And what does it mean uh, for the millions of people who are literally dying, who are literally unemployed, I've heard so many horror stories from people who, who don't know how they're gonna survive this winter. And it, it just brings tears to your eyes. You just wanna cry when you know how incredibly desperate they are. And this Congress sits there and has no excuse for their inability to respond to the incredible crisis we're facing. And that takes me to the third bucket is leadership. I'm dismayed at the leadership. I, 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 I like you, I wish, how I wish and dream and hope and pray that we're gonna have leadership someday that can come together to start addressing the challenges we face. But there is none, there is none. And we're suffering the consequences. And all the other countries who watch us in dismay as well wonder what happened to the American Democratic Republic. How is it possible that this glorious country that set the example for the rest of the world can't even respond as well as Japan has so consistently now for these last 10 months. 
And then the fourth and final thing is citizen participation to best practices. Uh, I, I, I talked, I was telling some of our colleagues before we got on, and some of you may have heard this, but I know a, I have a very, very close friend who's a doctor in a small town in South Dakota. Uh, in that town, one out of every 20 people have coronavirus. Uh, they've filled the hospital. They're using uh, storage facilities for beds. They don't know what to do. But he said they can't even get people to wear a mask. So somehow, it's just amazing to me that we can't find greater American citizen participation. I always think of World War II and how everybody came to the fore and rose to the occasion. You know, we had Rosie the Riveter and we had all these American people wearing flags on their back saying, I'm going to do whatever I have to for my country. Where is that now? I don't know. But I must say, I, I'm ranting and I apologize for that. But I, uh, let's get on to the hearing. Now, Tom, I must tell you that uh, we share your point of view. I'm not sure we could have expressed it as eloquently and with as much passion that you just did, but uh, I believe your colleagues, both R's and D's on this commission, uh, share that frustration and are grateful that you were able to articulate it in such a powerful way. So thanks. Amen. Tom. Thanks, Tom. Well done. Well done. You know, my great pleasure to work with, for many, many years, uh, another member of the panel, uh, Jim Greenwood, a former colleague of mine, representative from Pennsylvania. Uh, Jim, uh, we'd like you to uh, offer some thoughts with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I, I feel like all I can say is, yeah, what he said, what Tom said, but uh, I'll make some brief comments because I know we want to hear our, from our speakers. Um, we all remember uh, in the first surge of this, of this pandemic, uh, the acute shortage of PPE, personal protection equipment. We didn't have enough masks, we didn't have enough gowns, we didn't have enough gloves, we didn't have enough ventilators, we didn't have enough swabs. And it was chaos and, and frantic searches from uh, hospitals and, and first responders, um, states competing against states to acquire the, this stuff, uh, flying uh, materials in from overseas, relying on the Defense Production Act. Um, and and here we are uh, now uh, seeing it happen all over again. Uh, 1,500 nurses, just nurses, have died from the COVID. We'll be reading this morning about teachers, but nurses and doctors who have suffered and died from this disease for lack of, of adequate equipment. And, and that's so discouraging because five years ago, in our blueprint, we said, let's have every urban area should have a system of stratified hospitals. Um, they sh we should forward deploy all the PPE and equipment that would need would be needed in a pandemic like this. CMS should reimburse the hospitals uh, to make sure that they could acquire all of that was needed. And ha had that happened, um, it we would be in an entirely different situation than we've been in um, and are now re-entering uh, and seeing shortages all over again. So I, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Dr. Mike Casey, who participated in the, the FEMA working group to organize distribution of medical supplies across the country in the early months of, uh, of the pandemic. And also from David Starr, who um, was involved in the local um, uh, uh, problems and solutions in the city of New York. So um, uh, again, thank you all of my colleagues for being with us this morning and uh, turn it back to you, Tom. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, Ken Weinstein has been with us from the get-go, former Homeland Security Advisor, uh, again, contributing to this, uh, I find, uh, rather remarkable effort over the past five years to build out a framework for action, uh, legislative and regulatory action. Uh, and uh, Ken, uh, your thoughts, please. Thanks, Governor. And um, let me just second your points at the outset about how it's great to see everybody, but also I miss being in person. I will say some of the high points of the last five years have been gathering with you all, sharing thoughts, but also being friends with you. And um, we're friends virtually, but it's, uh, I miss those days when we were together. I look forward to getting back together in person with you and, uh, and the rest of the team. Um, but thanks to the team for continuing to forge on, even in the, the virtual environment, one foot in front of the other, and that's particularly critical now um, that we continue that. I, uh, I'm looking forward to today because it's really, it's addressing the issue that um, we've just talked about here, but that's most um, near and dear to my heart, which is the, the leadership and the management of the biodefense effort. And um, that's, you know, that's a question that uh, obviously has come to the fore recently as the failings of our government, in particular our federal government, have been laid bare by this 
COVID crisis. And um, I completely subscribe to Tom Daschle's comments. Um, he referred to it as a rant. Uh, I referred to it as a surgically precise and dead on accurate assessment of the failings of our government. And uh, we need, to, we need to, to be as honest as he was about how we as a country and as a government have completely failed in what is the most solemn duty of our government, which is to protect the citizens. And it's been an abject failure. And so in terms of us looking at this, this issue, I mean, I think it's important. Um, we started out in 2015 and we knew that they, they, about the flu of, of 1917, we knew that this was a, a real possibility, but now it's happened and it's not theoretical. And now we're sort of in the position that the country and the 9-11 Commission were in after 9-11, where we went back and really drew lessons from what happened in 9-11, how we failed in the lead up to 9-11. And that's, that's critical that we do that. And so I'm glad that we're part of the effort to actually take a good hard look at ourselves. And we've got a great group of speakers to do that today. And um, I'm impressed with all of them and uh, appreciate the service that all of them provide. I wanna single out my friend, Tom Bossert, who I believe is our first speaker. Tom uh, was the Homeland Security Advisor at the outset of the Trump administration. He was my deputy when I was Homeland Security Advisor at the back end of the Bush administration. So he has a unique perspective on this leadership issue sort of over time. And I think it'll be fascinating to get his thoughts about that. I think it'd be fascinating and also important to be getting those thoughts out right now because you know we're at a critical juncture with a new administration coming in where you know there's a greater possibility of new ways of doing things being incorporated and being adopted and I think as we've all said you know whenever there's a crisis like we have now um, there's there's sadness and misfortune but there's also opportunity and now is the opportunity um, to do something about this governmental failing that didn't just happen this year with COVID, it happened because we didn't prepare for COVID. Um, now we have an opportunity to address that. I think that is compounded by the opportunity provided by the change of administration. And I'm hopeful that this session today and the sort of combined wisdom of the speakers that we're gonna hear from will really help us uh, take a step forward in that effort. And I'm proud to be a part of it. Thanks yeah, very much. Ken. Yeah, Ken, we're certainly glad you are a part of it. And I wanna thank you for those comments. So we're going to go to our first panel. And uh, thank you, Ken. You've already given a wonderful introduction to Tom Bossert. Uh, he was a former Homeland Security Advisor to President Trump, but uh, obviously worked very closely with you. Uh, he was also involved uh, early on in the Trump administration as they tried to set up their biodefense policymaking. And uh, while the titles may differ from time to time, uh, you and I particularly can appreciate our fellow veterans from the, home, the White House Homeland Security world. So uh, we're very interested in learning uh, from Tom uh, about the uh, structure in the White House as it relates to biodefense decision-making, a uh, remarkable record of public service he brings to this conversation. And without further ado, we thank you, uh, uh, Tom Bossert, and uh, we're grateful for your participation in today's forum. Tom, the floor is yours. Wow, Secretary Ridge, thank you very much. Secretary, uh, I get to also call you governor. Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania and, and uh, um, had the pleasure of voting for you every time. And, and only can't once. hold a job. I know it. I know it. I really appreciate no everything you've done. Everything you've done for the country. And Senator Lieberman, same for you. Uh, you. I want to thank you in front of this group, not only for your leadership, but for your personal support of me when I served in my last stint in government. Uh, right. It was a um, rancorous environment, and you provided nothing but professional support, and I appreciate it. Um, and then Ken Weinstein, uh, thank you. I, I want to single you out as well for um, having the, the, the faith in me to keep me as your deputy for a little while there, uh, and then to, to, not, to not hold it against me for eight years after. Um, appreciate uh, all of you. And, and so this is a really august group, and I'm certain that you all know more about the topic than I do. So I want to be, uh, you know, a bit circumspect in my remarks. But um, I see Senator Daschle as well. I, I, I really appreciate the bipartisan nature of this group uh, quite a bit. You know, I reconnected uh, in the process of COVID response uh, to a number of really kind of dear old friends. And I recall all the efforts that they did that, or that they put forth that didn't, didn't really get us anywhere. And, um, and, and you at the time uh, were supportive of some of the things that were considered outlandish. So thank you, uh, Senator, it's, uh, it's all been proven out here. And um, unfortunately, so 
let me see if I can organize my thoughts here in a way that that's constructive. Um, I want to touch on, uh, you know, kind of some principles of organizational uh, constructs. I want to touch on some uh, almost uh, emergency management principles, if you will. I think that we've missed them. And maybe some leadership principles and some recommendations that this group could then carry forward uh, in this critical transition, which I'm also disappointed to note uh, is not happening as smoothly as it should or could. Um, so this is this is the uh, this is the Tom Bosser summary of what I've learned in a career of emergency management, and it, it all boils down to maintaining public trust. And if you lose that public trust, you lose your ability to lead and convince people to do what's right, even if it's in their own interests. And, uh, and they're pretty simple principles, but you tell people everything you know, and you tell them as soon as you know it. And we watch that uh, principle violated here, um, I would note. You also tell them what you don't know. And if you're really good, you tell them everything you don't know. That's a difficult task. Um, you acknowledge uncertainty. I think that's a principle that we've lost here and that I'll try to maintain through my remarks today. And you, at, 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 the, at the very least, combine those things with the, the, the core basic requirement of not over-promising uh, and, and not over-reassuring, if that's a term. And I think that's going to be applicable here as we move forward into vaccine messaging and distribution. <clears throat> and then, of course, I would prefer to add a few others that are, that are mine. Uh, but try not to make fun of people's feelings, whether they are uh, fearful or skeptical of what you're telling them. Uh, I think it's important to, to, to remember that both sides have legitimate fears and skepticisms here. Try not to make fun of them, but rather to educate them to change their view if you can. And then perhaps this gets into emergency management and less communications, but share the burden of complex problems with others. People need things to do, so give them something to do and explain to them the rationale behind your decision making instead of just explaining to them your decision. That was missed in an early stage in this COVID response and it continues in my view to elude our messaging. And of course, um, in the category of lightheartedness with giving something, people something to do, we watched what people do when they don't have an assignment. They go out and make something up to do for themselves. And uh, they went and bought toilet paper and hoarded things and, and behaved in ways that, you know, uh, would have been more fitting for a coming hurricane or an earthquake uh, instead of a sustained year-long uh, joint effort. And, of course, we've, we've watched that play out. So uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you do all those things, you're a very effective crisis manager, crisis uh, emergency manager and leader. Um, but if you're, if you're a really good leader, like some of you on this call, not just a crisis manager. You can also explain to people what the future holds. And if you give them a sense that this might uh, turn into something that's difficult for more than a day or a week, but rather a year, and that their behaviors are going to have to change and foreshadow that, it's reassuring. And it was disappointing to see that we did the opposite of that and we're still you know, reaping the benefits or, or lack thereof. You know, a practical application of that principle, I was able to speak to a few hundred school administrators and this will tee up uh, a section of my remarks here this morning about federalism. Uh, but I was able to speak to a number of school administrators in this, and I, and I pleaded with them to consider uh, foreshadowing to their parents in their district, not only the conditions that they would employ to allow their children to return to school safely, but the trigger conditions that they would consider for closing or reclosing schools. And if you do that in advance, people trust that you had a thoughtful process and they abide by your decision. So pick your number, I give them my advice, on how many cases per 100,000 people in your population that would, in your mind, constitute a, a dangerous level of virus in your community that would merit the shutting, of or shutting or temporary closing of schools. And if you tell them that in advance, they all look to that number, they try to pitch in to keep that number below the threshold. And then if they meet the threshold, they understand that you're gonna close those schools and you told them you were gonna do it in advance. So they don't feel like you're falling prey to some arbitrary political pressure or you know, CNN news making cycle. Those that took that advice have each one to a T called me back and thanked me for it because the parents in their district, despite their political views, said, I can't quibble with your decision. You told me what you were gonna do in advance and then you did it. It's an interesting principle. Sounds so simple when you hear it repeated, uh, but we missed that opportunity here. So 
uh, perhaps my remarks are too narrowly confined to COVID response and that this uh, body wants to talk about things more broadly, but you know, the, the same principles I think will apply uh, whether it's a biological attack or the next you know, naturally occurring outbreak. Um, maybe in the category of acknowledging some of our mistakes, I was deeply involved in the effort to draft our country's uh, pandemic strategy, response strategy, but also the implementation plans. And that's kind of where I am at heart. I'm an uh, operations planner. Uh, Objectives-based planning is really where I like to be. Uh, and, and, and I think two things of note. We really almost uh, presciently nailed it on our planning assumptions, almost every single one of them. The, the reproduction rate, the, the qualities and properties of, uh, of, the, of the needs for the hospital community and so forth. Uh, and if you go back and read that first page and a half of planning assumptions from those implementation plans, you would think you were reading something that was written to address COVID with two major exceptions. And this is where I'll acknowledge mistakes. We didn't contemplate uh, universal or, or, or in any fashion public mask wearing. We only contemplated PPE for healthcare providers. Uh, in retrospect, what a terrible uh, oversight. But that was uh, in a planning phase, we could have easily improvised a little more quickly in our COVID response. And then secondly, it never dawned on all the really smart doctors and epidemiologists in that effort that we wouldn't be able to easily ascertain sickness. Of course, the lessons of 1918 uh, were pretty easy, but think of the fact that those doctors had no uh, RNA you know, PCR tests with, with a high degree of fidelity. They had to make clinical diagnoses. And if you showed up and appeared to have the flu, then they diagnosed you with the flu and that was good enough for the healthcare system, but also for the public health record keeping. And of course it didn't hurt, I suppose, that your time from sickness to death was shorter. Uh, after the Liberty Loan Parade in 1918 in Philadelphia, which public health experts warned leaders not to have, uh, and which later became the largest super spreader event in our nation's history until, until this summer. Uh, we had a uh, quote in the newspaper, bodies stacked up like cordwood. So seven to 8,000 people died in the seven days uh, or eight days after that parade. Now in this disease's case, we're seeing something quite different. We can't ascertain sickness as easily. Um, and we can't ascertain it with, degree, with the degree of specificity that makes both sides of our healthcare system happy. This is, a big, this is a big problem for us. I saw some really well-intended doctors for a period of time on TV, if you recall back to March, saying, we don't need testing anymore. Let's stop talking about testing. We're, we're beyond testing. We need to start you know, treating patients. This is getting terrible. Our hospitals are being overwhelmed in certain areas. And of course, from a, a clinical care perspective, they were, they were correct. But from a public health perspective, they couldn't have been more wrong. And we've never integrated the two. So if there was a structural recommendation from a panel of this nature, it would be to really seriously, once and for all, attack the problem of integrating our healthcare system with our public health system. Uh, it, is, it is talked about uh, over and over again, and I've never seen any real earnest effort. And, and by the way, for people in the, in the core Homeland Security community uh, on this call, that will have a very positive effect on all the other things we do in terms of planning for terrorist attacks, um, active shooters, and so forth. I look back to the Las Vegas shooting and, and see that we had a very difficult time with our trauma care system that was overcome by public you know, uh, uh, volunteerism, uh, and our public health system didn't track those things at all. So uh, I'll give an example of that. I called uh, Dr. Fauci in, in kind of mid to late February uh, to talk to him about this, and, and uh, he said, Tom, what would you have me do? I don't have enough evidence to make a, a, a persuasive argument to close any cities right now. And I said, you sure do. You sure do. You're wrong. And he said, well, I, I really have to wait for these test results. And I said, you don't have the tests. You don't have them in a size enough to, to, to get them in time. And we need to introduce non-pharmaceutical interventions before the virus spreads to 1% of any population. And given the properties of this virus, that means you have to act before we're at a half a percent. And he said, I agree with that logic, but what would you have me do? I said, you have to improvise. You've got to look for imperfect evidence. You've got to start using clinical diagnoses and you've got to start using these surveillance indicators. We've got a great system in this country to report flu-like symptoms. It's not, they don't wait for the actual diagnosis of influenza. Now, the doctor said I'm having a hard time inside uh, convincing my colleagues, and we all now know that. At the time, I protected him on that admission. 
And I said, you know, listen, what can we do together? And I published. He asked me to, so I published an op-ed that said doctors should test patients for influenza. And if they come back negative, but still have symptoms and a fever, he said, well, perhaps we should also test for mono. I, I didn't put that in my op-ed in time. Uh, but if you can exclude mononucleosis and influenza, seasonal influenza, and the patient still has symptoms plus a fever, let's, for public health purposes, consider them presumptively COVID positive, And we can get a better sense of how many cases have spread in this country and where. Now, the, the healthcare industry said we cannot do that in good conscience. We can't begin treating a patient for a presumptive COVID positive diagnosis. And of course, they're right. And I think both can coexist. So we didn't, we didn't do that or we didn't do it on time. Uh, and we're still seeing a little bit of a hangover from that debate. I'm gonna give you a sense of it. You probably all briefed on epi curves, but I'll tell you my, my kind of mathematical rule of thumb. When we see the number of new cases per day, um, I think it's generous to say that we're only ascertaining one out of every four uh, COVID patients. I believe you could probably easily argue for one out of every five or six, uh, perhaps even less. But be generous and assume we're diagnosing one out of every four COVID positive patients. So take the 160,000 per day number and multiply it by four because you missed. You missed one out of four or one out of five other patients. So what you're really talking about is 640,000 cases that day. And then take that number and multiply it by seven because they'll be infectious for a week. And virtually no one in this country, unless they're hospitalized, is taking the advice of isolating and quarantining, quarantining their contacts. So what you're really talking about is right now 4.48 million people in this country infectious. And if you then take the low number that seems to have held up, of course, you have to allow for improvements in treatment and, and demographic conditions and so forth. But right now, the demographics indicate that the spread has crossed over into almost every age group uniformly in almost every state. You take a 0 0.04 fatality rate, case fatality rate, and apply it to that statistic. And that would mean to me that 112,000 deaths are already baked into the cake. And the next six weeks is just a, an exercise in us talking on television about that 112,000 deaths that will already occur uh, because the seeds have already been spread. And so to me, uh, there are models that screw things up, uh, but there are mathematical properties of this virus and it's spread among human beings that are irrefutable. And I think it's um, almost statistically impossible for me to believe that we don't cross the 400,000 death mark at this point. And uh, not, not, a fear, not a statement of fear, not a statement of, of overreaction, but simply a, a reality and, and so maybe, uh, maybe, maybe to put that into a principle that I think is easy to deliver in speeches, human beings have a hard time with a lagging response to controls. You, know, you ever go to a, a new hotel that you're unfamiliar with and try to set the temperature of the shower water? It takes you a little while because it doesn't come out exactly the way you want it when you first turn it on. It's a, usually a classic example of engineering control lag. Uh, we've all gone through that. Sometimes I ask people how they would feel about a car if you hit its gas pedal, it took three minutes to accelerate. And if you hit the, the brake, it would take three minutes before you started to slow down. How they would handle that. The human body, human brain's got a real hard time with that, the anticipatory lagging controls. And so what I think we'll see here is a debate over whether we should be closing, um, you know, gatherings and schools and bars and restaurants and indoor events until it's too late. Uh, the Aesop fable of the grasshopper and the ant you know, where, where the grasshopper plays all summer and then knocks on the ant's door when it's time when winter rolls in and he's hungry and has no firewood and hasn't prepared for the winter. And the ant said, well, you should have thought of that three months ago. Uh, and of course, that's where we are right now. And I, and I think that what I anticipate is we will then throw everything appropriately at this, but it'll be too late to save those 112,000 give or take deaths that are already baked into the system. Um, so anyway, um, let me let me stop on that. Those are just those are just uh, observations of what uh, Joe Biden should expect to inherit. Um, let me talk a little bit about schools and children there since I raised the issue. Uh, I think that uh, the after action on this, which I uh, wholeheartedly uh, support, and, I, and I, I fear that political outcomes and conditions might, you know, might, might alter this, but if, if things were right and just, we would have a 9-11 style commission investigation into this response. Uh, and, and obviously you all on this, on this call know that that's not about, you know, you know, 
blaming individuals. It's about improving our capabilities for the future. And, uh, and really, really, I think thoughtful leaders should support that, be willing to take criticism. I think when they do that after action report, historians will look back on this and in disbelief, in disbelief that, that we are so willfully ignoring the obvious role of children and young adults in the spread of this virus. And the, the continued bias that we show as a country to ignore uh, the, the obvious. So the, the, the evidence of absence is not the absence of evidence and vice versa. Uh, so let me introduce some evidence for those that are skeptical. They continue to say, well, Tom, we don't see a lot of evidence of children being sick. Um, let me give you a macro common sense observation. Do we really think that this third massive wave that's in almost every state is, is because college kids drank a little too much and were lost discipline in their, in their you know, extracurricular activities and because people are unevenly accepting the mask mandate? That's been going on through the outset of this. Uh, what really just changed is in September, uh, you know, late August and early September, we sent 70 million primary, secondary, and college level students back to congregate settings all throughout this country and perfectly seeded this disease in almost every state. And even worse, we, we put a lot of those kids into the state schools that were intentionally placed in, in parts of states uh, that are more rural and less urban. Secretary Ridge, I'm thinking Penn State right now. Uh, but it, it, that principle seems to apply in a lot of state colleges. So we've got um, a pretty obvious commonsensical rationale or explanation for what's happened that people are ignoring. On top of that, I'll add some concrete data. In Florida, the mismatch between seroprevalence testing and actual PCR test results in children is so glaring that I find no other explanation for it. Here's what I mean. With 22 to 26 percent of the students uh, K through 12 age tested for for the existence of antibodies in their blood after the fact to have had COVID, and only two percent on any given day showing up positive for COVID, someone has to explain where those mysterious missing sicknesses have gone. And I can tell you the answer to that is we're not testing kids. And anybody that thinks that's that's wrong has a heck of an argument to make for me, because I think we all kind of intuitively understand it. We don't test kids with the sniffles. They don't have major disease symptoms. We certainly don't want to create the, we want to avoid the outcome of that. Oh my goodness, my child is sick. I now have to tell all of their friends. There's a social stigma. Uh, the, the child's mother and I have to, uh, have to stay home from work. The, the implications of quarantine are significant to our household. And then a lot of people just don't want to stick that thing deep inside the nasal cavity of their baby. And I think those things are pretty clear. We should recognize them and be human beings about this. I've talked to enough college students now and enough professors to draw some conclusions from the anecdotal stories I'm hearing. But all, all across the country, what the students are saying is, I don't want to have to go to COVID housing. Gross. That was the quote I heard most often. And that, that really resonates with me. Of course, that's how they're thinking. There's a, there's a designated COVID dormitory where students are sent that aren't, you know, comfortable for them. There's some social stigma attached to it, and they really don't have bad symptoms, so they just kind of don't tell anybody. So we've really, we've really run ourselves into a perfect storm here. Um, we failed to distinguish in our messaging between our objectives. And before I get into a conversation about mitigation and suppression, I think you all know the difference. Uh, I would just make an observation that the real key to any national response, as that term was, was used, I think, very clearly in the, in the Bush administration, to distinguish a federal response or a state and local one, but rather a collective national response, is setting common objectives. You know, I'm, I'm going to come to my organizational recommendations here, uh, but what I'm really doing is giving you a few things that you should think about before I deliver them. Um, in any emergency response, especially one that satisfies the, the core foundations of our federalism. In other words, the affected local and state governments are collectively unable to respond adequately to the situation and that federal assistance is necessary. Those two things have to be, have to be met as conditions before any president can declare a major disaster. In this instance, whether he knows it or not, this president has decided that those conditions are present in all 50 states at the same time. 
normally what we do at that stage is we bring the resources of neighboring states and neighboring localities to bear on the problem. But now we've got a situation where we can't use or marshal borrowed resources. Everyone is stuck with their organic resources to apply to the problem because their neighbor's in just as bad a shape as they're in. It's the first time in this COVID response that we've seen that condition. When we had the outbreak in the Northeast, primarily centered in New York and New Jersey, parts of Connecticut and Massachusetts, Southern Rhode Island, we had a regional disaster. And we had resources inbound from hospitals and states, uh, from, from academic institutions all over the country. Uh, over the summer, we had a primarily Sunbelt uh, regional outbreak. Right now, we're heading into a true national condition, a national disaster. Uh, although the condition's been met and we've had a major disaster declaration declared and extant for this entire year, we're now in the operational conditions that would merit that everywhere at the same time. It's a fascinating thing for you to study. And what we haven't done is established our common objectives. So if you don't have a common objective, how do you achieve unity of effort? And if you can't achieve unity of effort, you've got disunity of effort. You've got people literally working against at cross purposes. And, um, and it violates everything I've ever been taught about emergency management and about the marshalling of our scarce resources. I have no idea how the, the federal teams right now are to make operational decisions. They've called me in panicked voices for the last six months. So I've just introduced what, if I were to do it in a textbook setting, would be considered principles of the incident command system. There's a unified command group concept where political leaders such as yourselves uh, would, would make strategic decisions, uh, would establish common objectives, make trade-offs economically, um, 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 uh, clinically, and so forth. And you would, you, would, you would make very difficult decisions about acceptable losses. But you would nevertheless uh, establish kind of a realistic, achievable set of objectives with existing resources. Or you might even go so far as to challenge this country to, to develop resources that they hadn't had before in a hurry. Mm -hmm. But you would do that and you would give those strategic directives to a level of individuals beneath you that would then have the hard task of implementing, executing, and coordinating their operations. And we would consider that incident management. And we would normally consider it an area command that would make logistics distribution decisions. Now, if you have one active shooter that then goes into five, you know, with, with five shooters that spread up into five buildings and you start to take that principle and you now have five incidents in one area command and so forth, it's all very easy to wrap your head around. But when you have something that's in all 50 states at the same time, it requires some interaction from the public at every level. It's, um, it's not a time to not have common objectives and to not have a unified command group. So what did we do as a country? We decided that we would fire and not replace the uh, home ice uh, We decided that we would have, uh, and I know that sounds self-serving. It's the first time I've said that publicly. I don't mind saying it to this group. I think it's important to hear. It sounds self-interested, self but um, um, Tom Ridge, uh, Fran Townsend, Ken Weinstein, Tom Bossert, there, there's, there's seven living ones. And uh, we all had uh, three things experience that matters we all had the trust of the president and access to him that matters and we all had the rank whether you make it the obama era debate or the bush era debate whatever have what have you we all had the rank sufficient to coordinate the cabinet and those are the three qualities that i think you should consider making as your recommendation to an organizational reform in this country i think the cdc didn't entirely uh, wrap itself in glory uh, I think the CDC didn't entirely distinguish itself in this, in this COVID response. Although they did a lot of hard work, they made a lot of mistakes and had a lot of infighting that I think will become clearer as we investigate. And they're going to go through some tough reforms similar to uh, what FEMA went through after Katrina, in my view. Uh, but that's okay, they'll come out the other side. Uh, but we nevertheless were relying on uh, individual personalities for leadership instead of organizational constructs. And I think that at some point, the president realized that his task force required somebody that had all three of those qualities, and he tried to uh, improvise by demoting the vice president to being the Homeland Security Advisor. And he found out that's a pretty tough job. And it's very difficult to do that for a number of reasons. As the vice president of the United States, it's very hard to have cabinet members argue with you and speak their mind. And he went through a period of time where there was a, at least four or five weeks of task force meetings that were uh, a little bit more 
I think, uh, friendly and polite than they would have been if, if somebody like I was sitting at the head of that table and they would have yelled at me with, with reckless abandon. And the backbenchers would have felt just as comfortable, right? And that's the whole purpose of the role. Uh, but I don't believe that uh, the vice president had the requisite experience in, with respect to him. I respect him in a lot of ways deeply. Uh, but he's learned in some ways the difference between his former roles, you know, and the concept of federalism that a governor views and, and that few governors have learned uh, aren't, always, aren't always what they appear to be. Secretary Ridge, I think you have a unique opportunity to speak out and learn and, and teach people in this regard. Uh, you not only were a governor, uh, but you then saw as Secretary of Homeland Security what has to be done when there's an event that requires federal assistance that has exhausted the governor's abilities. And you know what has to happen when you have to coach a person. You know, there's a joke inside FEMA that the federal coordinating officer is mistitled and that the federal coordinating officer should really be titled the federal convincing officer. Because if you really think the statutory authority that says that person can tell all the other departments and agencies what to do and when to do it, you're really missing the human element. Uh, the human element, uh, you know, Don Rumsfeld wasn't all that persuaded in the beginning of Katrina that he should be sending or diverting uh, resources, materiel, and personnel to southern Louisiana when he was fighting a two-front war in the Middle East. And the federal coordinating officer wasn't going to be the one that convinced him otherwise. And so there's a principle here that, that's really important. Uh, have somebody that understands this with experience that's given the opportunity to coordinate the cabinet regularly and not only in a break glass scenario where they don't know who you are. And don't make the mistake of combining operational coordination and implementation with that unified command group strategic responsibility. In this instance, I don't mind I made the Secretary of Health and Human Services the head of the task force for a period of time. Uh, and I really don't mind that the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services was tasked with the operational coordination role. But the idea that I left behind uh, before leaving government on the planning for this would have been to augment that role with the FEMA director bolted to that secretary's hip so that they could make decisions about the, the distribution of scarce resources. What I was hearing instead in the early days and still occasionally was that there were competing requirements from state and local officials coming to HHS and HHS was making clinical decisions that were inconsistent and that FEMA wasn't in their, in their planning and operation cycle able to accommodate those shifting clinical decisions. We've decided to send six you know, ventilators to one hospital, and that was what we decided in our 12-hour cycle of operations, and now somebody at HHS wants to divert those six to another hospital because the patient's condition has changed in Arizona that, that dictates this change in course of action. So one person was making the decision, another person was executing it. We had uh, discord and disarray. So I might have exceeded my time here, but um, federalism has been misunderstood. We want, to, we want to exist in a common state of distributed authority on a steady state. But when there's a crisis, that's when we come together. Not since the, you know, the Articles of, of Confederation have the, have the Virginia delegate sat by while the Massachusetts delegation was under attack and said, we don't want to get involved in that. Ever since we signed our constitution, as far as I'm concerned, we've decided an attack on one is an attack on all. And you want to beat one of us, you have to beat all of us. And yet with COVID, we've said, no, no, even in a crisis, we want everybody to stay home and do their own thing and, and take their own punishment and, and let the least qualified person, the school administrator or mayor, make massive decisions that they're not qualified to make. I think it's a really unusual perversion of federalism. Uh, only when there's a massive crisis do we come together and insert federal resources and state resources into local decision making. And we don't tell them what they have to do. We set common objectives and then we let the you know, admirals and the captains in charge of all their own boats make their own decisions about when to turn left and right. But they all have a common purpose and destination and then they find a way to get there. And so um, perhaps a little highbrow, but I think that's, as I thought about what I would say here to you today, the best way for me to summarize it. Uh, the rest of it tends to be uh, argumentative. And I get on a lot of phone calls and I hear people dispute the cold chain capabilities that we have. And I hear people dispute the, the, the particular subunit vaccine decisions that we made. I would, I would offer a thought on vaccines, as you all know. We've never really done this subunit kind of concept before. We never, we never even had a backup plan for the traditional style of vaccine development in this case. Uh, we, we went for the, the modern kind of moonshot, which is uh, 
perhaps a good idea, but also uh, an interesting thing in after, as an afterthought for you to put into your recommendations uh, that had, this, had these Moderna and Pfizer vaccines not panned out. And by the way, we don't know yet if they're going to produce an immuno response with longevity. Uh, we might have wanted a different, a different vaccine development process moving in the background. Um, I want to make sure one last kind of tactical thought as you go out as emissaries, make sure that people over the next year don't fall prey to, to one of three problems. In the trust category, I don't want them to conflate efficacy and safety in the vaccine. Somebody could still get the vaccine even at a 90% efficacy rate, could still get the booster properly, and could still nevertheless get sick and die. And of course, then the rumor will start that they didn't get sick and die from COVID, they got sick and died from the shot. And that's, of course, not true. And then secondly, we want to make sure that people don't mix these subunit vaccines. They don't work that way. So don't get a shot, a Pfizer shot and a Moderna booster. No good. And vice versa, no good. You're going to have to keep track of which shot you got and which booster you got to make sure they match. I'm not sure how we're going to do that with our HIPAA rules. And then I think the last thought on vaccines is this notion of not overpromising and over reassuring people. We still don't know how long distribution is going to take. We still don't know what public adoption will be. And for goodness sakes, we still don't know how long that tail will be. So don't give people the impression that they can stop or let down their guard until we've got somewhere close to 50 or 60% of the country producing an immuno response. And then, uh, Ken, maybe a little bit more geopolitical, but you know, last night I spoke to uh, the Pacific leaders, uh, all the islands, all the compact islands, uh, Hawaii, uh, Guam, uh, Saipan, uh, FSM, you know, the, the, the entire Pacific region's very nervous about the Chinese-American tensions, the transition in, in government. Uh, but one of the things that they've made very clear to me is that I knew it academically, but now I know it operationally. The U.S. has deeply missed an opportunity for vaccine diplomacy. Uh, we've, we've clearly uh, given up our leadership role in that regard, and now they're reporting to me that there are Chinese officials on their islands saying, take our shot. It's only one shot. It actually works. And don't take that ridiculous American two-shot thing that Donald Trump uh, is lying to you about. And so the PRC is spreading that information among their population and scaring the heck out of them. And so now they're, they're feeling strategically abandoned as we shifted compact responsibilities from the Department of Defense to the Department of Interior. And now they're feeling like we left them out the dry on the vaccine, at least their people, not their leaders. Uh, and I worry about that. So I don't know how I did on time here. Um, I'd like to take a deep breath and take questions and hear feedback from this group. Tom, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly glad that we had the opportunity to record uh, this, uh, your narrative and your insight, both from a uh, generic leadership uh, observations that you made initially to the very comprehensive assessment of the importance of the kind of uh, uh, federal response, as you pointed out, uh, when all 50 states are similarly challenged, it is only the integration of capabilities between the federal, state, and locals. You can't secure the country from inside the beltway. All of us in Homeland Security understand that's a principle, but when something is this, this extreme, you. Now more than ever, there have to be standards that are met universally across the 50 states, and that has to be a collaborative norms and agreed to, but strong federal leadership. So uh, I have no questions. So I want to thank you for that. But I'll ask my colleague, uh, Senator Lieberman, I'm going to defer to you for questions. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, Tom Buster, that was really excellent, helpful testimony. And I, I must say, I was, I was struck by where you started, which was not with uh, sort of programmatic comments, but with the, um, the style of leadership. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. In other words, you said the number one priority is maintaining public trust. Anybody who's been a governor and a great governor like Tom Ridge, and I saw it in Connecticut in my years with Governor Alec Grasso, the way a governor responds to a crisis, like a hurricane or a snowstorm or something, is really as important or more important uh, than a lot of the policy initiatives that go on. People want their executive to be like uh, father, or in Ella's case, mother. And um, I'm not being partisan in what I'm about to say, but I think history will want to learn from this, that uh, just because of President Trump's instincts in situations like this, 
he did exactly the opposite of what you recommended, which was nonpartisan, which is that he didn't tell us what we, what we, what he didn't know. He didn't tell us what we're uncertain about. And what was obvious to people, and I think this is probably most hurtful of all, he kept saying, this is going to go away. We're turning the corner. And yet uh, every, everybody could see on the news that thousands and thousands more people, hundreds of thousands, millions were getting the infection and uh, uh, tens of thousands were actually dying. So, so um, Senator, let me, let me throw a thought at you real because of time being short and you just, yeah. uh, um, I want to hear your reaction to it. Um, because we waited and, and, and not only didn't share what we didn't know, but we didn't share what we did know. We, we, didn't, we didn't communicate that we were uh, embarking on a simultaneous containment effort and uh, response effort. We decided to suggest to ourselves or in a biased way that containment's gonna work, even after there was evidence to suggest it had failed. Uh, it was never supposed to be a sequential step. It was supposed to be uh, containment will, will abate and, and, and suppress perhaps but it won't be a complete seal. Uh, I got kind of a lot of grief for saying that uh, diseases travel without visas uh, while I was in office. And, and it's a true statement that, that I borrowed from an, uh, a previous World Health Organization um, uh, leader. But I, the, I, the idea I want to interrupt to suggest here is that I published a piece on the paradox, right? It's basically, a, I called it the coronavirus paradox, but it's really a restatement of the quarantine dilemma. And that is, if you do it early enough, the people look around and feel like they've been inconvenienced and there was no sickness because you did it early enough. If you do it too late, well, people agree with your leadership decision because there's sickness right. everywhere, but you didn't achieve the objective of, of doing it in time. And so politically, a populist instinct is the wrong instinct to have when that's your dilemma. Uh, I, I just want to introduce, though, the second concept. We're in the second phase of that paradox. So because we waited we had uh, increasingly little choice. Nobody from the, the thoughtful planning community recommended a national blanket shutdown for any period of time. The idea was to target it to the places in the country that had sufficient levels of virus to merit it and intentionally not to target the rest of the country that didn't because you uh, essentially fatigue them and, and, and hurt their economies unnecessarily. You also undermine public trust. So for at least five months of this response, we undermined public trust deeply by shutting down places in this country that didn't require shutdown. Now, interestingly, somehow, the, the current president of the United States has convinced a large portion of our population that that national shutdown wasn't his choice or his doing. He did it and at the same time opposed it publicly. It's a very interesting thing for you and this group to study later because the people have now concluded that he wasn't the one that, that actually was the only president to ever impose a national economic shutdown. And now has convinced people that, that, that the incoming president-elect will be the first, and, we, and he told you so. And so I, I would be interested to understand your thoughts on this because I'm having a hard time understanding why we decided uh, about a month or two ago to return to the beginning of ignoring the problem and telling people it's not real. If, if for no other reason, I think it was to make sure the outcome was such, so bad that there would be no choice but to return to another national shutdown. You know, the only other rationale is that they decided that people's behaviors will never change. It's a futile effort. Take it on the chin and let's, let's reach natural herd immunity. But if that was their objective, they refused to admit it and they've denied it publicly. Yeah, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, let me, let me, let me, I just have to say something right now, Tom. I tell you what, you have given us so much food for thought in this engagement. Uh, and because we have uh, several speakers lined up. Oh, I sorry. Propose, I'm, no, no, no. Listen, this is a kind of provocative, uh, very provocative. It's very appropriate. You raised a several issues that we have been wrestling with internally so we could make a public expression of bipartisan or apolitical support going forward. Your discussion of federalism here was really provocative. And uh, uh, Tom Daschle and I, and, and Jim Greenwood, I'm sure, I was always fascinated. If there well, was Jim Greenwood's any... on. I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you, sir. I, I'll, be, I'll be quick. If there was a I hurricane, noticed that. If hurricane in Florida and there was devastation, 
everybody got together across party lines and said, we got to help the Floridians, or there was a tornado somewhere else, or a blizzard, or uh, a Hurricane Sandy up in uh, the Northeast. This was different uh, because it, it affected the whole country. And uh, the, the federal system really undercut our ability to respond. And for some reason, the president sort of, I don't know whether it was ideological or just his vision of leadership, he threw it back to the states. And even though the gov federal government was helping them, they started a fight with each other. And of course, you know, diseases don't get visas or whatever. The people cross state lines all the time. So uh, it, this is a really big question about how do you establish what you called a unified national commander of a national crisis like this where we can't really afford the pure federalist response. When Jim and, and Jim and Ken do they have opportunity to either make an observation or ask a question. Yeah, just very quickly, I, and I won't ask a question for long things, but just a couple of comments. First, Tom, that was a tour de force I would expect nothing less from a Bucks County boy from Quaker Town. So uh, well done, sir. Well done. So just a couple, just a comment or two on vaccines. Um, obviously, I think we all know this, but it, we don't. We're not relying simply on Pfizer and Moderna. Um, there are, I think, uh, I think it's uh, 179 vaccines in development, 54 in humans. So uh, Novavax and a whole a whole range of other uh, companies are going to be coming forward with a range of vaccines. I think one thing that's going to be quite interesting to see in terms of vaccine hesitancy and uptake is what does the Trump family do when the uh, vaccines are available? Does the president say, I'm a, I'm a Superman and I'm already immune, I don't need the vaccine? Or does he set the example for his tens of millions of followers? Um, what do the rest of the Trump family do? I, I think they ought to step up and very publicly take the vaccine so that I'll, the, I'll, their followers I'll, observe that. Sir, I know I'll be very brief in my response. Um, thank you for the recognition of Bucks County. Um, parents and family are still there and thank you for your service. Um, the idea for me is that every family is a little bit different, including my own. So I would imagine that they'll all respond you know, in their own personal way and not as a, as a unit. And that's just okay. And as with everything, uh, President Trump, I'm not critical of everything he's done. I just have a particular objection to how we've uh, responded to COVID. Uh, but in this uh, particular instance, uh, it might actually be appropriate for someone who's already been sick and recovered to be second in the distribution priority list uh, and to give it to people who haven't yet been sick. And so, um, uh, you know, we'll have to separate his rationale from his action. Fair enough. Enough. Ken. Thanks, Governor. Just two quick points. First, Jim Greenwood, I just wanted you to know, I'm going to put on the record that I noticed you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> in case you're feeling overlooked. Thank you. Um, and, uh, but secondly, thanks, Tom. This was a tour de force, and I think um, everybody can see why I learned so much working with Tom. He takes a 360 encyclopedic approach to all issues, looks at them from all sides, and that's why he's so good in this context, but also why he's such a tremendous public servant. So thanks for that, Tom. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ken. And I want to thank you. Uh, for your extraordinary narrative that, that kind of help us focus on the qualities of leadership, uh, the importance of a, uh, of a national response led by the federal government, setting guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. So we thank you for that. Uh, we're going to turn it back to uh, Senator Lieberman, who's going to introduce our next guest. But again, a couple of my colleagues commented and described your presence as a tour de force. I'll put mm -hmm. an exclamation behind it. Thank you for it. Thanks for your public service. We'll get back at you. Thank Thanks, you all very much. Yes, Thanks, sir. Dr. Thank you. Tom Bosser, you were very well trained by Ken Weinstein, obviously. Yes, uh, sir. You may, have brought little, all the credit. you may have brought a little to it yourself. Thank you. Yeah, just a little <laughs> bit. Hey, thanks. Good morning, Senator Lamar Alexander. Mark, I came to the Senate in uh, 2002. And he's leaving, uh, unfortunately, this year, but he's entitled. He's had an extraordinary career as governor of Tennessee, president of the University of Tennessee, secretary of education under President Bush uh, 41, a great senator. And really, we talked about how important it is to build, uh, Tom Daschle particularly, and really a, a very moving opening statement uh, to have a bipartisan cooperation in response to a COVID-19 
And Lamar really was a, just a, 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 an exemplar in doing everything he possibly could, including with uh, stray dogs like me, to uh, form bipartisan uh, uh, relationships that could produce results. So he comes to us today as chairman of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. He's been active, made some very creative proposals in response to COVID-19. So we're, we're grateful to you. We'll turn it over to you. Uh, talk as long as you want about whatever you want. And if we have time for questions before noon, we'll ask a few. Thanks, Joe. And I see some familiar faces there. So thank, thank you for inviting me. And I'll, I'll keep my remarks uh, pretty short. First, Joe, uh, I, I think back to our time together trying to have those bipartisan breakfasts. We had a bunch of them. We did. It worked pretty well. I, I think we learned... <laughs> We, we've learned in the Senate, you don't need a change of rules, you need a change of behavior. So we'll, uh -huh. see, we'll see if that can happen in the future. Um, first, uh, congratulations to the, for, the, for the work you all have done for the last several years on, on the pandemic preparedness. Uh, I had a hearing in June as chairman of the health committee on preparedness for the next pandemic. And we had Bill Frist and Mike Levitt and Julie Gerberding and uh, others. And Elizabeth Warren said, why are we doing this when we haven't got this one solved? And I said, Elizabeth, you know, one, the work that's been done over the last 10 years is have given us some very good tools for dealing with th this one. And two, uh, Jared Diamond's uh, article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago said the main thing difference about this virus and other viruses is the jet plane. Uh, the ability to spread it all around the world, all around the country so quickly, and the next pandemic could be next year. So here's my, here's my recommendation. Uh, Ruth Marcus, who works for the Washington Post, told me that when she first got a column there, that she asked David Broder, the Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, how, uh, any advice for the column? And he said, one idea per column. That's pretty good advice for a speech or for a five or six minute talk like I'm giving. So here's my one idea. Given all the background this group has in pandemic preparedness, I want to recommend that you look at what the Republicans voted for, 52 of 53, on COVID legislation the last time we voted. Because I got put into it three provisions, including provisions that you and many others have recommended, and some sustained funding, which Dr. Friss said he made 20 speeches on and 15 years ago and he never could get done. So the provisions are, um, uh, number one, uh, support for state stockpiles. There's $2 billion appropriated in the bill that Republicans voted for um, that would be available until September 30th, 2022. That's number one. And it, it, this is kind of an unusual thing. It's not an advanced appropriation. It's not a mandatory funding, but it's a foot in the door on sustained funding, which can be built on. Number two, uh, that bill authorizes BARDA to use funding to sustain spending for onshore manufacturing. Now, BART has got enough money to do that over the next several years. And if they're authorized to keep these plants warm in the way that Mike Levitt testified they needed to be done, that could make a big difference. I mean, Dr. Slowey said that four of the six vaccines that are being uh, uh, manufactured during this year could not have been done if the manufacturing plants hadn't been authorized back uh, eight, eight years ago. So, so this advanced planning makes a difference and this authorizes part of two. And number three, it also includes language to strengthen the federal stockpile. Now the, the legislation I introduced after my hearing had $15 billion for those three items. Those aren't the only important items, but they are three items. The <coughs> stockpiles, uh, support for onshore manufacturing, and support for the federal strategic stockpile. 
Those are three items that I think all, all the groups agree on. So as a practical matter, I think it's time to move from recommending to action. And you've got some actors there in your group. And if you've got 52 out of 53 Republicans who are willing to vote for these three things and some sustained funding, then I would suggest go to the Democrats and say, uh, embrace that. And if you can build on it, do. That'd be great too. There's bound to be some sort of COVID funding passed before the end of the year or perhaps more likely early next year. I'm not sure when. But either time, if it's in before the end of the year, I'll be pushing to, to, to keep this in there. But it needs bipartisan support to do it. So that's my message. And the only other thing I would say is I think it's important we have, you know, we, we're all hate the number of deaths and, and, and we, we wish that we wish that we didn't have those and we'll be doing studies for years asking why that happened this year. The fact of the matter is uh, the New York Times article that came out in early March that said the United States was better prepared than almost any country to deal with this virus. Um, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, you can go back to the increased investments in in the National Institutes of Health, record funding for the last several years, the uh, Infectious Disease Clinical Research Consortium, which allowed switching from one platform to another more rapidly, the public-private partnership at NIH, the use of, uh, of emergency youth authorizations. Those have been authorized for some time, but they've been used 288 times, and they're about to be used to put two vaccines out apparently in December, that will allow the distribution of 40 million doses this month. And then BARDA was established in 2006. That was crucial to the development of these vaccines and treatments that we see now. Uh, I mentioned the manufacturing facilities that were built, four of the six uh, are being built at those facilities that were authorized earlier. Um, and, and there are other things, even the supercomputing funding that we've that we've focused on has, has made a difference. And then the big, the big deal, of course, was to this idea of manufacturing up to 100 million doses in 2020 before they were approved. In case they were approved so they could be distributed within 24 hours after they were approved. And, and that's permitted in eight, doing in eight months what used to take several years. So I think all of this, and, and not just vaccines, treatments too already, Lily's antibody cocktail is out there and the Regeneron's is probably not far behind. Tennessee's beginning to receive the first doses for that. So I think there's a pretty good case made that advanced planning and preparedness for pandemics pays off. And then there's a pretty good consensus about what else needs to be done. At our hearing and in the white paper I put out in June, uh, we talked about accelerating tests, treatments, and vaccines, disease surveillance, stockpiles, distribution, and storage, a fund of public health, uh, the state public health, uh, make it clear who's on the flagpole. That's hard to do because you never know who the president is going to be, and presidents have their own ideas about how to do things. Uh, Julie Gerberding suggested more of the, more of the full-scale exercises. Um, uh, about what do you do if suddenly a new vaccine arises. So there, I, I think the message is the, the work you've done over the last several years is important. It's worth doing, we found out over the last 10 years, because it helped us be prepared for the successful things we've done on tests, treatments, and vaccines in 2020, which are the real payoff in terms of being ready. And let me conclude where I started with my David Broder advice. I would recommend that you use the horsepower in, that you've got in this commission to go to uh, Joe Biden and, and to the uh, uh, Trump administration and to the Democratic leaders and the Republican leaders and say, if you're gonna do a COVID bill, make sure you have pandemic preparedness in it because the next pandemic could be next year. And if you're Democrats, uh, start with what the Repu 52 Republicans have voted for. That's usually the harder part 
because they've actually got a foot in the door on sustained funding for state stockpiles and onshore manufacturing and some federal strategic stockpile. So that's my, that's my recommendation. Uh, thanks, Lamar. That was uh, great, uh, both, uh, I guess I say, substantively and politically. In other words, I think your three main points uh, are incidentally quite consistent with what was in our uh, initial report. Well, absolutely, you. absolutely. And, and, and that we, we will continue to press on, but uh, I think you've, you've, got a real, you've got real priorities there. And uh, we've started to uh, send papers and look for opportunities to speak to both the Trump administration and the Biden uh, transition. And uh, we'll continue to do that and we'll focus on these three, but I hope you'll have a chance to do that too from, um, from your point, because you, you've had, uh, well, you have stature and credibility. Well, so, thanks, Joe. But what I can do, I can get it into the Republican bill, which I did. I mean, yeah. I went to Senator McConnell and said, this has to be in there, and he eventually put it in. So it's in there. That's great. So, so you don't have, I mean, some, sometimes in passing a bill, as you know, and Tom Daschle knows, everybody knows, you don't have to talk to everybody. You just need to talk to the ones who are making the decisions. So if, if the Democratic leadership would decide they take the Republican proposals, which are really your proposals, they know there's nothing Republican about them. They're just in the Republican bill. Right. And then if they want to add to that, fine. My, my proposal was $15 billion of right. sustained funding for those three things, onshore manufacturing, state stockpiles, and strategic stockpiles. You may want to add uh, uh, support for state public health, other things like that. That's great. But I would, I would take it, I would not overlook what, there's no use in creating something new when you've already got something right there in front of you. Yeah, no, and I think this will appeal to uh, uh, the president-elect and his transition team because th these are all, uh, these are easy to accept. Yeah. Uh, and if you can start, uh, it, it, he'll be looking to uh, start with some things that give, will give him a chance to succeed and get it passed. So you've, you've been, uh, 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 that's a very helpful suggestion. Let, let me hey, ask. Joe, let me, let me uh, emphasize one more thing. Senator Frist said, that the single hardest thing to get done was sustained funding. And right. you, those of you who've been in the Congress know that. I mean, we don't operate that way. We do it year to year to year to year. And Republicans hate mandatory funding. There was a sustained funding. There was an advanced appropriation for, for BioShield that Judd Gregg did in the Health Committee about 10 years ago. So that's another way to do it. But I, but I tried to get advanced appropriations. I tried to get mandatory funding. I got my foot in the door a little bit uh, with what I just described to you. But sustained funding is just hard to do. And, and this is a big step toward that. Let, let me ask you one uh, question. And if you want to um, think about it and respond later, that's okay too. The previous witness, Tom Bossard, you know, who was in the Bush uh, White House and then Trump, um, said that um, uh, CDC didn't really perform as well as he hoped. I think he'd say it to you, so I, I don't hesitate to say it, as, whether, whether, as well as it could have in this crisis. And he thought that maybe just as after um, uh, Hurricane Katrina, there was a lot of uh, a review by Congress and happened in our committee, as it, as it happens, of uh, FEMA, and FEMA was reformed, maybe CDC is ready for that kind of congressional review. Now, I know you're leaving, but um, what, what, what does CDC come before the health committee? And if it does, uh, do you think it's, uh, it's time for it? I, I'm not I'm looking for a hatchet job, obviously, just a, a, a constructive review and maybe recommendations of some changes for how it can better handle the next pandemic. Well, an after action review is always a good idea. I mean, the military knows that. And of course, there should be a review of what happened with that first CDC test. Right. Because we lost several, despite the fact that the shark tank that Francis Collins has set up has now produced 22 new ways to do diagnostic tests and, and added 60 million a month capacity by December. So at least for how you develop a, an initial diagnostic test, that ought to be reviewed. But I think the answer to your question is yes. 
and I think what it will, sh I'm not sure what it will show. And, and okay. yes, it, it comes before the help, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. And the leaders of that are likely to be uh, Senator Burr and Senator Murray. And uh, of course, Senator Burr has been involved with this stuff for 20 years. He knows everything about it. And Senator Murray has been deeply involved in it as well. So I would think an early, uh, if I were there, I would say uh, a, a look at CDC would be a good idea. Good, thank you. Tom Bridge. Well, th thank you, uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, Senator, it's, uh, it's great to see you. Uh, we haven't had much uh, interaction over the years, but uh, I just as one American to another, I just want to thank you for your years of public service in so many different capacities. Well, same to you, Tom. Well, well, wish you and your family very, very well as you, Thank you. write another chapter in your, uh, in maybe not in your public life, but maybe enjoy that private life, which is. Uh, which yeah, I hope, I hope it's not public. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you can't help it. You can't run away. Listen, one of the challenges that we've had uh, during the past five years, uh, Senator, is that we laid out a, a very comprehensive plan, believe it or not, in anticipation of a pandemic. Uh, and uh, we weren't sure whether nation state would throw it at us, uh, mother nature, whatever, but it happened. And yet all those recommendations have languished and they're very specific, they're apolitical or bipartisan, have languished for five years. Now I, for one, and you, you and I and all of us on the board understand and appreciate that uh, this country, democracy more often than not, it writ large is reactive, not preemptive. Rarely do we say, well, we anticipate this might happen. So in anticipation of what might happen, we're gonna take this very aggressive action and start funding and doing these, funding these programs and doing things that's different. From your perspective, has the impact, the personal impact, a quarter of a million people died. Tom, Tom Daschle pointed out, uh, I think that uh, there have been less than 2,000 people died in Japan and they've got 130 million people. So obviously they did something right and we did something wrong. And maybe there's lessons learned there, but does the impact, not only the economic impact, three, four, five, six billion, trillion dollars, whatever it is, a quarter, of a million Americans dead. I'm interested in your impression whether or not you think the political institutions, ours and D's, House and Senate, will take a more serious look, not just only at these funding sources, but that range of recommendations that close multiple gaps, because Mother Nature is going to throw it at us again, and we won't be ready. I mean, even that funding, if we can get that, that may be two or three years down the road, but there are other things. So I'm just you're interested in your your impression as to whether or not the, the depth, the seriousness, the impact of this extraordinary complicated virus and frankly our, our response hasn't been very well coordinated, that's another story, will facilitate our effort as a group to get some of these recommendations embedded in legislation going forward in addition to additional funding. Your impression. My impression, well, my, your question is the reason why I had a hearing in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic and about the next pandemic and why I put out a white paper in June asking what we should do. Many of the recommendations came from you all because my conclusion was that our political institutions operate and they respond to the general environment in this country. We have a very short collective memory. I mean, President Trump's impeachment seems like, you know, ancient history today. Nobody even remembers it. And that was this year. So uh, according to the briefing I just had, if things go well, we're likely to be able to have given the vaccine to everybody in America who wants it by next summer. Now, think about that. I mean, that's, that, that's what the senators were told in the last hour by by the operation warp, warp speed people and and uh, two vaccines are ready uh, now almost ready uh, not approved yet but expected to be approved quickly two more in early next year and two more after that and and of course tens of millions of those vaccines are already manufactured because of advanced planning um, so I think what will happen if you bring up a bill next year, 
to sustain funding for onshore manufacturing or, or state stockpiles or the federal stockpile, that it'll, it'll, it'll do what happened every other time. You'll go from panic, neglect to panic. So my answer is, I think your recommendations in a comprehensive way are very helpful to create a baseline. But Congress does not, the Senate anyway, does not do comprehensive well, never has. I mean, and Henry Clay offered the compromise of 18, whatever it was, 50, and nobody took it. And he went to Nantucket to recover. And then Sam Houston got up and offered each piece one by one, and they all passed, but nobody voted. It was all different people voted for each piece. So I think you, you move, I would, that's why I suggest you move from the comprehensive that you've been doing so well. Take these three things at least that you've got 52 Republicans for in a bill and grab them while you can get them in the legislation that passes this month or, or next month or in January. Because as soon as everybody's vaccinated and the disease goes away, uh, we'll pay a lot less attention to this because we'll have other crises to deal with. Appreciate your insight and good luck and God bless. Thanks for your service. Thanks, Tom. Thank Thanks, Tom. Tom Daschle. Well, Lamar, thank you for being with us today. And we know you've got a very short time frame. So I, there are thousands of questions I'd love to ask you. But go, go ahead. Let me see if I can. <laughs> well, no, well, I just, just one, really, I guess. As you leave, uh, you've been there for a long time. You've been, uh, as everyone has noted, uh, really one of the more bipartisan people, uh, which is uh, seems like almost an extinct species these days. Uh, and I applaud that. I, I just would love your reflections on the institution of the Senate as you leave. It's been seven months. 200,000 people have died since the last COVID bill was passed. We don't seem to have an ability to come together on a COVID bill in spite of the huge repercussions that that's having. And it's just an enormously disappointing reflection of the dysfunction in the Congress and the institutions of the House and Senate. You're departing. You're a constructive, I used to always say, you know, you should judge people not by whether they're R or D, but whether they're a C or a D, a constructive or a destructive. You've been a C with a capital letter uh, for your career in the Senate. Give us your reflections on what has happened in the Senate and what, if anything, you think the institution can do to restore its ability to respond to the challenges we face, especially COVID? Well, I'll, I'll answer that two parts that I'll try to be, I'll try not to go on too long about. One, don't overlook that nearly unanimously in the matter of two or three weeks, we spent $3 trillion and that we set up something that had never been done before, which is to give all the money that was needed to develop tests, treatments, and vaccines in eight or 10 months instead of eight or 10 years. And, and then set up a diagnostic test, uh, Shark Tank, which produced 22 new ways to add 60 million tests a, a month to the capacity for that. And so we get to the end of the year with this big spike. And the only thing that would really help with it is, is 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 um, you know other than public health masks, which are very important, and 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 other public health things, but the the the, the fact that we have vaccines and treatments about to be ready is really the only solution. So that's been done pretty well, partly, but and and it was done almost unanimously. So whenever the Congress spends three or four trillion dollars almost unanimously in a matter of a few weeks, I mean, that would be the other side of the story. Now, what about Congress generally? Uh, there's, there's no doubt it's harder to work in the middle today than it was even when I came 18 years ago. Um, I, I think a big function of that is, is this, this, uh, this device, iPhone, was invented in 2008. Uh, Abraham Lincoln used to put his hot letters in the drawer and not send them. Now you put them on your tweet and send it to the world. And so we operate in that environment and, and the parties get 
pushed to the left and to the right and you run in primaries and that makes it hard to create political rewards for doing the things that need to be done. Now, I believe they still can be done and I've spent my time working on those. And I could go into a chapter and verse about fixing No Child Left Behind or 21st Century Cures with President Obama or the Great American Outdoors with President Trump or fully funding black colleges. I could go into a bunch of stuff. But clearly, clearly it's not what it ought to be. Uh, the main thing that's lost, Tom, that was there when you were there is, is restraint. Um, now, now, I mean, you know, for years you didn't, uh, there, there, there never was a judge or a cabinet member denied cloture by requiring 60 votes, although it could have happened. Uh, now we had a big fight over that, as you, as you know, and now there, even though there are 1400 presidential confirmations, uh, the Senate can only process seven or eight a week because everyone objects to every stage of the proceeding. You try to bring a bill up, uh, someone objects to a motion to proceed. Um, if you try to offer your own amendments, someone objects to that instead of just allowing a vote on it. So I think the senators would have to get back, what I say to them, it's, you know, it's hard to uh, get here, it's hard to stay here, and while you're here, you might as well try to accomplish something. And right now it's like joining the Grand Ole Opry and not being allowed to sing. <laughs> you, you, so I, I think it's just a matter of all that talent in the Senate, people just sitting down and saying, look, we're not gonna put up with this anymore. Uh, we're going to confirm the people we need to confirm. We're going to let amendments come up. We're going to get back to work. I think that'll, that'll require some political courage because of the environment that we work in and what I would call an internet democracy. Well, we're going to miss you, Lamar. Thank you. I Thank like you, Tom. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you. Uh, Jim Greenwood. Thank you, thank you, Joe, and, and thank you, Senator, for your lifetime of service. You have uh, already answered all of the questions that I had prepared, so I want to make two quick comments and see if you'd like to respond to, the, to either of them. Uh, the first is that it's my understanding that the CDC has never actually been statutorily authorized, and I wonder if you think it's about time that, that we did that. Um, secondly, um, and this is a little bit far afield, but the the response of the American biopharmaceutical industry to this, co this, this pandemic has been unbelievable. Some numbers, 773 unique active compounds in development, 194 vaccines, 213 antivirals, 366 treatments. Um, no one would have believed that we could have had vaccines this quickly uh, and 54 of them in human trials right now. Um, and yet, as you well know, because you've held hearings on this subject, um, the, the, the reputation of the industry has never been more under attack. And, if you, and it's been bipartisan. If you look at some of the things that President Trump has, uh, actions as he's taken, statements that he's made, um, both candidates in the election proposed um, uh, policies that would be absolutely destructive to our ability to continue innovate new products. Um, and and it's, the, it's the Modernas and the Novavax and the small companies that are going to have to be ready to respond to the next pandemic. And if some of these policies are, are actually enacted, we won't have that capacity the next time we need it. So I wonder if you'd comment on one or both of those topics, please. Well, you're right about that. I mean, I would think Americans who, I mean, Dr. Slawi, who, who just briefed the Senate and who headed up our Operation Warp Speed said, if you take the vaccine, you're buying a guarantee, basically, you won't be an impacted by it. And he thinks most Americans, when they think about it that way, uh, will do it. And then when they think about how we got there, they may think a little bit differently about the advantage of having firms like Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca and others, and about the importance of the National Institutes of Health Funding that we've increased in record numbers over the last six years. I mean, some of the antibodies for the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine came out of Vander Nashville, which um, um, uh, gets about $400 million a year from the National Institutes of Health for Biomedical Research. So I, th I, th I think maybe uh, 
a grateful nation might turn around and say, I'm awfully glad we had these companies because I got tired of being cooped up and wearing a mask and, and not going to Thanksgiving dinner and being afraid I might die if I'm over 65 years of age. And I'm delighted we had companies with, and, and universities with the capacity to, to do in eight months what normally had taken eight or 10 years. I hope that helps. Amen, it does help. And last is Ken Weinstein. I don't know if you've met Ken, um, maybe you do know him. He's, he was the Homeland Security Advisor in the uh, Bush 43 White House, and he's been a, a really uh, valued member of this commission. Go ahead, Ken. Thank you, sir, and good to meet you, Senator. Yes, um, sir. Thank you for being here with us today, and thank you for your, your lifetime of service, and congratulations on your retirement. I just want to do, um, with the last few minutes we have left, zero in on the question of congressional oversight uh, for the biodefense area. Um, I actually, it, as I've often said with this group, I was an executive branch guy my whole government career. And um, of course, you know, last thing you want to do when you're an executive branch official is get prepared to go up to a hearing and answer questions and do coofers, coofers and the like. Um, but I actually grew to appreciate the importance of oversight and consistent focused oversight. And so my question to you is, you know, how do we structure or restructure the congressional oversight of the biodefense field in a way that's going to not just do the oversight that's happening now and that's predictable in the aftermath of a crisis, which is important, but is only part of the, the obligation. The other part of the obligation is conducting that oversight between the crises, making sure that the executive branch agencies that have responsibility here are doing the blocking and tackling of pandemic planning and you know, building preparedness measures and putting them in place and this kind of thing. And also you know, making sure that they have the, um, the procurement they need. How do, how do we, uh, do, do you think we have the oversight structure in place right now? Or as in so many aspects of the Homeland Security field, is it pretty fragmented across Congress? And if it is, um, how would you recommend trying to possibly reorganize it, recognizing that that's a tough thing to do, reorganizing committee structures and responsibilities. But how would you recommend reorganizing it so that there is a focused, maintained, consistent um, oversight you know, for the years ahead and not just for the next year or two until, as you pointed out, people's attention will get diverted to other issues? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great observation. Uh, and I've got a bias on that. It goes all the way back to my time as governor and, I, uh, and as a university president. I used to look at problems and say, I think we could do a lot better with a different structure. And then, and then I would think about all of the political capital and all the time it would take to change the structure and say, now what have I spent all that time and energy on a very focused effort to, take the, to make the existing structure do what I wanted it to do. And I always took the latter. So um, I, I, you're correct, there, there's some fragmentation, but you, to go back to Jim's point, uh, the CDC, I didn't know it was not authorized. It, it, uh, that's news to me, maybe that's true, but it does come before our committee, but we, we've had 10 uh, hearings, full hearings, uh, uh, oversight hearings on just the pandemic, just in our health committee. We've had Senator Murray and I have probably had another 10 briefings that involved as many as half the, half the senators. And, and um, we had uh, a, a pandemic preparedness hearing in the middle of the current pandemic, which I mentioned earlier, which at least one or two senators thought was unnecessary. Um, so I, I don't think I would recommend, um, I, I, I don't think you're going to change the fragmented structure of the Senate committees. Senator Perdue from Georgia has spent the last six years trying to figure out how to do that. I think I would, he would tell you that he hadn't moved an inch in terms of figuring out 
how to get that done. I mean, he's a turnaround CEO for two big companies, you know, and that's the way he wanted to approach the Senate. I don't think it'll work that way. What I do think is that if you pick three or four objectives and, and, and like sustained funding for onshore manufacturing, let's just take that to make sure that whatever these manufacturing plants are, don't go cold between now and the next pandemic. That's one of your recommendations. That's one of Bill Frisk. If you took that funding and used your horsepower and talked to everybody in a position to do something about it, you could probably get that done. And the other thing I've learned is if you have a, if you have a set of recommendations that are broadly supported, like yours, and like the ones I think I've just, those three things I mentioned, I mean, those aren't my recommendations, those are yours, and everybody agrees with them. Then you wrap them up in a nice package and you wait for the train to come along. And when the train comes along, you jump on it. It's, it's just not very, it's just not very well organized. So, so what I'm suggesting is you've got a train probably coming before the end of the year or early next year on COVID. Anything you want done to deal with fragmentation, sustained funding, your priorities, I get it on that train. And that may not be the way you do it in Dollar General or in the military or in other places, but that's the way that that's the way the Senate is going to do it. Otherwise, you'll just end up with a commission endlessly meeting and never getting anything done. So, if you want to move from recommend, you've done the critical part, which is creating a, a a a set of recommendations that are broadly accepted. Now, I take advantage of of what's going what's going on. It may be possible to restructure some things. I think Jim's suggestion about. CDC is a good one. Senator Burr, if he's chairman or ranking member of the health committee, will have lots of ideas and lots of experience about that because he's been working on it 20 years. So it's an opportunity during these next six months, while the iron's hot, so to speak, while people are still getting vaccinated, to do everything that needs to be done. I think once it's done, it's going to go back down and there'll be, there'll be other big issues that'll, that'll come to the forefront until the next pandemic. Uh, th thanks, Ken. Uh, hey, Lamar, you've been great. Your last answer reminded me once, I forgot which colleague in the Senate <laughs> gave me the advice. Think of yourself as a surfer. If, if you're out there, you, you don't ever think you can make your own wave to ride in. You wait till you see that big one, and then you jump right on yeah. and, and ride it to shore. But you better have a surfboard. You better have a surfboard ready. That, that you can do. <laughs> That's important. Uh, Lamar, you've been really helpful. Thanks for your time today. Thanks for all you've done in your career. It was a real honor and a pleasure to serve with you. And I know you said that I mean, you've had an extraordinary life of public service and you said the rest of it is gonna be private. But as you will see, if you look at this screen, yeah. this mission is composed of what I call public service recidivists. And uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities uh, as you choose for you to bring the extraordinary experience and wonderful judgment you have to bear on public problems. So I hope you uh, do that with, of course, and I must say, with keeping Hadass in mind with the con uh, advice and consent of honey, of your honey. Thank you very much. You know, one of, one of our former colleagues said the only cure for politics is embalming f fluid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, for, for, thank you for what you've done. I, this commission has formed a, has, has been very valuable and uh, you've created a consensus on, on, and you've targeted it. And now I think your time is ripe to get, you can probably get part of it done in the next two or three months and you may be able to get more of it done in three or four months after that while people are still focused. Yeah, your advice uh, has been really uh, focused and uh, you challenge us, but in a way that we're happy to accept. So God bless you. Good luck. Take care. Thank you, Joe, and to all of you, Tom, and, or, and Tom, all of you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Lamar. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of very important and uh, panelists, uh, a couple of important panels and experienced panelists to share their perspectives with us this afternoon. Uh, the first panel uh, includes uh, uh, Hillary Carter, Dr. Carter, Senior Advisor, Office of Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction, 
Obviously, we think COVID-19 has been a weapon of mass destruction beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, and as a former director of uh, countering biological threats at the National Security Council. Um, Hillary will be joined by uh, Dr. Rajiv Venkaya, president of the Global Vaccine Business Unit at Takeda Pharmaceutical Company. He's a former special assistant to President George W. Bush for Biodefense, the Homeland Security Council in the White House. And our fourth panelist is uh, from FEMA, organization with which I am uh, very familiar and uh, very fond of because I think they do some exceptional work and having continued to do that work, Bob Roller, who's part of the national planning team at FEMA. So without uh, further ado, we're going to ask Dr. Carter to speak, and then we'll uh, proceed with the other two members of the panel. Dr. Carter. Thank you very much, Governor Ridge, well, members thank you. of the commission. It's really a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm just, uh, I just want to say thank you for the work that the commission continues to do to support biodefense. Um, it's really critical for our preparedness. So I will provide some brief comments um, and then I look forward to your questions in the discussion. And hopefully the comments that I provide will be complementary to what Mr. Ruler provides on the uh, more operationally focused um, planning. So as this audience knows very well, Biological threats, whether they are deliberate, unintentional, or naturally occurring, are among the most serious threats to U.S. national security. As we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, infectious disease threats do not respect borders, and in our interconnected world, can spread rapidly. Biological threats are a fundamental and distinct aspect of national and homeland security and require a focused and systematic approach to reducing risk. I believe that the United States must continually adapt its approach to anticipate future threats, while at the same time, we must continue to mitigate persistent threats. Strategy development and implementation are critical aspects of risk reduction, and strategy must empower and augment mission execution at the federal level and also at the state and local level. In this context, the United States government developed the National Biodefense Strategy in late 2018. Core principles that underscore the development of the strategy include four items. First, a comprehensive approach. Similar to how the commission has taken a very comprehensive approach in developing its reports, we acknowledged early on that the biodefense mission includes several departments and agencies. This strategy is predicated on the idea that we must leverage all aspects of our biodefense enterprise for efficient operations. Second, the concept of one leader. It was important that we established a single lead strategy and implementation of the strategy. We wanted a single department to be held responsible for the biodefense enterprise with the support from other departments and agencies. A third core principle was accountability. We wanted a single lead for the strategy, and it was also important to be able to hold each department and agency accountable for implementing the biodefense actions. And then fourth, uh, a core principle was transparency. Last but not least, we wanted to create a culture of transparency so that anyone across the U.S. government could know the actions being taken to strengthen biodefense. We also think it's important to be transparent with the public and with our partners, especially state and local partners. We think this is how you achieve greater efficiencies and also prevent duplication. So how do we define biodefense in the strategy? Generally speaking, they're the actions to counter biological threats, reduce risks, prepare for, respond to, and recover from biological incidents. To the U.S. government, biodefense includes deliberate, accidental, and unintentional biological threats. I'm sorry, naturally occurring biological threats. Biodefense encompasses threats to humans, animals, plants, and the environment. It includes national and international biological threats and actions. And it acknowledges that we can't counter biological threats domestically without addressing them internationally. So the biodefense strategy, its implementation plan, and National Security Presidential Memorandum 14 were released in September of 2018. The strategy has five goals that span the missions of nearly every department and agency. The first goal is to assess biological risks and ensure risk awareness across the enterprise. The second goal is to ensure capabilities to prevent biological incidents. The third is to prepare to reduce the impacts of biological incidents when they inevitably occur. The fourth is to respond rapidly to biological incidents. And the fifth is to recover after biological incidents 
to restore the community, the economy, and the environment. So how do we define biodefense? Um, generally speaking, it's the actions to counter biological threats, reduce risks, and prepare for, respond to, and recover from biological incidents. Um, and in this, uh, the National Security Presidential Member Memorandum 14 um, describes the governance structure. So HHS is the federal lead for coordinating the implementation of the strategy, and it chairs a cabinet level group called the Biodefense Steering Committee. Each year, the US government conducts an assessment to determine and analyze how the government is doing in implementing the strategy as described in NSTM 14. This assessment is used to inform joint policy guidance and identifies US government wide priorities for the upcoming budget cycle. And uh, at the end of this cycle, a report is released to the public. So I'd like to highlight a few key implementation steps um, that have happened over the last uh, several months. Um, so first, the US government prepared an assessment that for the first time in recent years, captured the full breadth of the biodefense enterprise. And this data was used to inform the priorities for the upcoming year. The Biodefense Steering Committee met earlier this year uh, with the goal of furthering the implementation of the strategy. And the first public report was, re was released earlier this year, which describes at a high level the actions the U.S. government has completed and taken to improve our defenses against biological threats. And I'll conclude my marks with remarks with just four observations on strategy development and strategy implementation. First, strategy development is hard. It's difficult. It requires the ability to see beyond what you're doing and describe what you should be doing to counter current and future threats. It also takes a significant amount of political will to overcome bureaucratic inertia and orient the federal government toward, to achieve specific goals. I like to say, or I like to think about as the stars aligning to develop a strategy that will have meaningful impact. Second, in strategy development, I do think there is value in the journey. There's the famous quote that I'm sure everyone has heard, and that is, life is a journey, not a destination. And I think this is true for strategy development. There's a lot of value in considering, debating, and determining the direction a government or an organization should take. Third, a third observation is that development of a strategy and an implementation plan is really just the beginning. The goals of the strategies must be incorporated into annual planning, budgeting, execution, each and every day. A strategy should not be something that you do once in a while and put on a shelf, but rather it's something that's internalized and woven into all aspects of biodefense activities. And then fourth and finally, um, and I know the commission had a, um, a session on this this morning, but leadership and buy-in really matters. For real change, there must be support, not only at the highest levels of government, but at every level. All parties must be committed to implementing the strategy. And so with that, I will conclude my marks and thank, remarks and thank you again for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to the discussion. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carter. We, we look forward to having that exchange with you as well. But uh, Dr. Venkaya, we're going to return the floor to you. And then after that, I'm going to ask uh, Bob Roller uh, from FEMA to give us his remarks. Doctor? Thank you, Governor Ridge. And it's great to talk to this, uh, this commission again. I am well aware that in the middle of this pandemic, there are many lessons learned that you're all aware of. Uh, and so I'm not going to give my views on how we've done uh, on a point by point basis with regard to strategy implementation as it relates to this pandemic. What I would like to do, and we'll, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sure covered that in the, in the Q&A. What I would like to talk about are some learnings that came from the development of the national strategy for pandemic influenza when I was in the White House from 2004 to 2007. We, we did at the same time, uh, or in that same time frame, put out uh, a couple of uh, relevant presidential directives that are captured in the, the previous report from the commission, uh, including a, a strategy for medical countermeasure development and a strategy for medical and public health preparedness. Those are HSPDs 18 and 21, respectively. Uh, but let me, let me talk about the pandemic influenza strategy and implementation plan development, because I think that there are a number of lessons learned that are relevant to our preparedness for any biological threat and directly relevant to how we've done COVID-19. Um, first of all, let me say that we planned for this event. When we look back at the planning scenarios of, that drove the strategy and implementation plan, 
the attributes of that influenza virus that we planned against are very similar to what we are now seeing today with COVID-19. So no one should have the illusion that because we prepared for a flu pandemic, but then we're faced with a coronavirus pandemic, that we uh, had just prepared for the wrong thing. We actually prepared for, for this scenario. Um, the second learning from this, this effort was that national leadership and commitment makes a huge difference. In the summer of 2005, when H5N1 be, emerged as a clear and present threat, the fact that the president himself personally became engaged on the issue and requested a national strategy and all departments and agencies to step up made a huge difference in our ability to get buy-in from senior people across the government. 14 departments and agencies played a role in developing the implementation plan for the national strategy. We could not have done that had the president not requested, uh, or, sorry, told, directed the departments and agencies to participate in this. The third is that as a result of that directive, we were able to establish a cross-governmental team of those from those 14 departments and agencies of individuals that were at or just below the assistant secretary level that met on a regular basis. In fact, uh, during the midst of this planning for at least a year, every week we would meet together to talk about the implementation plan and how we were executing on its directives. As a result, we built a layer across the entire federal government of people who had core competence in the functions of their departments and agencies, but were trained to apply those capabilities and the perspective to the pandemic preparedness and response challenge. And such that, that was so effective that whenever incidents arose related to a pandemic flu virus or not, H5N1 or not, we could immediately call upon people who knew exactly what their role was across the government in preparing for and responding to, uh, to a biological threat. It was clear that, again, having strong White House engagement made a big difference. We were able to call meetings uh, and engage at any level uh, without any difficulty because it was clear that our responsibility was directed by the president. The next point I'll make is around the issue of unavailability of countermeasures. When we were preparing the strategy, we recognized that for at least six months, the first six months of a flu pandemic, we would not have vaccines. And of course, we knew that this was the principal way that we could protect populations. We then moved to thinking about what communities could do to protect or shield their populations until a vaccine became available. And through a combination of two events happening, we came up with a community mitigation strategy to support communities. First of all, we learned the lessons of 1918 and saw that those cities that acted early in a coordinated fashion did better than those that did not. The second lessons came from disease modeling. We actually commissioned an NIH consortium of modeling experts called the MIDAS Consortium to model the impact of a number of imperfect public health measures when implemented early in a pandemic to slow the spread of a virus. And in fact, we showed in multiple models that community mitigation, what we now call the flattening the curve strategy, could be very effective. And that canonical graph that you've seen about flattening the curve that came from the guidance that we issued in 2007. The third is that, or the next is that we, we recognize that states and locals um, played a key role here, that we could come up with this guidance, but there had to be substantial engagement of localities in, in this preparation. And we did exactly that because we faced resistance when developing this mitigation strategy. There were people that were concerned about the economy. There were people that were, were concerned about the impact of closing schools on children and, and families. Uh, now, we never thought that we would have to implement anything close to the lockdown that we're, we're talking about today. These were much more relaxed measures, but yet still we faced this opposition. We overcame it through a robust dialogue with state and local authorities. The last point that I'll make uh, is that, well, actually one last point on community mitigation because it applies to today. One thing we learned about these non-pharmaceutical interventions was that you have to plan to implement them. In other words, you need to know what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and you have to do it in a coordinated fashion. Doing halfway measures in an uncoordinated way, sorry about the background noise, will bring you all the cost and none of the benefits. And so, uh, and that is exactly in fact what we're seeing in this pandemic. 
The last point that I will leave you with is that I believe the federal government was better prepared to do its job in supporting states and locals in protecting their populations from a pandemic in 2007 than we've demonstrated we could do in 2020. And I think that is a very important takeaway for me that it is possible to develop the capability to effectively lead and guide the country through a crisis of this nature. I am coming out of the events to date feeling optimistic that we're going to be better prepared for the next pandemic because of what we've, we've learned so far about our ability to protect populations through things like lockdowns. If we do them in a smart, coordinated way, I'm even more optimistic and happy to discuss this in the Q&A on where we are with vaccines and drug and diagnostic development, because I think the state of affairs in those areas gives us the potential to take pandemic threats, at least certain classes of pandemic threats, off the table before the next pandemic happens. And that gives me huge optimism. And with that, I'll stop. Well, I would tell you, a Doctor, we all embrace an optimistic look to tomorrow. We got to get through today. And we look forward to that conversation with you uh, in a few moments. But uh, before then, I want to talk to, uh, ask Bob Roller to uh, give us the benefit of your experience and your perspective. Thank you, sir. I also want to thank the Commission for the opportunity to discuss the critical role of operational planning as a cross-cutting capability of critical importance for all hazards, including infectious diseases that can become global pandemics as COVID-19 has certainly become. This is also an especially important topic for me personally because I've served as both an operational planner in the federal government with experience planning for and responding to emerging diseases dating back to the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. But I also spend my night serving as a paramedic with my community where I see the impact of COVID-19 and our response to it on an individual level uh, within the community where I live that's heavily impacted by this disease. I'm also eager to describe our work preparing for COVID-19 within a broader preparedness architecture that ensures readiness for all hazards, as well as the role that strategic guidance documents such as the National Biodefense Strategy and National Security Presidential Memorandum 14 provide to us. So the national planning system uh, includes operational planning as a core capability that is the backbone of the system established by Presidential Policy Directive 8 in national preparedness. PBD 8 establishes requirements for the national preparedness goal as well as defining preparedness, prevention, mitigation, response, and recovery mission areas. PBDA also establishes a planning architecture necessary to ensure that the nation is prepared for all hazards. In particular, I wanna highlight the national response framework that serves as the foundational emergency management doctrine for how the nation responds to all types of incidents. The NRF is built on a scalable, flexible, and, and adaptable concepts uh, that include the National Incident Management System and align key roles and responsibilities across the nation. The structures, roles, and responsibilities described in the framework can be partially or fully implemented in the context of any threat or hazard and in anticipation of any uh, significant event or response to an incident. Beneath the NRF are federal interagency uh, operational plans or FIOPS that further clarify roles and responsibilities for all stakeholders in each mission area, as well as incident specific annexes for topics that require unique approaches and have roles and responsibilities that are specific to particular types of threats or incidents. So the overarching guidance for incident response provided by the NRF provides an organized structure to manage coordination for resources and the requirements between interagency partners all the way down to the local level. Nested within the national response framework and the response and recovery FIOPS are incident specific annexes that outline federal organizing concepts for responding to and recovering for a range of threats. The BIA in particular serves as a reference for state, local, tribal, and territorial authorities, as well as private sector organizations to conduct adaptive planning consistent with hazard and risk analyses that are specific to biological threats within their community. The BIA was first promulgated in 2008 and was updated in 2017. It's intended to be scalable, flexible, and adaptable 
uh, to a wide range of biological incidents, regardless of the, the cause, the size, or the location, as well as the complexity. This includes identifying decision-making structures, uh, actions that span both of the response and cover, recovery mission areas, as well as accounting for international aspects and human-animal interface as it pertains to a biological incident. The national planning system, including the NRF, the FIOPS, and the BIA, refine and clarify roles and responsibilities and the structures that can be used for all manner of biological incidents. However, there has always existed a need for more detailed threat and hazard specific plans to address topics or that are well known in advance or emergent with little advance notice. Major interagency planning efforts focused on emerging infectious diseases with pandemic potential predate the arrival of COVID-19 as well as the strategy, but are continually refined and updated with best practices and lessons learned information from real world incidents and planned exercises. One of these plans is the Interagency Pandemic Crisis Action Plan that was originally drafted in 2013 as the US government was monitoring the emerging H7N9 avian influenza outbreak in China, as well as the MERS-CoV outbreak in the Middle East. The PANCAP, for short, leveraged prior work from the earlier 2009 H1N1 pandemic and was completed and completed a scheduled update in 2018 as part of the regular planning and exercise cycle. The PANCAP was developed to address the threat of pandemic influenza, but the crisis action planning process that is regularly employed by emergency managers anticipates the adaption of plans such as these to meet specific conditions and requirements for real world incidents. Therefore, as COVID-19 emerged, FEMA and HHS planners with interagency partners to adapt the PANCAP into the COVID-19 response plan in March, 2020. It's based on what was known about SARS-CoV at the time and includes key adjustments, including updated facts, assumptions, and critical considerations that were unique to that incident as it was understood. It aligned emergency management phasing with CDC intervals and expanded the coordination structures for each phase of the response to include options for the HHS as the lead federal agency with FEMA leading the unified coordination group. It also developed an operations annex with detailed implementation guidance using the task force construct that was previously developed. Following the adaptation of the PANCAP, the national response transitioned to a national support plan that was developed within the National Response Coordination Center, consistent with the processes established for Stafford Act incidents, which this became as the incident progressed. The BIA is scheduled for its next revision in 2021 and will include lessons learned from the COVID-19 response uh, in particular, the results of the after action review that are currently underway. The last point that I want to make before I conclude my comments is to speak briefly on the role of the strategic guidance in the operational planning that, that we perform on a regular basis. FEMA participated in the development and the implementation of the 2018 biodefense strategy and wherever necessary adjusted our plans to address any new requirements and change to federal agency roles and responsibilities. But, FEMA, as well as our partners, also leverage these plans as well as the relevant exercises and lessons learned to help ensure that we could meet the requirements within the strategy specific to conducting federal response operations. And, and perhaps most importantly, from an operational planning perspective, one of the major advantages of strategic level guidance such as the National Biodefense Strategy and the National Security Presidential Memorandum is that it establishes, or in this case, reaffirms biodefense as a priority concern of national importance, which thereby drives planning exercises and resource investments towards greater overall preparedness for all biological incidents, including COVID-19 and any that emerge in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, listen, uh, we've got ample time for questions, and I'm quite confident that my colleagues will bombard you with many inquiries. So let me let me let me begin. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Carter, thank you for the critical role you played in developing uh, the strategy uh, that was uh, made available for public comment and for oh, for, for use back in uh, in 18 2018. We want to thank you for that. In that strategy, you talked about a single, uh, a single leader uh, to implement the strategy. Our uh, commission has felt it ought to be in the White House. It ought to be embedded in the vice president's office 
Uh, your thoughts with regard to that, uh, that notion of having a high level uh, oversight from within the White House by uh, the Vice President, whether or not that was ever considered to be a part of the strategy or in your review to just leave that open and identify some later date who should be the single leader in charge. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and it's an important one. And, uh, you know, the report that was released in 2015 and the subsequent updates, uh, we read that very carefully that the commission put out and noted that uh, the recommendation from the commission was for the vice president to lead the biodefense strategy. And so during the development, we took that into consideration. I think um, where we ended up, of course, is identifying the federal lead as the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and what we wanted to do is, um, and, and what ended up happening was HHS is uh, responsible and the lead for coordinating the implementation of the strategy. So the day-to-day -day, um, implementation of the strategy, the activities that happen across the vast biodefense enterprise, and where this leads the White House, and in particular, the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs under NSPM 14, is still the lead for the policy issues that arise and the defining or definition of the policy priorities that the US government should focus on on an annual basis. And so I think the, um, the White House and NSC in particular has a very strong and important role to play in implementing the biodefense strategy, um, but it is, it's on the biodefense and on the, I'm sorry, it's on the policy and on the strategic direction and strategic priorities on an annual basis. Well, I, I appreciate that. I and not to contradict your good work, I still don't think that's high enough because I personally don't believe that one cabinet secretary can talk to another cabinet secretary and direct them to do specific things. But I do want to thank you. And I think the, that's one of the few recommendations that actually not only saw the light of the day, but you led it to make it public. So we're grateful for your, your professional uh, commitment to getting it done. And I just want to thank you on behalf of the commission. I want to ask uh, uh, a question now, if I might, uh, Roger, uh, Dr. Venkai, President Bush, multiple presidential directives, coordinating among 14 different cabinet, 14 different enterprises in government. And we saw that because with it, we saw there are 50, 50 political appointees are scattered all over, but you need a White House uh, command and control center by and large. And I guess when you know the president's in charge, you pay a lot of attention to what the, the White House directives might be. Are you, can you comment on whether or not that structure, that integration of assets, that collaboration uh, was carried on in the next administration or did that infrastructure just slowly atrophy uh, because of indifference, disuse, or did they organize it in a different way? So I, I have to admit that I don't have a detailed understanding of how uh, things worked after the, the Bush administration. I believe that uh, they, they had, uh, a, a, maybe a slightly different way of managing things. I'm not saying it was better or worse, I, I can, but I can say that having this, this layer across the government that you could call together, which had a level of trust and familiarity, trust with each other, familiarity with the issues was extraordinarily valuable. Um, the other point I would make is that, uh, is to echo what you said about White House leadership. Um, it is very difficult for an operational department or agency to, um, to order other agencies to do certain things. Now, at an operational level, you can get to a level of functioning where, where some of that can happen. But when it comes to policy and strategic direction, I believe the White House has to be involved. I'll also say that when, we've had, when we had certain bio events uh, when I was at the White House, the White House sometimes had to, to step in to kind of help the government get its act together. Because if it, it could be a bio watch environmental detection of a bio threat agent, uh, and we, we found that the, the, the departments weren't moving as quickly or in as coordinated a fashion as necessary. Stepping in at that point uh, to get things going in the right direction was a very valuable role. So I think, you know, one of the learnings for me was that having a center of gravity in the White House where bio issues go was extremely valuable because everybody knew that if there was, whether it be Ebola or a bio uh, hit on, on a bio watch detector, we were the ones that we're going to pull together the representative people from across the government. With regard by the, to your point about the, 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 the vice president's office, I understand the, the rationale for that because you do want some things, somebody positioned uh, 
in a place of authority. Uh, it depends on how the administration is, is operating. If the VP's office is involved in day-to-day -day policy making, leading policy activities, that's, then that could work. Otherwise, I, my suggestion would be to use the existing policy framework, because if you create a new framework for driving something in the midst of a crisis, it's unlikely to work as well as if you use something that's well proven. Thank you for your input. Final question, uh, Mr. Roller, just out of curiosity, as we get the good news and anticipate the development of uh, multiple vaccines and therapeutics, uh, what will the FEMA role be vis-a-vis -vis in the collaboration with HHS to be part of that distribution system? And are we, do we have in place a plan uh, once we get to manufacture literally hundreds of millions of these, of this treatment uh, to uh, get distribution? And if you're at liberty to share what that distribution pattern might be, we would like to know that. Thank you, sir. So uh, I'd like to highlight that you know, FEMA has been very closely tied to HHS and all of our partners when it comes to uh, the work with vaccine development, but also the, kind of the logistics processes, because sir, as you know, uh, being able to move commodities is one of the key things that FEMA can really do to affect a response, whether that be a hurricane or an earthquake, or in this case, a pandemic. As far as the specific plans go for the distribution of this particular vaccine, I don't have good insight on those at the moment, only because uh, my understanding is that they're either still in development or given the complex nature of the vaccine and some of the handling issues and how this particular vaccine uh, is unique and some of the handling concerns that would um, make it ineligible for some of the distribution processes that we had in place for uh, previous pandemic events that would allow us to use, say, points of dispensing and so on, uh, just make the mission more challenging. Thank you very much. Uh, my colleague, Senator Lieberman. Uh, thank you, Governor Ridge. Thanks to the uh, guest witnesses for their helpful testimony. I, I appreciated uh, your questions, Tom, about leadership, because uh, that was a focus of ours, as, as has been mentioned in our 2015 report, because uh, we found a lot of effort on biodefense in the federal government, a lot of money being spent, uh, one of the things that was stunning to us is that we, we couldn't, no, nobody seemed to have a, 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 a comprehensive budget for biodefense to actually tell us how much federal government was spending every year. We had to go to the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we always go to Western Pennsylvania when you need something really hard to get. Is that right, Governor? Had you get a chance to editorialize and recognize that publicly. Thank you very much, <laughs> Senator. Yes, sir. Uh, but you, uh, Dr. Curley, you, you mentioned that uh, one of the uh, goals initially was to have one leader for biodefense. So to a certain extent, without belaboring the point, we backed into the recommendation of the vice president because every other alternative had just didn't uh, seem to work. And this seemed like the better one in the White House, as Governor Ridge has said. Uh, but the, the choice uh, has been for uh, uh, Department of Health and Home, uh, uh, Human Services to be the lead agency. And I want to ask you uh, and uh, Mr. Roller, because you're in the federal government still now, how has that worked? I mean, in other words, ha our fear about, as has been said, our, our reluctance or concern was that if you gave it to one department, other departments involved, and there's so many involved, wouldn't listen. And it would take somebody like the vice president or maybe somebody in the um, National Security Council from the White House to actually coordinate the federal uh, biodefense uh, enterprise. How's it worked? So I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, and Please. at first I must say, being from Western Pennsylvania myself, I appreciate the shout out there. Um, so amazing. I think of our witnesses are from Western Pennsylvania. I'm a little <laughs> suspicious. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> go um, thank you. So I think um, you know there there are always challenges in implementing any strategy. I think I really want to commend um, HHS for the leadership that they've shown in implementing the strategy. I think looking you know more broadly at um, the biodefense enterprise. And doing those things that are outlined in NSTM 14, um, which includes 
um, you know, to your point, Senator, um, uh, gathering information on the activities and the budgets that are ongoing, taking that information, compiling it, assessing the gaps, and then determining where, you know, we are not investing. That is no small undertaking. And I think, you know, what we've seen is that the U.S. government has participated um, very robustly in that process and came together to identify the um, set of priorities that are going to be the focus, um, you know, moving forward. And so it, it is no small task, but I think there's a dedicated team at um, HHS to, to do that. And I think across the government as well. I'll defer to Mr. Roller to add additional comments. Okay, Mr. Roller, what do you think? How, how's, uh, how's it working with the HHS uh, coordinating? So I'd just like to uh, build on what Dr. Carter mentioned and how complex the, the incident has been and some of the unique challenges that we've had with COVID-19 in particular. In the planning and preparedness work that we've done prior to this year, uh, we understood HHS as the lead federal agency for um, all biological incidents. And much of our planning and preparedness work was focused on that. But given the, the sheer scope of this particular incident and how nearly the entire country, the entire world was affected simultaneously, it required uh, real-time adaptation and changes to both our plans and our operations that were all done essentially in real time. One of those included uh, issuing a uh, Stafford Act uh, 501B declaration, which allowed FEMA to leverage its Stafford Act authority in a way that we had never done before. And to do that in parallel with HHS with their unique legal authority as well as capability and responsibilities of this missionary. And so it was a unique challenge, both in the complexity and the novelty of this particular incident and uh, it presented some real uh, opportunities for growth and learning for us. Okay, uh, Dr. Venkaya, let me just give you an opportunity to comment on this, because even though you're, you have not been uh, in the government uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, you were there earlier in uh, other circumstances. And I, my guess is, as you said in your opening statement, you have some thoughts about the importance of leadership. Do, do, does DHS, DHHS make sense to you as the lead? Not for the whole response. Uh, I, you know, a pandemic is, a, is driven by a health issue. Uh, it's the disease that, uh, in this case, a virus causes. But if whether you're talking about an epidemic, a small scale event, if it is of any um, scope in a community, or if you're talking about a potential or real pandemic threat, it is not appropriate, in my view, for HHS to have the lead, because this is an all of society, uh, all of com whole community, uh, whole nation issue. You have to, in my view, you have to have White House leadership, and you have to have, uh, I, you know, I think, personally, I think the NSC is the right place for this, because the NSC does this kind of thing in other crises, uh, that they have a point person who is an expert, uh, has a right technical background, also knows how to do strategy and policy that is holding the departments and agencies accountable. It doesn't mean that the White House is managing the day-to-day -day operations. That can be, of course, should be tasked uh, to departments and agencies to run, but holding them accountable, getting them together on a regular basis to track how we're doing, uh, I think is, is a role that only the White House can play. So you would have a coordinator in the NSC for what, what would it be? What would the jurisdiction be? And, and if, if you could uh, write it yourself. It would be an individual at a senior level, uh, potentially a, a deputy national security advisor who is responsible right. for health threats. And that brings us to another point, which may be a given for this commission at this point in the pandemic, I don't know. But that is that uh, we, we have to be thinking about day-to-day -day capacities and planning in our state and local medical and public health entities, if we come to them with a set of criteria to prepare for a low probability, high consequence event, we won't get traction. We've, we've tried and failed at that for a very long time. We, we have to bolster the day-to-day the -day, uh, uh, capabilities to deal with day-to-day -day challenges. And if we do that well, I believe that we'll be uh, very well prepared for any emergency that hits us in, in the future. Well said. Uh, Dr. Carter, I, I know, as uh, Governor Ridge said, that you uh, played a, a very active role uh, in the drafting of the National Biodefense Strategy, which our 
2015 report called for, and we were uh, very grateful when it appeared. But like so much else that happens in uh, organizations, and including the federal government, uh, I believe it's not been fully implemented. So, uh, okay, now we have a new, uh, presumably a new administration coming in. Um, what, what can we do uh, to uh, uh, facilitate further implementation of the national biodefense strategy that you helped to draft? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think one of the roles that um, you all have played and I think you know, can continue to play is awareness raising. And um, you know, we are in a, a, a time right now where awareness is very, very high um, because of the you know, devastating COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, I think you know, continuing to identify specific places where um, the US government can make progress. Um, your, your recent report, um, you know, the, the, I guess the multiple recent reports that you've released, but having specific recommendations that the US government can review and, you know, as you know, probably won't implement all of them, but I think having specific things um, is really helpful to the overall effort. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Governor Tom. I yield. Dr. Carter, I want to follow up with uh, Senator Lieberman's question, if I could, just a little bit. I, you know, I, I recall our, our just elaborate deliberations years and years ago now, and the recognition of the importance of a strategy. And, and we put a lot of time and effort into thinking just how you would devise it and how it would be created. And you obviously were the one to implement it and to, to, to draft it in, in real form. Ours was a recommendation, yours was the real thing. But as I look back over these last, this last uh, 10 months now, uh, I, I, I have to, just following up with a little bit with what Joe was asking, I, I don't know whether it's design or execution or both that led us to our current circumstances. You certainly were so correct in acknowledging the importance of, of, of participation and, and a recognition of the threat and people's uh, willingness to, to comply to recommendations on best practices for good health, uh, but that hasn't worked. And so I, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, if we were smart enough to understand just what we could have done better over these last uh, 10 months, is it more on the design side, the execution side? Uh, could you elaborate on your appreciation of what it was you expected when the strategy was written and how you see it now looking back? Yeah, thank you for the question. And I, um, I should say, you know, I, I appreciate the, um, the comments from uh, many people. I, I just, we, um, I was fortunate enough to be at the NSC when the stars aligned to write this strategy. There is an incredible team of um, US government personnel who are really behind this strategy. And of course it builds upon um, the strategies that um, you know have been put in place over the last 15 years. So I just want to really give a lot of credit to uh, the U the rest of the biodefense team that's been at this for for many many years. Um, and so to your specific question or specific point in question, um, I think um, we will have to learn from this um, you know the current pandemic and take um, a very serious look at what the US government has done to prepare and, um, and learn from it, like we have for every other um, you know, incident, biological incident that we've had over the last you know, several um, decades. And then through that lens, I think we should look at the strategy and look at the governance structure and determine if that's the right thing to do. I think when we developed the strategy, it certainly felt like this was you know, the direction that we needed to take and that we should take. And I think, um, you know, it, but we should definitely review as to whether that is the, the way that we should continue to move forward. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, one other, I guess, related question is, I, we were, had the good fortune to talk to Senator Alexander earlier today, and I asked him about his concern and our 
mutual concern about the level of, of uh, dysfunction in Congress and the circumstances we're facing there. And he held up the phone and noted that it's with the social media and just the amazing access to information. And I would hasten to add misinformation that plagues us today, just the extraordinary degree of misinformation that circulates and is, is consumed and believed oftentimes. As you consider strategies around addressing these terrible challenges going forward, do you have any insights on how we might better address misinformation uh, to do a better job than we are right now? Yes, so I think misinformation, you know, is a, um, a persistent problem. It's something that we're going to continue to see just, you know, on a general level, not specific to public health information. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I think we should help um, educate people, and, you know, I do this with my own small children, is sourcing. Looking at, looking at sources and making sure that sources are, um, you know, sound. And I think that's at least one step that we can do. And perhaps that's something we should include in, you know, or, or consider at least in our strategy development moving forward. I'd be very interested in hearing my colleagues respond to this as well. well let, me, let me turn it over to the other two uh, guests as well and, and love to have your thoughts. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, to provide uh, my, my views. I, 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 I think that we're fighting a war on two fronts in this pandemic. The, the one is the virus and other countries have shown that they can uh, get to a point with this virus where they can open their cities and return to maybe not normal, but they can at least keep the economy going. We have not been able to do that in the US. And that gets to the second front in this battle, which is the anti-science and COVID denialism that is permeating our communities. I'm from Ohio, which is uh, maybe an extension of Western Pennsylvania. And there are a lot of rural communities there where uh, people are con absolutely convinced that COVID is not an issue and that masks are a waste of time. Um, these recommendations are not uh, that debatable. These are science-based recommendations that are out there and yet they're being framed as, uh, the, the, the different views on this are being framed as two equal sides to, to an issue, the way a policy matter might be discussed. And that is, uh, that is never something that we considered when we were doing our pandemic planning. We never thought that there would be a fundamental rejection of the core principles of science at the community level in responding to the pandemic. So I think I would say there are two things that I think would be very, they're not the only two, but two important things that could help address this. One is that you have to have federal and state level leadership that is standing up for evidence-based approaches to the problem that are, uh, that are speaking out, even if it's not popular or politically correct and saying that communities have to do certain things. We need a national ma mask mandate. I called for that in April publicly and we still don't have that. We, it, it's long overdue. Um, the second is that the social media companies do need to take a greater role in controlling how their platforms are used to spread disinformation. Uh, it is an abrogation of their responsibility to allow these echo chambers to proliferate and, for, and then create this deep-seated mistrust in science and institutions. Those are two things that I think need to change. That's a very thoughtful answer. Thank you very much. If I can add to what, yeah. Thank you. If I can add to what my colleagues have mentioned, so providing timely, accurate information is a bedrock principle of emergency management. And that's true when it comes to ensuring that we're providing good decision support products for decision makers all the way up you know, through the FEMA administrator to the secretary of DHS, all of our partners to the White House, but also for each individual and individual community. The ability to provide timely information to everyone is not only critical for public trust and necessary for us to do our job, but it's also absolutely necessary so that each individual household community can take the steps that they need to ensure that they are protected from whatever hazard they might have to address, whether that be COVID-19, a tornado, earthquake, hurricane, et cetera. And so at FEMA, we support all the work that we can to ensure that, that our message and the guidance that we need to get out is effectively communicated, whether that be new technology such as cell phones or using social media in, to ensure that message gets out. And if there are steps that we need to take to ensure that uh, disinformation uh, is minimized so that we can get uh, the right information to the right people at the right time that we support it. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. The Tom Daschle asked a question very close to what I was going to ask, but um, I mean, frame it in a slightly different way. Each of you has have been deeply involved in, in developing strategies and plans for bio uh, defense. Um, and yet here we are in this pandemic with a quarter of a million people dead, and that number could double before we get out of this. Um, and so we have to look at those plans uh, and the execution of those plans. I will be blunt enough to say that with anyone else in the White House as president, the results would have been dramatically different, I believe. I think that's un unarguably true. Uh, but nonetheless, if, if each of you could identify um, one way in which you think that um, our plans need to be updated because we didn't anticipate something that we've seen in this pandemic, one, one sort of new um, element to our strategy that we need to, to add, and one way in which um, uh, the best laid plans um, didn't work because of a failure to execute appropriately or efficiently. Um, if you could, if you could come up with an answer to one or both of those questions, I'd appreciate it. Well, maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, and Mr. Greenwood, I know, I know you're well aware of, of the, uh, uh, the role that, that um, technology, science and technology can play. Uh, here and I and I do think that we have an opportunity coming out of this pandemic. You know, when I was uh, in government, the primary pandemic threat was influenza. Now that has been joined by coronaviruses that have caused the SARS outbreak, the MERS outbreak, and now this pandemic. So we've been put on notice that coronaviruses are on par with flu as a threat. We now, for the first time in history, have the tools we need to potentially take coronaviruses and maybe even influenza viruses off the table. The fact that we went from virus to vaccine in less than a year is extraordinary. There's no reason why we can't put the, the vaccine candidates, the antivirals, the monoclonal antibodies, and the diagnostics in place to be prepared for the next coronavirus pandemic. We can even characterize the threat much better than we ever have been able to in the past, whether the coronavirus lives in bats or some other species. We know the range of potential viruses that we could, we could um, face, and we can develop common uh, vaccines, potentially, antivirals for sure, and monoclonals uh, that can be adapted in, in real time for those threats. So to me, if we can come out of this with a focused mission-driven strategy to take coronaviruses off the table, that would be a huge win. Excellent answer, thank you. Now, just, this is Hillary, I'll just follow up. Um, I think, uh, you know, to build on what was just said, the medical countermeasures are critically important. Um, and we've made tremendous advances of those um, as we're seeing right now, but to continue to build upon that um, and the full slate of medical countermeasures, not just the vaccines, but also the therapeutics and of course the diagnostics as well. And if I could throw in my two cents from an operational planning perspective. So part of our doctrine, something that we teach all of our beginning planners is that no plan survives first contact with the real world. And that was certainly the case with COVID-19. Some of the areas where we're looking to incorporate the lessons learned from COVID-19 uh, is the relationship between the lead federal agency, in this case HHS, with, uh, within a unified coordination group that might include FEMA operating in a Stafford Act context, which was not something we had previously anticipated uh, to have to do just based on the nature of this particular uh, incident. In addition to that, we're looking uh, through our after action review process uh, to look at some of the challenges related to acquisition and distribution uh, of supplies and that were necessary nationwide. And so we hope that the lessons learned from this particular incident will feed back into our updated plans when they're ready so that when the next biological threat emerges, that we're ready uh, to deal with that based on what we've learned you know, this past year. Thank you. Any, anything else, Jim? No, sir. All right, thank you very much. Ken? <clears throat> thanks, Governor. Um, and thanks to all of you for your insightful comments. Um, uh, Dr. Venkaya, I just want to uh, run a quick question by you that um, I guess sort of relates to some of the earlier questions about what you think would be the optimal structure for dealing with biodefense in the White House. And um, you go, you cite back to your experience back, I guess, to what, 2004 to 2007 and the, uh, the program and structure that was developed in the Bush administration. Of course, I look back to those days as the halcyon days and Everything was ideal back then. Um, 
I'll say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, it actually was a strong program, was a strong structure, and as you said, it atrophied afterwards. Um, and uh, when asked though about what you think would be the optimal structure, you mentioned having a senior um, person overseeing that program in the White House, in the NSC, and you mentioned maybe a deputy national security advisor for sort of health threats. And I, I'm sympathetic to that idea. Um, as Senator Lieberman said, when we developed our recommendation, number one of all of our recommendations was centralizing leadership for the biodefense program in the White House, having a biodefense coordination council in the White House and have the vice president lead it. And, um, you know, that was a product of a number of concerns. One that I think uh, Governor Ridge said that not, you know, having one cabinet officer own this issue and then being required to tell another cabinet officer what to do is, uh, is obviously is problematic. Um, but then also you don't want to bury it in the, you know, down in the lower ranks of the White House. You want something that is responsive to the highest levels of the White House, but at the same time, you can't have the president spending all day on the, the, the you know, the details of biodefense. So we thought the vice president would be a good option. And, um, and there's some precedents for it. Uh, vice President Cheney took on certain national security projects and Vice President Biden did, dealt with, I think it was, you know, um, sexual violence on campus and the like, and it was very effective. Um, just, you know, what, what do you think of that option? Uh, you've laid out your option about the uh, deputy national security advisor and I think that has a lot of merit, but what do you think about our, our proposal, which, you know, has some practical concerns uh, about you know, taking the vice president and installing him or her in that position. But what are your thoughts about it? Well, I think it's, it's well understood that right? the rationale for doing that is well understood, having the, having the vice president's office lead this. From my standpoint, I think of it in terms of uh, sustainability and also effectiveness in a crisis itself. And this, I, I take the same approach when I think about, about biodefense in general. If you are developing a separate system to prepare for deliberate threats than for naturally occurring threats, it's less likely to be effective than if you are using your day-to-day -day systems. And the same applies to policy and strategy, in my opinion. We have very, very important issues sitting in the national security, the most important issues actually, sitting in the National Security Council um, except for maybe some economic issues, although they, a lot of economic issues go to the NSC as well. So uh, if we really believe that, that health threats um, rise to the, the level of the, the nuclear threat, for example, which I think coming out of this pandemic, you could really reach no other conclusion that health threats are just as important as nuclear threats, then um, shouldn't we put them in the same place in a process, process that everybody knows and understands and with people that they work with on an ongoing basis? But whereas before we had this at a special assistant to the president level, I think having it at a deputy assistant to the president level as a deputy national security advisor would be, would bears a lot of consideration uh, just because this is one of the worst crises, if not the worst global crisis we faced uh, in a generation. So I, I think we've been put on notice and I think it would be appropriate to elevate it to, to that level. Um, but, but just to come back to the, 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 the difference that I see between the vice president's office and the NSC is that the NSC, this is their bread and butter. They do it every single day. And there are very well established, as you know, very well established ways of, of generating policy and strategy and responding to events that the NSC drives. And I think this would be a perfect fit for what they do in their day to day. Hey, good response. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Anything else, Ken? No, that's it. Thank you. I want to thank uh, the panelists uh, for your contribution, not just to uh, our discussion today, <clears throat> but your ongoing uh, participation in, in uh, public service throughout uh, multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, jurisdictions uh, and uh, multiple presidents. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, don't be surprised if uh, at some point in the future we don't uh, get back to either or all of you for either clarification or additional input as we go back and take a look at our recommendations, try to embed them as we try to prioritize them in response to uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. <clears throat> the one thought I'd like all of you to give, and maybe you could comment in writing down the road, but somebody has to take a look, and Senator Daschle mentioned this before, that a country like Japan with 125 million people had less than 2,000 deaths. Um, somebody's got to take a look at what they did right, compare it to what we have been doing 
And to date, it, that parent, it seems to me that what we've been doing to date, in spite of all the strategies, in spite of all the plans, in spite of all the papers, in spite of all the communication, in spite of all the coordination and blah, 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 we still have people dying at a rate that escalates every day. So even before we get out of this and worry about a COVID-20, we still have to figure out perhaps how we need to change things to deal with COVID-19. So if you could go back and reflect upon that notion based on your individual experiences, not for attribution, we're not about to say we told you so, and I don't personally think a 9-11 commission going back and saying who did what right and who did what wrong, we need to address this now. So if you had additional thoughts with regard to the kinds of things this commission could do to promote today to try to reach a to try to help this and the future administration deal with this problem and this ongoing challenge, we'd welcome it. On top of that, we thank you for continued and sustained public service. Thank you very, very much. Uh, let me welcome both of you and uh, introduce this panel. This is, um, we're focused here on hospital uh, preparedness to deal with a infectious uh, disease pandemic. And of course, this is very much on uh, our minds today, very much in the media, a lot of anxiety that this uh, uh, current wave of increased infectious uh, 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 numbers of infectious diseases and uh, death, serious illness, um, really uh, puts, puts the system under stress. And we'll talk about that as we go on. I do wanna say by way of introduction, that um, in our report, our baseline report in 2015, our commission uh, basically reached the conclusion that the public health systems in our country, like so much else uh, that would have to come into play rapidly in the case of an infectious disease pandemic, were just not up to it. Uh, and, uh, and we made a series of recommendations. They were numbered 19, 20, and 21 are to try to uh, get us better prepared for that. One was to minimize the redirection of hospital preparedness program funds, HPP funds. Uh, and we specifically recommended that Congress amend the Public uh, Health Service Act to require that no less than 97% of appropriated HPP funds go directly to the uh, grantees as opposed to uh, being used for management uh, and administration costs. Uh, recommendation 20 had to do with incentives for hospitals to prepare for biological events. And uh, that uh, included uh, working with uh, uh, CMS and private uh, sector payers to include such preparedness within uh, uh, covered expenses. And the final one, uh, recommendation 21, and we'll probably want to ask about these uh, after you give your testimony, was to establish a biodefense hospital system. In other words, uh, building on the fact that hospitals are already stratified according to their abilities to treat patients according to various specialties, we were recommending the same approach uh, to biodefense uh, on the basis of our belief that it would result in a better patient treatment in the case of a uh, crisis. And we, and we developed uh, recommendations for accreditation standards for each stratum and uh, for different steps that the sector of HHS could take. Anyway, we're now in the middle of the crisis. And uh, um, this is, as, as I said a few moments ago, a source of great anxiety. I think people have a, a fear, really, and it is a fear that, uh, that we're going to get to a point where our ICU uh, use in most hospitals in the country, or many, maybe all, are going to be packed with COVID-19 uh, patients in extremists or who need to be there, and then the ICUs won't be available for patient, other patients with other health uh, crises. So, um, I, I obviously I want to hear your testimony, but I'd like to hear what you think is the reality right now in, in the hospitals. So, we're, we're delighted to have uh, Jack Herman with us, and, and I'll ask you to go first. Currently serves as Acting Director of the Division of National Healthcare Preparedness Programs within the um, 
Asper at DHHS, and uh, you know the Asper himself, Dr. Cadillac, is the godfather of this commission. So uh, we, we mentioned his name with great reverence and respect. Anyway, give him our regards. Uh, Mr. Herman, we welcome your testimony now. Oh, Senator, thank you very much. And I want to thank the commission for inviting me. By way of backdrop, uh, as you mentioned in the opening, I am the acting director. I've been in place um, since August of 2019. Uh, while we conduct a, a search for a permanent uh, director of this program. I have to say, though, I took about a seven-month hiatus uh, in between uh, that time to either lead or co-lead uh, the COVID-19 Healthcare Resilience Working Group uh, for this response and uh, came back to NHPP in uh, July and since that time have been working on how to incorporate lessons learned and uh, position this program uh, for a transformation uh, to meet 21st century uh, threats. So I think this will be a good conversation. Uh, over the past uh, two decades nearly, and under Dr. Kedlick's leadership for the past four years, uh, Asper has been shifting toward a national regionalized approach uh, to strengthen the security of US healthcare in the face of catastrophic disasters. And while the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the critical interconnectedness and interdependencies of the nation's public health and healthcare systems, this pandemic has also drawn a clear line in the sand. Without transformative change, which could include the need for legislative changes, ASPR and this nation will continue to face significant challenges in strengthening the nation's preparedness for and response to disasters and other emergencies. A strategic and informed long-term vision is critical to protecting the nation's health in the aftermath of future pandemics and other catastrophic events. And furthermore, to realize this vision, it will be imperative to create sustainable funding mechanisms, including the development of financial and policy levers and incentives that complement federal funding that make increased private sector investment in readiness feasible. Since its creation in 2006, ASPR has undertaken an iterative evolution of its national healthcare readiness programs to advance a regionalized approach to preparedness and response. Uh, as an example, the Hospital Preparedness Program, or how we refer to it as HPP, initially focused on supporting the preparedness of individual healthcare facilities, but shifted to support the establishment of healthcare coalitions and emphasize their role as coordinators of their jurisdiction's public health and healthcare response entities. Additionally, in 2018, ASPR launched two regional disaster health response system demonstration pilots to support and advance a multi-state regional partnership model that would identify, tackle, and resolve healthcare preparedness challenges and gaps establish and promote best practices for disaster readiness across the healthcare delivery system, and expand access to specialty ca uh, clinical care and increased medical surge capacity during disasters and other emergencies. The Nebraska Regional Disaster Health Response Ecosystem and the Massachusetts Region 1 Partnership for Regional Disaster Health Response have been integral to their region's COVID-19 responses, deploying specialized teams and clinical experts to support medical surge, uh, refining uh, readiness metrics to measure progress, and leveraging and expanding innovative tools and platforms developed uh, the first year of the pilot. And just seven weeks ago, ASPR awarded a third RDHRS recipient, uh, Denver Health and Hospital Authorities, Colorado Regional Disaster Health Response System, in an effort to further expand this model. As well, and as part of a statutory requirement set by the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness and Advancing Innovation Act, ASPR must collaborate with other federal and state, tribal, territorial, and local health entities to identify and develop guidelines for regional approach to all hazards public health emergency preparedness and response. And as a result, ASPR has asked the RDHRS recipients, those three recipients I just mentioned, uh, to develop those regional guidelines, which will ultimately shape the design of a nationalized, regionalized approach, if you will, or model. 
And Asper envisions that that national regionalized model to include sites across every region of the country, ultimately creating a network of 12 RDHRS sites across all, all 10 HHS regions, ensuring uh, coverage across locations as well as access to the full continuum of spe uh, subspecialty clinical care needed for a successful all hazards national response system. And if I may, I I'd like to pivot now to Asper's role in supporting hospitals and the use of HPP resources during COVID-19. Most recently in the aftermath of COVID-19, Asper retooled the regional Ebola treatment network that was established in 2014, 2015 into a more multi-threat National Special Pathogen System, or what we're calling NSPS, through COVID-19 emergency, uh, emergency supplemental funding. This system builds on the infrastructure developed for the Ebola response to create a national system for infectious disease outbreak planning and response that is categorically tiered and capability-based and supporting recommendation 21 of the Commission's blueprint for biodefense. The NSPS also aims to create a hub and spoke model, one that enables healthcare systems, both public and private, to have access to specialty care and healthcare expertise, as well as standardized protocols and processes for the response to influenza pandemics and those resulting from other special pathogen. Uh, Asper excuse me, encourages healthcare partners and interested stakeholders, such as the Commission, to engage with the National Emerging Special Pathogens Treatment and Education Center, or NETEC, as it develops the strategy and implementation plan for the NSPS to ensure it lends itself to the other goals within Recommendation 21, including the development of accreditation standards and funding mechanisms uh, for each tier. Through the NSPS, ASPR has distributed funds to hospitals and other healthcare entities to support their urgent preparedness and response needs and help prepare them to identify, isolate, assess, transport, and treat patients with COVID-19 or other special pathogens or persons under investigation for such illnesses. And so for example, as one of the components of the NSPS and with COVID-19 supplemental funds, ASPR funded 53 hospital associations in all 50 states the District of Columbia, New York City, and Puerto Rico, which in turn distributed the funds to hospitals and other healthcare entities within their jurisdictions. Hospital associations are a newly targeted recipient for ASPR, and we believe this new funding mechanism and this new target audience will allow hospital associations to make rapid fund distribution decisions for healthcare entities, rather than through the traditional route of public health departments who are significantly burdened by their own current COVID-19 response activities. ASPR also provided COVID-19 supplemental funds to our 62 HPP cooperative agreement recipients and their state or jurisdiction special pathogen treatment centers, as well as to our NETEC partners and the 10 regional Ebola and other special pathogen treatment centers all as part of the NSPS, uh, uh, which was focused on COVID-19 planning and surge response activities. With regards uh, to the annual HPP cooperative agreement, ASPR has provided numerous flexibilities to state and jurisdiction recipients due the, to the significant workload related to COVID-19 response, including allowing COVID-19 response activities to meet certain annual cooperative agreement uh, responsibilities, extending several deadlines, uh, and waiving several requirements altogether. Uh, things we felt uh, didn't necessarily have uh, significant uh, adverse impacts, but would re relieve uh, a significant burden from our grant recipients so that they could focus on their COVID-19 uh, response. Looking at our future efforts to support uh, healthcare preparedness, and, and as part of my final comments here, ASPR is looking to the future. It will continue to consider the recommendations put forth in the Commission's blueprint on biodefense, including recommendation number 20 on preparedness incentives for the private sector. ASPR has been working to strengthen the engagement of healthcare executives in emergency preparedness, both through our healthcare readiness partner community 
and our work convening healthcare executive leaders. For example, in 2019, we conducted a workshop with healthcare executives at the C-suite level across the Pacific Northwest, it was convened by the Northwest Healthcare Response Network, and this meeting identified and validated possible policy, regulatory, and financial incentive uh, levers to drive healthcare readiness. Uh, a follow-up uh, to that meeting occurred in July of 2019 through the National Academies, which we conducted an expert panel meeting and workshop uh, called Enhancing Private Sector Preparedness for 21st Century Health Threats to discuss and refine those possible policy, regulatory, and financial incentive levers we can be looking to for the future. To achieve the implementation of these levers, it'll be vital to develop common terminology and standards for readiness that can be tiered to those levers. For example, performance measures tied to accreditation or payment mechanisms as an incentive for readiness. Currently, recipients of our NHPP funding, such as the RDHRS recipients and the NETEC recipients are required to develop readiness measures. In the future, ASPR will continue to engage private sector healthcare uh, leadership in, preparing, in preparedness and response activities in order to identify and mitigate uh, systemic gaps in readiness. Uh, for example, we'll continue to engage private sector, uh, 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 or, or let me back up, we'll, we'll engage private sector uh, in the development of a readiness research agenda uh, investigated by ASPR in partnership with healthcare partners and academic medical centers. And we hope to explore opportunities to create policy or financing levers to address system-wide barriers that hinder private sector readiness and better include healthcare innovations in the nation's strategy for readiness. And currently ASPR is working with Healthcare Ready to study and develop a report required by PAPA on the public health preparedness and response capabilities and medical surge capabilities of hospitals, long-term care facilities, and other healthcare facilities to address public health threats. And ASPR will use the findings from this report to promote a research agenda that will mitigate gaps in preparedness and in including uh, benchmarks and standards of federal care. Uh, federal programs and and as I end my remarks I'd, I'd like to maybe comment on uh, two personal observations. One is when I first um, uh, stepped into this acting role back in August of 2019, we had uh, a conversation uh, with some of our um, uh, colleagues here in HHS. And one of the questions that was posed to me was, uh, how much longer will we have to fund healthcare preparedness? And I thought it was a very poignant question because I'm not sure such a question uh, would be asked of the Department of Defense or any other uh, agency that provides a critical um, governmental role in securing the nation. And, and I wanna make the point that uh, healthcare preparedness uh, is vital to the nation's uh, healthcare security and that um, we may need to invest in this uh, forever, uh, but we will look for common partners and who share our common mission uh, in, in hopes that that, will, that investment will be rich in transforming uh, the nation's healthcare preparedness. And the last was in our meetings with healthcare C-suite executives over the past year before uh, COVID-19, there was a resounding consensus from that group that healthcare preparedness did not weigh in in their top priorities opposed to other uh, clinical service priorities that they had. And in fact, they felt that the government should be investing in, in preparedness. And when there was a problem, the government would come to their aid. Well, here we are today. And I suspect there's not one CEO in this country who would now say that healthcare preparedness is not a top priority. Um, uh, you know, in, in the scheme of, of things that they need to be concerned about in, in taking care of the nation's health. So I leave you with those two. I know those resonate with me every day and drive the work uh, that we do here. But thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Herman. That was uh, excellent testimony and uh, two great stories to end with. 
as always, people remember stories more than anything else, and those are relevant. So now we have Dr. Erica Shinoy. We're grateful to you, doctor, for being with us in a way you, uh, Mr. Herman has brought the view from uh, Washington. You now will bring, uh, have the, have the uh, experience to bring the view uh, from um, the hospital level. Uh, Dr. Shinoy is the medical director of the Regional Emerg Emerging Pathogens Special Pathogens Treatment Center uh, at uh, Massachusetts General uh, Hospital in Boston and an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, we're very grateful you're here and welcome uh, your testimony at this time. Thank you, Senator Lieberman, and thank you for the invitation. And Mr. Herman set, set my presentation up perfectly because he referred to many of the funding sources that have supported the ability of Mass General and other hospitals to respond to this current pandemic, but to prior uh, threats, um, bio threats. So um, as mentioned, um, I'm here at Mass General Hospital. I'm an infectious disease specialist. I take care of patients in the hospital and the outpatient setting. And Mass General, for those who are not aware, is, is a large academic health center in Boston. We have over a thousand beds. Um, and we um, have a lot of resources at our disposal, um, disposal. During the COVID surge in New England, and since then we've taken care of more COVID patients than any hospital in New England. We've also evaluated the, the largest number of patients who come to our uh, door with possible other special pathogens. They're called persons under investigation, and Mr. Herman referenced them. And um, as I mentioned, we took care of the largest number of COVID patients um, in the area. We tripled our ICU capacity, and Senator Lieberman, you referred to the issue of our filling up our ICUs. Well, we more than filled our ICUs. We created ICUs where there were never ICUs. Um, and we had uh, more patients on ventilators than we've ever had in our facility. We had to borrow vents and share vents across, um, across our region. And um, certainly with increasing prevalence in our community, we have seen, and we've started to see this, see this uh, in the last several weeks, an increase in our inpatient COVID-19 census. Um, we have uh, never gone down to zero. There has always been, um, since the spring, uh, patients with COVID-19 in our hospitals, in general care, and in our ICUs. Um, but uh, in the fir for the first time in several months, we had to reactivate our incident command and our response uh, in the hospital. Um, in, the, in the spring, we were active for six months in terms of the incident command structure. We then continued to plan throughout all of the summer and because of the capacity challenges um, that we're facing, uh, we've reactivated. So here on, you'll see on the slide, just to go back one slide, um, these are the, the, the number of cases and you can see in the surge we had, we maxed out at 2000 cases um, uh, there uh, in, in a single day across Massachusetts. But again, the testing has changed quite a bit and now here we are uh, surpassing that in terms of the daily number of cases in our state. You can also see that the deaths are increasing and the number, uh, a proportion of hospitalized patients is increasing as well. If you go to the next slide, this is uh, fresh data from our census. I look at this actually multiple times a day, I would say. Um, the, the, the orange line there is our ICU COVID census and our gray line is the general care census. One thing to note about COVID patients, they tend to stay longer than other patients. Uh, they just require, um, uh, when they get sick, they get sick, but they also have to recover. And if you fast forward over to the right of your screen, our projections um, have noted this increasing um, uh, uh, incidence of, of patients needing hospitalizations. And we're now, um, in the last couple of days, we think the slope is actually going to head up uh, perhaps similar to the way it was in March. And so um, many things are ongoing at our facility and in our network to shift some of our phases. Uh, we're, considering, uh, we're considering deferment of elective procedures in order to create capacity within our institution. So that's what's happening on the ground here. We can take the slides off and I'm just gonna speak from some uh, prepared remarks that I have. Um, so as mentioned that we were, you know, we're in a large academic health center. We have had uh, the benefit of HPP funding um, for, for years now. And initially the HPP funding was established to buy the stuff that healthcare facilities um, need in order to prepare for uh, emergencies. And so that stuff might include uh, personal protective equipment specifically, for example, our hazmat or hazardous materials program used HPP funding to purchase PPE and other equipment and then to train um, in that um, and train our staff. 
Um, Mr. Herman mentioned the healthcare uh, uh, coordinating coalitions, and MGH has participated in that across our region. And that, in the latter part of the HPP funding from 2012 to 2015, allowed us to work collectively across Boston. And during that time, um, this group will remember the Boston Marathon bombing, and it is really a testament to the HCCs that um, our response was incredibly coordinated on that day. Um, uh, there were three individuals who perished at, at the scene, but all 275 patients who left the scene, um, many with critical injuries and were dispersed across hospitals all across Boston, survived. Um, and I think that is a true testament to how well uh, coordination can work when it's prepared for in advance. And I like with um, this last story you talked about, um, uh, Mr. Herman, which is this concept of preparedness and preparedness doesn't happen in a day. It takes a long time to get to the point where you can truly respond uh, to any sort of disaster. Um, uh, Mr. Herman also mentioned the regional emerging special pathogens treatment centers and that, you know, in 2015 when the West African Ebola outbreak sort of came to our shores, MGH had been preparing for many years, even beyond the HPP funding, we had a robust bio threats preparedness program. And partly that's due, because, due to the fact that we have a large uh, uh, set of expertise here. We are really fortunate. We have infectious diseases, infection prevention, critical care, pediatrics, obstetrics, laboratory medicine. And because we have all those resources and were funded through the uh, RESPTC, um, we were able to build on that and create a regional center of excellence. Um, and the Regional Center of Excellence is not just a physical place. So certainly with the funding that we received over those five, uh, five years, we were able to make modifications to our facility structure to enable us to care for up to two patients with Ebola or another viral hemorrhagic fever. We were able to purchase specific sorts of personal protective equipment. We were able to make our laboratory even more robust and we were able to train. And that piece of it is not the stuff of preparedness, it's the people of preparedness and creating a very wide bench of individuals who have extensive training, not just in clinical um, care, but in the operations and capacity management, which on the front line, um, I would say uh, clinical care is incredibly important, but managing and operationalizing that is just as important. You can have the best clinicians in the world, but if you don't have the support structure to manage the capacity, like we're trying to do today, and we've been doing uh, for a while up here, uh, you, can, you will not succeed uh, in a way that positions you to be not only a resource for your patients, but a resource to your region. And I think one of the advantages of the HPP and the RESPTC funding and the RDHRS, which I'll, I'll mention in our, our uh, uh, coordination with that, with that group, and my role there in terms of infectious disease advising, um, is really about uh, leveraging the resources of a single or more one facility to enable capacity and to enable expertise across a region. So for example, um, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, before it was even considered a pandemic, I'm sure those on the, here will remember there was a big debate, is this a pandemic? Um, but certainly in January, we responded and activated our incident command in the third week of January. Later uh, that, that, in that week, in the weeks to come, we put out a planning playbook um, that included a wealth of material. Um, it included information on donning and doffing personal protective equipment, specimen collection, checklists, videos, all these other materials that we were able to stand up incredibly quickly and then share broadly. And in fact, this was shared across all of New England. Eventually it was globally shared and translated into multiple languages. And I think the fact that we were able to turn quickly um, and to, to resource others um, really is a testament to the kind of investment in frontline um, facilities and the individuals who are on the ground and have a very good sense of what people need on the ground in the moment. That also extends beyond um, infectious diseases, which are, of course, my, my uh, strong interest. Um, through the regional um, uh, uh, disaster uh, health response uh, system, so the RDHRS. So in uh, the region one, where we've been uh, very pleased to have uh, the support of ASPR for, we are using uh, disaster medical and healthcare technical advisors to enhance the plans for our region. And it's not just uh, infectious diseases, as I, as I mentioned, traumatic injuries, burns, chemical and radiation injuries, pediatric disaster management, 
many of these skills are really uh, focused in particular centers of excellence, but those skills can be deployed both prior to an emergency in terms of building plans across a region, but also in an emergency to be able to deploy general and specialty disaster medical response teams where they are needed, locally, state, regional. I think that's one of the uh, uh, related to the third recommendation that um, had been discussed, which is really about hospital systems and preparedness um, and making our regions uh, able to have a more robust response when challenged with anything. All of that said, which describes our experience prior, prior to COVID and through COVID, and we were very well positioned, I would say probably um, more than uh, most facilities. I think we really recognize that um, this is beyond the scope of most hospitals um, in our country. Um, the thousands of hospitals that are out there, they have neither the expertise nor the bandwidth or the resources to mount this sort of response or be this sort of resource for a region. That said, um, we are able to, with the uh, support that we've received both institutionally, because MGH has a very long history of supporting preparedness, um, and with the ASPR um, supporting us through the mechanisms described, to be a resource for our region and beyond, um, and to leverage those resources for the benefit of others. I was asked to also talk about the challenges we faced, and the challenges have been enormous. Again, putting this in the context of a very well-resourced facility within a well-resourced region um, and a healthcare system, we still, uh, I would say, were faced with innumerable challenges because of the scale and the pace of this pandemic. You saw the curve that I showed. It was incredibly steep, and then we were on that curve for a very long time, and the descent took a long time as well. Um, and uh, that was incredibly uh, resource intensive here. I mentioned creating ICUs where there weren't ICUs. We also turned pediatric wards into adult wards, pediatric ICUs into adult ICUs. We redeployed thousands of staff. So we have, a, we have about 27,000 employees. Thousands of our staff were deployed uh, into roles that they uh, had sometimes never done or had done a long time ago, perhaps during their internship, and now we're being repurposed to do other work. Um, we also uh, faced huge challenges with not just personal protective equipment, and that's one of the points I want to leave with here, but many other things that go into uh, delivering care. Cleaning supplies, hand sanitizer, and shortages of particular medications, IV tubing, you name it, the disruption in the supply chain um, was profound, and I would say it continues to be quite unstable. Um, the, the federal response there, I think in terms of coordinated and direct uh, increasing in PPE manufacturing and the other sorts of stuff that is required in healthcare facilities, I think could have positioned us better and would have been a huge resource to the frontline clinicians. Secondly, testing capabilities. Uh, it's much has been written on uh, where, how we got to where we are with testing. We are certainly uh, miles away from the way we were in March. But I remember um, March 4th, uh, we had had uh, in, the, in the weeks prior, we'd had several individuals come, come to our facility. We had done a couple rule outs. We had five individuals show up in our emergency room. They told us they had all been to a conference, a Biogen conference. Now you know what, now we know what happened at the conference, but at the time they showed up in our emergency room and they were interested in getting tested for COVID. We were able to test three of them because at the time we were not able to test asymptomatic individuals. Everything had to be approved through the state. Two days later, I got a call in the morning. All three were positive. I had to call those three patients. They were our first three COVID patients um, and tell them the news. And my next call was to public health to get the company on the phone to figure out who else we could help them with in terms of getting tested. They had 180 people at that conference and between us and one other health uh, hospital in Boston, we split the list and stood up a testing facility. In the next three days, we started testing people from that conference. Now that conference became a super spreader event. We've all read about it, but testing was incredibly limited at the time and continues, if you even think about it today, in our facility right now, we have five testing platforms. The reason we have five is the supply chain is disrupted on every single one of them. So today we may have no reagents in one. The next day we may be missing pipettes that help us do the other. And so we have to, across our system, have multiple different strategies for testing. 
and we're 10 months, 11 months into this. And um, that ability to test, no, so testing isn't all of it, but testing is incredibly important to be able to make decisions, place patients correctly, isolate patients, do contact tracing. So testing has been another real challenge. I would say that um, I have two more challenges and then I'll, I'll close and obviously uh, ask questions. Um, data. So the federal government throughout all of this has had multiple requests for data from our facilities. And we are, again, I mentioned incredibly resourced. So I think sometimes of our challenges and then I think of what a community hospital would have to, uh, would be faced with when they were dealing with these sorts of requests. And the requests were changing over time. And of course, data is incredibly important. We want to share our data with the federal government to be able to have visibility on how the country is doing. But the requests were changing over time. They're incredibly labor intensive and they still are. We have a team of data folks um, but even for them and with the high level that we're working at, this is incredibly challenging for us to meet the needs. And I think we probably could have used those resources, those people in different ways had the request been more streamlined. So I think uh, the supply chain, incredibly disruptive uh, to us. Testing is linked with the supply chain, but also just has been a, a, a challenge. Um, and lastly, the, you know, the data, the interest in the data. And I think that plays into the hospital systems part of this, which is I think the federal government needs to have visibility on our capacity. And I don't know that at this moment that is known. Um, we ourselves track our capacity each day. We forecast capacity. Um, we look at level loading across a system, um, trying to keep people out of the hospital as much as possible, trying to post hospital care in the home versus facilities because it's an input output uh, uh, situation in our hospitals. And so that um, is challenging even at a hospital level and a system level and for the, for the federal government to have visibility on what is our capacity today, I think would be very useful for strategic planning and for understanding the pressures that are on facilities at the front line where an extra bed is actually incredibly important. That one extra bed is uh, someone out of our emergency room, it's someone coming out of the OR and having a place to go versus deferring admissions and keeping people who need routine care out of our hospitals. And that's a, a huge lesson learned from the surge um, because of orders through the government and, and other reasons, we shut down um, most of our routine care and that had serious consequences. There have been papers written on the serious consequences and we are trying our best right now to not shut down routine care. But when we operate at 100% capacity for most of the time of the year, we absolutely do. We're in what we call code help almost every single morning where we are frantically trying to move people around anything that tips us over the edge, um, which is extra COVID admissions. Um, it, it can certainly um, put an incredible strain on us. And I'll stop there. And I really appreciate you hearing from the frontline hospitals at, and, uh, and our experience. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shunai. We really appreciate hearing from you. That was um, that was very important testimony. I, and also, I appreciate the fact that you acknowledge what we know, which is Mass General is a great hospital with um, unusual capacity and uh, resources. Um, so it's not typical, but it's a very important part of the system. Um, uh, do you worry about whether the, your hospital will be able to meet the uh, demand for beds uh, as this, uh, as you look at the projections uh, for COVID-19 in the next uh, two or three months? So yes, we have been planning over the last uh, many months for a 50%, 100% of surge and 150% sort of strategy. We have a right. phased in approach where we would, like I say, turn, create new ICUs, double bed rooms that are meant for single beds. So we have a plan in place, but it is going to take a lot of resources to make it happen. And the other piece of this is the redeployment of the labor pool. Um, it, is, it is very challenging right now to staff. Um, I know from nursing colleagues, this, uh, you may have heard from others that uh, right. nursing shortages are, are paramount right now. And I think we have over 400 physicians across our enterprise that are unfilled. So huh. staffing the beds, it's not just a bed, it's the people who support that patient. And in COVID, with COVID patients, especially obviously the acute care ones, they require a lot of people. 
a lot of at the bedside. It's not a physician, a nurse, it's respiratory therapy, it's physical therapy. Are, um, are, what kind of help are you getting? And you mentioned some of this, but are you getting now from the federal government to meet the extra demand brought on uh, by the pandemic? And uh, I guess second part of that is uh, as we as we expect the surge now and putting you under more pressure, um, what additional uh, support do you want or hope for from uh, the federal government? Well, I think I mentioned some of the areas where we could have done better and certainly can uh, can do better. I think um, you know the the surge may not be as steep as it was before. We are in some ways in a better position, I would say, in terms of our yeah. knowledge of the disease. And because at, we have our infection control protocols are stable and established, we have more testing than we did before. I think the, the support from the federal government will be in those bigger, those bigger pieces of this, which is the supply chain, um, the uh, expanded uh, access and availability of testing. Um, Mr. Herman may wanna comment on additional support flows that may come to, to our facilities. Um, but uh, I think in some ways we are, we've obviously learned a tremendous about a lot. I have no doubt that we will succeed in caring for the patients we need to care for. Even during the surge, sure. our ICU mortality was um, really uh, comparable to some of the best outcomes that are out there. But I do think that one piece of this that we are really trying to avoid is the shutdown of the other sorts of care. Because I yeah. think that weighed on us quite a bit in terms of a, from a clinical perspective, we would not want to defer the care that's really needed. And so we're doing our utmost to not have that happen. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Mr. Herman, let me ask you that. What uh, uh, can the uh, HHS do now to assist hospitals like Mass General and then facing this surge in demand, but also obviously um, um, more local uh, rural hospitals that uh, are, are not as equipped uh, as Mass General is. Uh, so what, what, what can the federal government do? And is, is this something that should be in the next COVID-19 response bill of the federal government, uh, which we hope will come sooner than later? Mr. Herman. Yes, yeah, Senator, th this is a very important uh, question and issue. So the first thing is, is, is access to data. And we know, that Dr. Shinoy and her peers are under tremendous pressure uh, and burden to submit data to the federal government in order for us to have some situational awareness on the impact of COVID-19 across the entire country and the healthcare system. And that has been an ongoing challenge, but I have to say that you know, a nationalized system for uh, surveillance, data surveillance has been something we've been talking about for decades, right? And, and now we find in the context of COVID-19, that the lack of access to data does put some challenges on us. And so while this has been tremendously burdensome, it has had its positives in, in us being able to peek into hospitals and see where these challenges are to understand how the federal government may be able to support this. So access to data is important. We've been monitoring and, and watching this data and trying to project what this, uh, this spread is going to look like over the coming uh, weeks and months. And we are concerned. And, and what we're hearing from Dr. Shinoy and her peers is that, look, we can build out hospital space and we can figure out where to put patients in beds, but we can't make people. Staff shortages are extreme and, and right now and, and will get uh, more challenging as this goes on. And we are looking at, at uh, mechanisms within the federal government to support uh, states and, and, and locals with their staffing need support. But again, realistically, uh, the federal government only has a finite uh, uh, availability of staff as well. And, and so, uh, you know, we were also uh, talking with uh, companies, national companies, staffing, healthcare worker staffing companies, and they're saying the same thing. In the early phases of the response, they could uh, transport healthcare workers from one side of the country to another. That is not the case any longer. That because this is a widespread uh, pandemic and the impacts are significant in all jurisdictions 
across the country. The availability of extra people is, is just not there. And it calls for redeploying staff from other areas, refining scopes of work so that you're limiting your specialty care physicians and healthcare workers to, to reserving them for those kinds of duties while other healthcare workers potentially can pick up on other uh, components of, of the healthcare delivery system. But, uh, but staff shortages is an area. The other, frankly, uh, that we are uh, looking at now is many uh, healthcare systems have been reluctant to this point to go into crisis standards of care. And this is an issue we know we have to look at more that we, we're hearing from the healthcare. What does it mean, uh, Mr. Cro define crisis standards of care? So this is looking at the standards of care that you provide in day-to-day -day healthcare delivery may have to be modified or changed to address limitation of resources. For example, staffing shortages, a shortage of particular clinical specialty areas, staffing, uh, shortages of PPE and other supplies that we need to modify. This is not necessarily a lesser standard of care. This is a modification of care to address the limitations of resources. As a consequence, people are fearful of that. What does that mean about my, the standard of care for my aging parent or my child? And we understand this, and that's why there are challenges in healthcare systems across the country implementing standards of care because of some of these public perception issues, liability and, and risk uh, issues. But we are at a place where we need to consider this and we're going to be convening uh, professional associations. Very, I'm going on a call this afternoon to talk with them about what can we do? What did we learn from New York City and other jurisdictions who experienced a, uh, this uh, significant surge uh, earlier in the spring, and now uh, we're faced with those surges. What can we learn uh, in regards to where crisis standards of care guidance can best inform health care uh, that we're going to need uh, in, the, um, in the ensuing weeks uh, and months? And so those are the things the federal government is doing. We are working side by side, to, and, and as we said, we know staff shortages, PPE shortages, crisis standards of care guidance um, are all key issues right now and will be in the coming weeks. Okay, uh, thanks for that. It's an alarming picture, and uh, but it's real, and I appreciate uh, the uh, directness of your answer. I must say that I have not been focused on the staff shortage problem, but it really can become a crisis for obvious reasons, and to go back uh, to something uh, Senator Daschle said at the opening of the hearing, this really cries out for uh, uh, the, the parties to get together in Congress with the administration and adopt another COVID-19 response bill to facilitate in whatever way uh, they can uh, what, what uh, people will be demanding of their hospitals and uh, uh, naturally of you. Governor Ridge, I yield to you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I want to thank you both for your testimony. Dr. Shinoy, I would say that I am hopeful that all major and even smaller community hospitals have such a extraordinary professional guiding them through this crisis. Your presentation was as substantive, broad, and as, as powerful as anything we've heard. So I want to thank you. Uh, for representing uh, your uh, your cohorts around the country so beautifully. Uh, Mr. Herman, I want to thank you, and I have a couple of questions for both of you quickly. As you prepare these, uh, you tell me now that you've got these three regional uh, disaster health uh, systems. Uh, I'm interested in how they are designed to take advantage of lessons learned and capacities in your major urban hospitals and stretch them out to deal with a scaled down but equally uh, critical situation in suburban or rural hospitals. It sounded to me it's something similar to a mutual aid arrangement. The trouble is when everybody's under seed, there's no mutual aid to give. But am I correct in, in identifying the uh, purpose of those uh, systems? 
You have, and, and let me first ask if Dr. Shinori, since uh, Mass General is a regional disaster health response system, you have some real-time experience uh, with them. Yeah, so I can just give uh, some of that frontline experience. So part of it is the planning before. So we have established groups that are focused on burn, on uh, traumatic injury, so specialty groups that can then develop a set of core principles of immediate responses that any facility could take on the ground. But then when is it appropriate to engage to bring patients to another location, such as a, a center of expertise? and to really guide them on the triggers that would allow them to stabilize a patient, react, and then reach out to us. Secondly, very practically, um, it, our uh, team had developed a certain level of checklists that we would take and say, if we need to take and deploy a group to a local area in our region, what are the, skill, what are the people that we need and what are their very specific skill sets? Line item, they need to know about waste management. They need to know about these sorts of things and then pre-identify who that group would be so that we could call on them and deploy them to the location or if, or if relevant, provide remote assistance until the situation is stabilized and if needed, bring people to centers of excellence within the region. And then Mr. Herman. Yeah, and I think that that is right. I mean, the model itself is built on being able to distribute out and receive uh, information in. And so with the regional disaster health response systems, and let me just clarify, uh, Denver just came on at the end of September, so they're not right. in running. But, but Nebraska and, and MGH are very far along, and, and in fact, most of their year two work, which is what they just completed, uh, obviously was affected by COVID. And, and uh, let me give you one other uh, example that was critical, and that was early on, uh, they were assisting us in establishing guidelines for medical uh, operation coordination centers, the ability to distribute patient load across the geographical area so that uh, there wasn't just one facility that was taking all uh, patients that, and this was especially useful for rural areas that have very limited resources, as you, as you know, and, and as you indicated. And so there, here was an, an opportunity to have a very experienced group provide Good. direction, guidance on, on where patients uh, are directed for the most appropriate care. Yeah, I've got a lot more questions, uh, Senator. I've got but we have other panelists and maybe ex officios want to ask, but I want to get back to Dr. Chinoy. In the chart you provided, there was a gap there of five months where the scale and the pace, I mean, was diminished substantially. And then all of a sudden you got a spike. From what you know, what you've observed, what you've learned, can you tell me why we had that hiatus where there was diminution of infection and to what do you attribute the spike? I realize some of it might conjecture, some of it might be based on experience. I'm very interested in all. And by the way, I just have to comment, it's an editorial. I think it would have been very helpful you're talking about a standard of care if the people in the administration who gave advice to other people about mask wearing and washing their hands would have followed their own device, but that's own advice. But that's just Tom Ridge's opinion. Dr. Here, Schiff, here. If, 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 you, if you could give me your, your perspective on that. Yeah, so I want right. So to say that even though it looked like a diminution at the hospital level, we were in full gear. We were also trying to bring in all the people who had deferred care throughout the summer and bring them back. So there was a lot of work going on while the level of community prevalence was, was definitely lower. I think a couple of things have happened. It was the summer. People were outdoors. School was not in session. Um, the colleges were not in session. Um, the weather has gotten colder. I think there's also fatigue. And there's no way about, uh, there's no two buts about that. People are very tired. Um, they want to see people. They want to socialize. I think there also is the impression that, um, and with the increased accessibility of testing, which is great, that if I test negative, I'm not, there's no way that I'm possibly infectious in the next period. And I think, you know, it is, it, it's really challenging as we get into the winter months where we go into a season where people normally congregate and they congregate together. This will be a very, I think, a, a rocky road from the hospital perspective. And I think that, um, you know, there is, there's a light here. There's light in that the vaccine uh, data appears very promising, but I think the next three months or so will be, will be incredibly challenging. I, I don't have a doubt that we will 
we'll get through it. We've gotten through it before. There's been a tremendous amount of innovation. We didn't get to that, but there has been a tremendous amount of innovation during this time that has made our care better in many ways. Um, and so I don't wanna leave with an incredibly pessimistic note because we will get through it. But um, there is certainly a, a tough road ahead in the next uh, several months. Thank you, Doctor. And Jack, I just want to comment, thank you and your friends at Asper for the work they've done and continue to do. And I'm sort of a broken record on this one subject, but among our, our recommendations was this idea of stratifying the hospitals, particularly in urban areas, and then forward deploying PPE and other equipment that would be necessary for a, 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 an event like this, or at least what we anticipate, as far as we could anticipate it. Um, and, and, and that really didn't happen. Um, the idea was also that CMS would reimburse hospitals for overstocking PPE, ventilators, and that kind of equipment so that we would be ready for this and so that they could afford to do it financially. Um, so the question for each of you is, um, wh why did that not happen? And was it, was it something that the hospitals considered on their own because they may or may not have been aware of our recommendations? Or was it the fact that CMS wasn't going to reimburse them and they just couldn't financially afford to forward deploy all of that equipment? So I can speak to our cash. So we, again, incredibly well-resourced uh, institution, part of a large network. And I always think of that when I think of other hospital systems and smaller hospitals that just didn't have the resources. But we had a cash that we thought was enough and we ran out of it. We ran out of it even though we were conserving in ways that we had never, and you talk about crisis standards of care in terms of conserving personal protective equipment, but within you know weeks, um, we were uh, a couple of weeks of, of cash, we were out. Um, and so uh, there were promises and the potential of a provision by a local government of caches of PPE. The other part to remember is that not all of it is incredibly um, substitutable. So substitutable, like in some things it's very easy, like gloves, it doesn't matter, but N95s, for example, they have to be fit tested on every individual. So if you use a different N95, it's not a perfect substitute and then often you'll find that it doesn't work. So there are those sorts of issues that made uh, the PPE um, uh, constraints uh, pretty severe. Um, I'll turn to, to Mr. Herman and see if he has anything to say on that. But I think from our perspective, we ran out of things incredibly quickly and it was a day-to-day, hour-to-hour sort of thing in terms of trying to get supply. And I mean, everyone working on supply. And before we turn to Jack, um, so if I hear you correctly, it wasn't a resource, financial resources limitation. It was just simply that you couldn't have anticipated the need would be so great. Is that fair to say? I think that's true. And I think also, you know, if you have a cash, you have to rotate things in and out of it, things expire. And that does take resources. I, I, I don't think we anticipated that the supply chain would be as disrupted for so long. You know, we have excellent supply chain folks and they have done tremendous work. But I think the part of this that was incredibly challenging was how disruptive it was for such a long period of time and continues to be. And it's possible that perhaps one could never uh, prepare for such an event, although one could have prepared better, I would thank say, and have contingency plans in place. Thank you very much, Mr. Herman. Thank you. So, Mr. Greenwood, it's just an excellent question, and and you know I think Dr. Chenoy captured it, it it well. And and let me first say the cat with the caveat: the strategic national stockpile is not within my uh, portfolio and, and uh, domain. But I will share with you what I've heard from our state and local partners uh, around this issue, and, and that is. Um, the hospital preparedness funding, as you know, has precipitously declined over the years, and it's about half as much as it was when it uh, was first issued. And you know, the uh, state and local uh, partners receiving these funds, um, given the priorities for preparing and responding to disasters and other events within their communities, have to make hard choices about what they're going to spend those limited funds are. And, and they've been telling us for many years, you know, look, we've got it. We have to make hard decisions. And when it comes to it, we're not necessarily going to buy stuff. Uh, you know, we did that after 9-11 and a lot of that stuff, uh, you know, ended up having to be uh, pushed to the side because it expired or we couldn't maintain it. And, it, and it, there's a cost to, to having stuff. And so we're going to err on having the other infrastructure and systems in place to be able to address disasters and hope that the stuff will come. 
when it is needed. But as Dr. Shinoy said, even that has its limitations on, on uh, how much stuff we have, where it is produced, how quickly we can get it in a, in a time of need. So, but I believe that we have an open window here. We now have a very real life example of a pandemic and its implications on the healthcare system. In the past, we were relying on theoretical models based on something that was 100 years old, right? And, and people couldn't see a contemporary, look at a pandemic through a contemporary lens. And now we do. You know, we have made um, I think, uh, you know, personally, significant strides with, with CMS. Uh, you know, we have been working with them hand in hand to determine flexibilities that can help uh, address the burdens at local, uh, local and state levels and help them uh, do their jobs easier. Do there need to be more? Sure. Uh, but I think we, you know, having been in this business for a while, I think we have made some inroads um, that we didn't have before, and it's unfortunately only because we're experiencing pandemic. People, for the most part, human behavior, you don't learn until you're confronted with it. Just a quick follow-up. Is that an area for innovation to be able to figure out how to uh, lengthen the lifespan of the stuff? So I think there, again, personally speaking, not being part of the SNS, I think there are great opportunities here to look at technology and innovation at, at, at all aspects of research and development uh, and procurement of, uh, of our supplies and, and across the entire supply chain. Absolutely. Thank you. So um, to all of you, thank you very much for your comments. It's been fascinating. I, I want to um, actually follow on from what you said, Mr. Herman, about um, you know, looking at this as a glass half full kind of way um, that we now have a we have a pandemic, we have the lessons learned, and we have the material to actually develop best practices. And um, just listening to what you said, Dr. Shinoy, about how you know, Mass General responded, it's incredible, it's admirable, and um, it's uh, really eye-opening for those of us who don't understand hospital you know, administration and operation, uh, at least in any detail. Uh, but as Senator Lieberman said, you know, Mass General is Mass General as opposed to lots of other hospitals. So the, the question would be, how would you best sort of capture the best practices and disseminate them and make sure that all hospitals of varying degrees of expertise and resource level sort of are able to deal with the next pandemic, whether it's you know at the level of COVID or the level of what Ebola was or H1N1 was? What, what, what do you, Suggest and I know there are hospital associations and the like that are probably doing this, but how would you, if you were in charge of the best practice development operation, how would you do that? Yeah, so we've been doing it on our own um, and with in collaboration with other uh, groups and professional societies. We happen to have individuals who are working in those professional societies that are developing guidelines and best practices. I think one of the things that we bring to this is the practical frontline uh, expertise. And so turning a guideline into a policy and actually implementing it are very different things. And I think one of the main challenges that any institution has is CDC provides guidance, this group provides guidance. How am I going to turn that into an actual policy and train the frontline uh, uh, clinicians on how to do that? And in this case, it was done over an incredibly rapid period of time. You normally in a hospital, you'll develop policies over months, and it's a terrible long process. Here we were doing policies day to day based on changing guidance. And I think we are very, we've gotten very good at that and good at turning something that is a written document, best practices into real life. This is how you implement it. These are some of the challenges that you'll face. And we can disseminate that through the RDHRS, through our work as a regional center, through work through APP. There are, there are many venues to do it. I would say the other piece of this relates to what Mr. Herman said, which is, you know, we had we have been funded as a regional center for five years, and then we went back uh, to Congress uh, last year. We were put into the bill, but each year we're going to have to go and prove that our worth is that we are worth uh, the next round of funding. It's not like a sustainable plan that the government has to keep regional groups like ourselves available to help our, our community hospitals. And the community hospital, I, I've been getting emailed by a few today. I'll call them up and I'll provide expertise 
I'll advise them, I share our protocols. We do that sort of thing, which I think allows to, the investment that's made in the regional centers to be leveraged and multiplied and be an amplifier for best practices that are targeted to the frontline clinician. May I, may I also address that issue of best practice uh, as well? Because I think we, there is an inherent failure when we talk about best practices that somehow the development of a tool or resource and then just making it available to people is going to be the panacea needed to solve the problem. It isn't. There are tens of thousands of tools and toolkits and guidance documents that exist today. And, and I'll give you a, a, just a, a short story. Last week, we were on the phone with a state and addressing some of their issues around staff shortages and PPE shortages. And so, you know, we immediately go to what we immediately go to it. You know, we have some resources and tools that we think are going to be useful to you. And, and, and they turned and said to us and said, that's great, but if you can put, you know, what we need is somebody from your staff to come in and sit in our health department and read all of those tools and review all of those toolkits and figure out how to incorporate them into our response and our plans. We, you know, when you just send me these tools and resources, I have to take staff resources to review them. That's if I have the people who understand how to read these, analyze these, and figure out how to incorporate them. And we spend a lot of our time and money developing these things without understanding the other part of that is, and that's the implementation, the analysis, the extraction, the implementation, and the guidance to change plans, to change policies, to change protocols. Okay, thanks, all very good points. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, the two of you have been really excellent and uh, very responsive to our questions. I can't thank you enough for what you're both doing. Honestly, through you, Dr. Shinoida, thank you and your colleagues at Mass General and throughout the hospital system for what the, the extra measure, uh, really, of devotion, let alone care that you've given. So uh, we appreciate it a lot. You've helped us and the uh, uh, danger for the two of you is you've been so uh, helpful that we'll come back to you with more questions. Thank you very much. We appreciate uh, it. Not at all. And uh, it's not our last panel of the day is on supply chain. Oh. <laughs> so you've set us set us up for it. Uh, thanks. Thank you. All, Fasten all your seatbelts on that one. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. We have two panelists here, uh, right. Stanford can join us. So let's move to the uh, supply chain for biodefense. David Starr, who is the assistant uh, commissioner, uh, the emergency field operations for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, David, we're grateful for your presence. And uh, Dr. Casey, I see up there uh, live, ready to go. Uh, interesting uh, background, but Director of Technological Hazards Division and Chair of the Federal Radiological Preparedness Coordinating Committee. Uh, just the, the re what you have to do there lends itself very, very appropriately into this whole supply chain question in biodefense as well for the FEMA. And so we appreciate the perspectives you bring. And I'm going to ask uh, David Starr to uh, commence with his uh, testimony. Then you, Dr. Casey, and then obviously, if you've been listening to uh, the panel, you'll be besieged with questions and probably pleading for mercy. Uh, <laughs> so you can move on. So uh, David Starr. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Lieberman, Governor Ridge, and members of the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. I'm David Starr. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Emergency Field Operations at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio and the City of New York, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel. It's truly appreciated. The New York City uh, Health Department has developed detailed plans and robust infrastructure to receive, distribute, and dispense medical countermeasures and supplies in the event of a biological attack. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program provides funding to New York City and, New York City and Health 
departments across the country to support this critical capability. In New York City, this includes significant warehousing and distribution capacity that enables us to rapidly stand up points of dispensing, known as pods, of course, that can dispense oral antibiotics to the city's entire population in response to an aerosolized anthrax release. After we validated our capacity for extremely rapid response in large scale exercises, the Strategic National Stockpile agreed to execute a licensing agreement with New York City to pre-position antibiotics in the local warehouse ready for immediate deployment. This action aligns with the recommendation in your 2015 report to forward deploy SNS assets to qualified jurisdictions in support of the broader goal of developing a comprehensive nationwide medical countermeasure response framework. We very much thank the Commission for its support and advocacy in this area. This capability proved critical to our response to shortages in the medical supply chain in the first wave of COVID-19, when the first wave of COVID-19 hit New York City. As you know, in the spring of 2020, New York City was the global epicenter of the pandemic. Hospitalization rates and ICU utilization soared, and the city suddenly faced skyrocketing demand for personal protective equipment, PPE. There was limited PPE in our local stockpile. We had maintained some stockpiles of N95s and other items in the past, but were constrained by the cost of storing and then replacing them as they expired. With the typical boom and bust cycle of federal emergency funding, we could not justify shouldering the cost of maintaining and replenishing large stockpiles of PPE. Over the past 15 years, New York City's public health emergency preparedness funding has been reduced by 35%. We chose to prioritize our ability to receive and distribute items, but not to stockpile. For that, we depended upon the federal government. Unfortunately, funding cuts affected the SNS as well. And as you know, the former director of the SNS stated in regard to PPE distributed during H1N1, that stock was never replenished because we never received additional appropriations. In early March, we began to distribute the PPE we had while we waited anxiously for federal assets from the SNS. The first shipment arrived on March 16th. It was far less than we expected and needed and a small fraction of what we received during H1N1. We received a similar small shipment the next week. The shelves of the SNS were empty. Supplies began to arrive from other federal agencies, but there was little coordination. When we asked for details on arriving product, they often had none. Trucks arrived with little to no notice at all hours, causing confusion and complicating warehouse receiving operations. We expanded our warehousing and distribution operation to a 24, seven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, receiving deliveries sometimes overnight and building PPE support packages of whatever we had on hand and making <laughs> weekly deliveries to New York City hospitals and nursing homes. We've developed a PPE allocation methodology with our partners at the Greater New York Hospital Association based on facility size and COVID patient burden and updated this allocation every week. As more product arrived, including items procured by the city, we broadened our reach. From March to August, we made over 4,000 deliveries to hospitals, nursing homes, adult care facilities, visiting nurse and home care agencies, congregate care settings, primary care providers, funeral homes, and COVID testing sites. In total, these deliveries amounted to over 53 million face masks, 7 million N95s, 30 million gloves, and millions of face shields, gowns, and other PPE. The experience during the first wave resulted in New York State and New York City instituting measures to shore up PPE supplies locally. New York State now requires hospitals and nursing homes to build and maintain their own PPE stockpiles, and New York City established a team to source product directly from manufacturers overseas and build a New York City PPE service center in preparation for a second wave of COVID-19. Based on these experiences, I would like to offer the following recommendations. <clears throat> First, increase and in stabilize public health funding and healthcare preparedness funding at federal, state, and local levels. New York City's warehousing and logistics capacity and the public health workforce needed to maintain it was built with entirely with CDC preparedness funding. It was the only reason we were able to respond so quickly and to process and distribute such huge quantities of PPE so effectively. It is critically important, too, that the SNS receive appropriate funding. The fact that the SNS was left unprepared to respond is unconscionable. This gap forced states and locals to question their assumptions of federal support and expend huge effort and funds to fill this gap, competing against each other during this ongoing fiscal crisis. Second, 
clarify the protocols for requesting medical supplies and other resources from the federal government. Confusion reigned as political leaders issued requests and responded to requests in public statements. State and local emergency management agencies made requests through FEMA and health departments made through requests through H HHS. A review of the resource request processes by FEMA and the HHS Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, under whose authority the SNS now operates, should be prioritized with formal processes promulgated across the federal government and to state and local leaders and authorities. Third, ease the burden of maintaining stockpiles through shelf life extension. There's already a process for extending the shelf life of doxycycline held in local stockpiles. In New York City, we have successfully applied for this shelf life extension twice in the last four years, resulting, saving us millions of dollars in replacement costs. However, we have been forced to dispose of many N95s over the years that were labeled expired. Uh, due to federal restrictions, we could not distribute them legally. The FDA should develop a similar process for extending the shelf life of PPE, particularly N95s. In closing, the challenges to the medical supply chain during this response have been unprecedented. We all know that. The medical supply chain is painfully complex and is designed for efficiency above all else and not resilience. These recommendations will not solve this overall lack of resilience, mm -hmm. but may, may mitigate its effects. On behalf of the city of New York, I'm grateful to the commission for giving me the opportunity to speak today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. If you don't mind, I'd like to say something. The next witness, Dr. Mike Casey, I have been giving you a hard time, Governor, because it seemed to me that a disproportionate number of the uh, witnesses and guests we've had before this commission are from Western Pennsylvania, where you're from. <laughs> but I'm very pleased to note on the biography of Dr. Casey, he's from New Haven, Connecticut, and he went to Southern Connecticut State University, one of mine. Ah, really. I and you proudly embrace his participation as all of us do. I do. Excellent. Okay, I turn it back to you. I just had to get that uh, parochial moment in there. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Once a senator, always a senator. Dr. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. It's an honor to join my distinguished colleagues in meeting with the Bipartisan Commission today. I'm Mike Casey from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. I'm the director of the Technological Hazards Division and co-chair of the Federal Radiological Preparedness Coordination Committee, or FRPCC. As a FEMA employee, I have the honor of serving the nation in a disaster role in addition to my day job. COVID-19 response, I was the FEMA lead for community-based testing, and I served with Rear Admiral Schwartz of the Public Health Service on the community-based testing sites, or CBTS task force. The mission of CBTS was to increase nationwide COVID-19 testing capacity through community-based testing sites that were federally supported, state managed, and locally executed. Later, the mission grew to include testing through a public-private partnership. After half the task force, CBTS merged with the laboratory diagnostics team to support testing nationwide. FEMA, as part of the Unified Coordination Group, or UCG, under the White House Task Force, supports HHS as the lead department for the National Response Framework. FEMA's role morphed over time from supporting to leading national coordination based on the needs of the nation and the strategic response. The FEMA approach to whole community and whole of government response continues to be federally supported, state managed, locally executed, and private sector enabled. FEMA's approach to logistical support for disaster response comes from national emergency management doctrine. FEMA's regional administrators are the face of the agency and our 10 FEMA regional offices are the front line of communication with state, local, tribal, and territorial, or SLTT partners. FEMA collaborates with counterparts from across government. For COVID-19, we have partnered with more than 40 federal department agencies, federal departments and agencies. Our coordination centers at the regional and national level function as the pathway to communicate local requirements through our state colleagues to the federal level. Resources are requested and distributed through a process that is already in place and utilized regularly by our partners 
for every disaster. However, our national model usually involves moving resources from unaffected areas to affected areas. In the current public health emergency, however, FEMA and our partners had to rapidly address the shortages of critical supplies and resources in an environment marked by increasing needs across the nation simultaneously. FEMA worked with partners from across the government and the private sector to address timely needs in support of the existing supply chain process, not as a replacement to it. In addition to noting our collaboration with HHS on the strategic national stockpile, I offer three quick examples of ways FEMA worked with partners to enhance resource procurement and distribution. One, decrease time to deliver critical resources. As part of the supply chain stabilization task force, FEMA and interagency partners aimed to efficiently maintain the country's existing medical supply chain infrastructure and supplement the supply chain through a variety of strategies, including Project Airbridge. Two, reduce complexity by leveraging existing procurement processes. FEMA and the Defense Logistics Agency, or DLA, coordinated the transition of procurement of personal protective equipment, or PPE, from FEMA to DLA. FEMA transitioning its contracts to DLA and DLA procuring PPE as requested by states and tribes. Three, utilization of the Defense Production Act, or DPA, in coordination with HHS. FEMA relied on the DPA as delegated to focus on increasing the production and distribution of ventilators, N95 masks, and medical countermeasures, or MCM. The DPA enables FEMA to leverage domestic industry's ability to supply materials and services in support of the national defense. In addition to using the DPA to protect essential health resources and combat material shortages, the federal government is also using the DPA to increase domestic manufacturing capabilities. Increasing domestic manufacturing through the DPA will help to ensure that in the future, U.S. preparedness for pandemics is not overly reliant upon the foreign production of medical supplies, which as we have seen may be vulnerable to supply chain disruptions. The National Blueprint for Biodefense highlighted two areas for this panel session. Regarding medical countermeasures, similar to our logistics model at FEMA, MCM planning is incorporated at the regional level in addition to the national level. MCM planning at both the national and regional levels is ongoing. In FY21, regional and urban areas security initiatives or UASI MCM plans will continue to be revised and incorporated into the regional biological incident annexes. The National Biological Incident Annex will also contain national MCM strategies. Our deliberate planning process is inherently an interagency one and is closely coordinated with HHS, CDC, and DOD, just to name a few key partners. Regarding the recommendation on the strategic national stockpile, FEMA continues to work in coordination with HHS on the current and future models for the SNS. Throughout the COVID-19 response, we followed the federal support model to distribute from the SNS. During the SNS distribution process, the federal government worked to balance each state's requests with the need to prioritize hotspots and locations in danger of depleting their own life-saving medical supplies within 72 hours. Emergency supply shortage notifications were relayed from the local level to state emergency managers or public health departments, who then passed them on to the Regional Response Coordination Center, or RRRC, to be vetted by FEMA, HHS, and CDC. These requests were then prioritized and shared with the National Response Coordination Center, or NRCC, to adjudicate. 
the NRCC had the benefit of a national perspective to inform the decision-making process. This national perspective incorporated understandings of the increasing or decreasing disease activity and its effects, a broad picture of where resources were needed most urgently, and an up-to-date status of resources available in the SNS. Bringing us here today is the opportunity and the obligation to examine our COVID-19 experience for insights to improve national preparedness going forward. FEMA is in the process of finalizing our initial after action report for the first nine months of the public health emergency. We hope to be able to share that soon. I mentioned in my introduction that one of my roles is to chair the FRPCC. Under this construct, FRPCC has coordinated with our federal partners to identify observations that directly and indirectly impact the nuclear and radiological preparedness community of practice and incorporate lessons to improve preparedness across our interagency mission space. FRPCC's areas of examination include coordinating structures and roles, responsibilities, and processes for prioritization of resources. Through FRPCC, we can execute recommendations that improve our planning for a national incident or involving a radiological or nuclear release to include federal coordination structure that employ multiple task forces, coordinated messaging and streamlined communication approval processes, scarce re resource prioritization, data synchronization, and multifaceted collaboration across government, private sector, and public entities. That concludes my prepared remarks subject to your questions. Again, I appreciate this opportunity to engage with the Bipartisan Commission on these crucial topics. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, gentlemen. We do have uh, quite a few questions, so I'll initiate a couple. I was, Commissioner Starr, I was intrigued by the notion, quite obviously, with some frustration as well as disappointment in the early stages of accessing vital PPE supplies. New York City took its own initiative to develop your own supply chain. Uh, I, I can only presume that it was effective. I'm wondering from your perspective if other major urban areas had to uh, take the same kind of initiative uh, because of the federal government prepared to not only anticipate, let's assume that uh, maybe they should, they shouldn't, but failed to accelerate their own acquisition uh, efforts in order to, to uh, to provide those supplies to you? Uh, in regard to other urban areas that um, uh, I can assume that they pursued similar courses of action, the, the PPE service center that was un undertaken by our, our mayor is a very robust stockpile that is in place currently to support the healthcare system in New York City through the second wave. I know that the state also embarked on an effort to build up a stockpile at the state level in conjunction even with other states. I believe it was Connecticut and New Jersey. There was an attempt to build a consortium of acquisition. I think what you saw is basically after those first few weeks of sort of desperation, everyone moved to, uh, I mean, I think we, we saw this, everyone moved to, a, to acquire whatever they could from wherever they could. And it really put us into a situation where, as I said, we were competing against each other because of the lack of sort of a coordinated response. So we ended up competing for supplies. And I think you've read, there've been multiple stories about that and all. And then of course the great, when we get involved in gray markets, you have these skyrocketing uh, uh, prices and things like that, people taking advantage. And in our case, they, we actually became an importer of record and imported directly from manufacturers in China to support the PPE stockpile. Now that program is not under me. So we, were, we are still the recipients as the health department. We have the relationship with the strategic national stockpile to receive um, strategic national stockpile warehouses, uh, 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 assets in our warehouse and then distribute them very rapidly, which thank goodness we had that capability in the spring. Um, but that program was sort of separate from this. And again, the, the question really is, is, is it, 
sustainable at the local level to build such enormous stockpiles when it's evident that even at the federal level, it seemed to be difficult to maintain over time. Appreciate that insight. Are you aware, and perhaps some of the panel members might uh, uh, better educate me, whether or not uh, the Defense Production Act was ever invoked and then applied uh, to uh, immediately to domestic manufacturers to uh, expedite uh, the uh, manufacture of this uh, critically needed equipment. Anybody aware of that? I just, there seemed to have been a vacuum. I don't know whether it's ever been deployed. I'm going to ask you, uh, Dr. Casey, are you aware of whether the DPA has been used to fill in uh, this, uh, uh, this gap uh, in supply? I, I don't think it has, sir, not, uh, certainly not to this scale. Um, we had a separate DPA task force that we stood up at the same time I was doing community-based testing. So, I, I mean, I was head down in my foxhole, they were head down in theirs, but, but it looked like they were looking at it for the first time and trying to figure out how to, uh, how to read it and make it apply. I appreciate that. Well, to that point, you know, you mentioned the role you had, uh, the Defense Logistics Agency was going to work through you with regard to distribution, presumably of PPE, and I presume with uh, once the therapeutics and vaccines are available, there'll be a critical component in the, not only the planning, but the execution of whatever that plan might be. And you mentioned the FEMA's role uh, working uh, with the Defense Production Act, increasing capacity with HHS. Is, is FEMA's role, uh, I, I guess I'm trying to say, would it be better that, that, that HHS work directly with DPA would be better that the Defense Logistic Agency work directly with the pharmaceuticals. If you can identify what is the specific role that FEMA has in those two areas. Yes, sir. I, you know, I, it, it, I know it was evolving from day one. And uh, I suspect that it continues to evolve because we haven't moved out of this. We're, we're still responding at the same time we're recovering from this, uh, uh, this disaster. And, and, but I'm not plugged into the White House task force today like I was uh, three or four months ago. A lot of those connections were made at that level. And the uh, challenge for FEMA and our other federal partners was to use what we had in place and make sure that we could integrate with the guidance we were, at, we were getting and the things that were being done at the White House level in order to make them uh, uh, fit reality on the ground. All right. Well, my colleagues have some questions. I may get back to you, but I want to defer to them for the time being. Senator Lieberman. Thank you. So uh, thanks to the two witnesses. Uh, Mr. Stark, give, give, give us a kind of a quick um, report um, uh, on uh, where New York uh, is now and going to be for the next two or three months. We've obviously all heard that the city schools have closed because the positivity rate here went uh, past the threshold. Um, does the city have enough supplies uh, to meet the, what may be an increasing demand over the next few months? Well, sir, thank you for that question. I think we hope so. Um, I can say that the, we, we base the calculations on the purchases and building up the citywide PP service center on uh, 60 to 90 days of PPE consumption um, at the peak in April, um, and that's separate from the requirements from New York State for the nursing homes and the hospitals to build up their own. The hospitals are required to have a 90-day supply on hand, and the nursing homes are required to have a 60-day supply on hand. So we think we're in a much better place. Of course, it's difficult to say where we're going to go, but we think we're in a much better place given the, the you know, we were caught completely right flat-footed in, in everybody, was, right. everybody was in January and February. So I think we are much, much better placed than we were then with the cushion that's in the hospitals, the, the citywide stockpile assets that we could request from the state. And then additionally, we're aware, we're gonna have no great detail on it, but we're aware that the strategic national stockpile has also been engaged in a pretty substantial procurement effort and we could potentially receive from them as well, so. Um, okay, thanks for that. Uh, second, you, you referred in your opening statement to um, the situation where the city and states were competing with one another for supplies. 
and uh, it, it uh, evokes a question that we uh, discussed with um, uh, one of the earlier witnesses today, which is um, which is whether our, our traditional American belief in federalism, you know, the, the autonomy and, and the importance of the states works in a national crisis like this, or whether there really needs to be either on an ongoing basis or certainly a, a, an extraordinary emergency power that can be invoked at the presidential level uh, to, uh, to avoid exactly that kind of competition between state and local uh, governmental entities, but to, to serve the national interest. Well, I'm not a political philosopher, but I would, I would agree with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, because we really felt like we were on our own. And there was, a, and also, you know, now a lot of people are looking back at the procurements that, that were made and things like that and sort of pointing fingers. Why did you buy that? Why did you do that? We weren't directly involved in procurement, but I can say that we really were in a, in a situation where we were buying things because they were better than nothing because we thought we would have nothing in a week. And it was terrifying. Yeah, well. So I, I would, right, I would, advocate for some sort of leadership and coordination, and we would be happy to participate. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, Dr. Casey, uh, thanks for your uh, testimony and for uh, what you've done. Um, uh, there was some, I was gonna ask a question about the Defense Procurement Act. You touched on it a little bit, but let me just focus my question and ask whether, um, and I know I'm taking you out of your uh, normal uh, jurisdiction, but Based on your experience, um, are there changes in the Defense Procurement Act itself, that is the law, uh, based on your experience this year that uh, you would recommend to Congress or us to recommend to Congress? Sir, I, I apologize, but I, I wouldn't presume to uh, <laughs> make up an answer to that question. I, again, at the time, I was uh, I was a consumer of the support of the SNS and the DPA. I was yeah. there trying to figure out how to get swabs to community-based testing sites across this country, and uh, so the clearly we weren't ready to use the DPA as a tool when this started. We're much more ready now, and we did it with what was already in place. We were just slow getting started on that. We're doing it now. We're continuing to do it. But whether or not we need legislative uh, support to do it better in the future, I'd, I would leave that for our legislative affairs folks. I know they're looking okay. at it, and that will be part of the uh, the overall lessons learned that FEMA is doing from the first nine months of this. Fair enough. Um, so let me, let me ask you this final question. Um, one of the things we discovered when we did our initial year of investigation leading to our report in 2015 was that there was there were a lot more uh, agencies and departments of the federal government that had some piece of what we came to call a biodefense enterprise, but they weren't they didn't have a leader. Uh, the federal OMB didn't even couldn't even tell us how much money was being spent on biodefense overall. So um, my question is this: from the FEMA perspective. Um, do you think you, you, you were you were given by somebody a, a clear piece of the responsibility uh, that was important here? In other words, there are a lot of different agencies involved. I think the public is kind of confused by it, although it doesn't really care so long as they, they, they get what they need to stay healthy. But as, as you look back at this year, um, was there adequate coordination between FEMA and other agencies with responsibility for responding to COVID-19? Short answer is we could always do better. We, uh, we got pretty good at this though, you know, the unif because we didn't create anything new for this. We right. took a standard approach. We pulled together a unified coordination group. It was chaired by Mr. Gaynor as the FEMA administrator. He had access in the White House at the secretary level. There was plenty of coordination that was going on there. Uh, with regard to the, you know, responding logistically, we already had the connect FEMA connections at the regional levels. We already knew how to 
request supplies and prioritize them. So back in that, in the March, April timeframe, what we focused on was doing things the way we had done the FEMA. We were imposing the FEMA way on the chaos in order, in order to plow through it. And, and again, that was never intended to be the perfect long-term solution, but it, it did allow us to, to impose some order on chaos back there in March and April. Um, and in that respect, it was, it was successful. Um, you know, Mr. Gaynor had the access and the ability to do what he, what he needed to do. Uh, and uh, so I, I guess that's probably the best I can give you. Yeah. Some. Okay, that's good enough. Thank you, Governor Ridge. So yeah, thank you, uh, Congressman Greenwood, Jim. Thank you, thank you. I have a, a set of, I think, something like four questions um, directed towards uh, Mr. Starr. Um, and, and Dr. Casey, if you have any comments uh, to add, I'd appreciate those. Um, the, the first is, and it's probably a pretty obvious answer, but um, you talked about the limitations of the stockpiles that the city and its hospitals were able to maintain. Um, had, uh, retrospectively, had CMS um, reimbursed hospitals for that kind of equipment, uh, and prospectively, should CMS uh, in the future do that? Is it safe to assume, it seems a pretty obvious answer, it's safe to assume that the, the, the stockpiles that the city's hospitals could maintain would be far more sufficient? Yes, I believe so. I think, I think that's, it is, it's, it's money, it's funding. And one of the advantages of maintaining stockpiles at the hospital level is that they can actually consume them and rotate. So eventually you're only paying for that extra stock that's being maintained. You're not actually buying it uh, just to sit there in a warehouse. If you, you know, you're just paying for the ha maintain. The problem is, of course, we all know the medical supply chain is extremely efficient um, and, and is trying to save money and holding extra, t extra stock costs money. So um, yes, that seems like a reasonable, uh, a reasonable proposition um, and a way for the federal government to get directly involved at that level. And secondly, you, you called upon the FDA to extend the shelf life of some of this uh, PPE. Mm -hmm. um, and, and by that, did you mean, which of these, these two things? Did you mean that you think they actually, the, the current uh, equipment that's available in the marketplace should actually have a, a longer shelf life and FDA should recognize that? Or were you saying that FDA standards for this equipment <clears throat> should require that they be constructed, manufactured with longer shelf lives? I think I'm saying closer to the first. Um, what happens now is that you get uh, an N95 with a, with a, some of them have closed code expirations. You, you can't read it. You have to get the code to translate the, the number to know that it's expired five years from this date, you know, or uh, the manufacturer date or, or, whether, or it expires on this date. Often those, those devices, particularly the N95s are perfectly fine. Um, particularly if they've been maintained in a in the proper warehouse environment, what they what the FDA has done with doxycycline, and we advocated for this for years, um, is many local jurisdictions maintain these pharmaceuticals in a local stockpile, uh, and then are forced to throw them out when they reach their expiration date. And the FDA a few years ago released guidance saying if you provide testing results and evidence to show that you store these products uh, properly and give us uh, and and have them tested and do stability testing in a lab, provide us those results, the FDA will then offer you, say you have two, year, two more years past the labeled expiration date on that product. That's for doxycycline, that's in place. But like I said, we've applied for it twice already and it's literally saved us multiple millions of dollars in replacement costs on our doxycycline stockpile. If they were able to do a similar thing with, the, with uh, uh, N95s, if we had stockpiled n 90 in the past we've thrown away N95s because they were past their expiration and we couldn't, um, at the time, we, we couldn't reasonably get, offer them to someone when they were labeled expired. Uh, we actually tried that at the beginning of the Ebola crisis where we had three M N N95s that we wanted to donate and they had expired a month before and not to, you know, 3M engineers got on the phone with us and said, they're perfectly fine if you've been storing them in a proper environment, but we couldn't get documentation that stated that. So the potential recipient said, we can't knowingly hand these out without documented approval from the manufacturer that, that they're effective. So we ended up auctioning those off as, as uh, simple face masks and the 
the purchaser had to sign a thing saying they could never be used for medical, you know, in a medical setting as an N95. Um, if we could look at a similar approach to what they do with doxycycline, we could submit and say, we have these, we have temperature records on how they were stored. We did the physical checks to make sure the elastic bands are still, you know, the, there's no loss of integrity there and then get authorization. These are now good for, which the FDA actually did. Of course, they issued those emergency use authorizations that allowed us to distribute um, N95s, particularly the 3M and the Halyard models that are so common in the healthcare system. They did offer that, but it was only after the fact. And I know, um, you know, if we knew that, we, we wouldn't have thrown the N90, N95s away in years past thinking that we could never distribute them. So if we could do that prospectively, then we'd be as, in a similar place that we are, we're in with our doxycycline stockpile, where we yeah. can say these N95s are good and approved. Yeah, I mean, they would, I, I don't know anything about the technology of the manufacturer, but it, 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 they seem like they should be fairly durable. Um, and if I were cynical, I'd uh, think somebody was involved in planned obsolescence to sell more of them, but I, I won't be quite that cynical today. Um, and and the last talk. question I have is um, with regard to ventilators. So we had this, you know, frantic um, chase to to find ventilators, to share ventilators, to to use DPA to get more ventilators. Um, uh, in it, had you had resources not been a limiting factor, would hospitals in, uh, in New York City have stockpiled more ventilators, or would they just not have anticipated that ventilators, you know, under the the realities of COVID nineteen, that ventilators would have been so critical and needed in such volume? Well, I can't, I can't presume to respond on the hospital system in New York City's behalf. Um, I do know that we were well, well aware of the ventilator stockpile at the, at the SNS and ended up receiving uh, about 2,400 ventilators that we pushed almost immediately out to all the hospitals in the city. And we received another 900 or so from the state government through that were SNS ventilators that they had received and then they pushed them to New York City. And we, so we ended up putting out about 3,100 ventilators to the hospitals. And after that initial wave, um, we had a few request, emergency requests from the few hundred that we held back. And then they're really stabilized at that point. And we didn't receive any emergency requests from the hospitals. At this point, I'm not sure if people are aware of the process. The SNS is now allowing us to keep ventilators in the hospitals. They'd like us to recover the ones due for preventive maintenance, and then they're willing to replace them. So we're, our goal right now, and we're actually in the process of doing this, is recovering these ventilators that are due for preventive maintenance, and then replacing them with uh, uh, newer, different models in some case, uh, SNS ventilators. That's, that's a difficult one. And I think because that's that's involving it's not like a consumable PPE mm -hmm. item you're mm -hmm. involved you're asking them to maintain uh, a stockpile of equipment that is very expensive to maintain properly too. New York City had a stockpile of ventilators at one point years ago we had about 500 and over the over the years similar to the PPE it just became cost prohibitive to maintain them we had to do uh, year annual maintenance checks and things and it just became too expensive to maintain over time and we ended yeah. up disposing of those as well this is my last point, but the, 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 uh, I know that the standard of care is to use ventilators less frequently now. Um, so do you feel that the city is going to have sufficient numbers of ventilators, given this huge surge that we're seeing now, to get you through the you know, first or second quarter of next year when we think that most people will be vaccinated? Right. Um, I think we're in a very similar position that we were in the PPE. I didn't mention it, but the city also embarked on its own ventilator stockpile. So we now have, so A, the hospitals have purchased additional ventilators on their own, sometimes using grant funding that we had provided them. Uh, B, we have this, uh, these 2,400 SNS ventilators that are, we're offering to keep in the hospitals indefinitely from what we've heard from the SNS. So that's 2,400 extra that we had, didn't have in the spring. And then C, it's that the, there is a, a ventilator, a city ventilator cache as well. Um, similar to the PPE service center, where hospitals, if they get a, in a pinch and we don't have any SNS ventilators to offer, they can order ventilators from that site as well. So I think uh, we're much better place than we were again in the spring, as you can, as we would all hope we would be. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yield back. Ken. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate the comments. Just uh, just one follow on question. Just in terms of PPE and ventilators, you know, you talked about the cash, uh, what you have in terms of cash that can be drawn on. If things spiral out of control beyond what's even predicted, um, what's your confidence in the surge manufacturing capability, um, both for PPE and for um, ventilators? Is it, uh, I mean, obviously that was a big problem seven, eight months ago. You think there's a, a better, more functional on switch in terms of manufacturing at this point, if there's a, you know, for whatever reason, things even get worse as we lead into the spring? I, I really don't have any visibility on that at my level. <laughs> so I can't, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Okay, fair enough, Professor. fair enough. I know that we built a local production as well. I didn't mention in my remarks, but we were manufacturing tens of thousands of face shields locally in some of our light manufacturing areas, as well as gowns, disposable okay. and reusable gowns. It's impressive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks, um, and appreciate your comments. Yeah, thank you, Ken. I have, I have one more question uh, for Dr. Casey. <clears throat> You know, you were mentioned to me that you were, uh, FEMA led the community-based testing task force or something of that sort. And you know, there's been so much attention paid to the development of uh, therapeutics and vaccines. And yet, even before you get to that exceptional success that appears, you appear to be on the threshold of some really remarkable achievements in this space. I get a sense that there remains a challenge with the quality and quantity and efficiency, accuracy, I guess a better term, of testing. And the need for testing would seem to be to be a critical and precedent to the therapeutics and the diagnostics. Can you give me some insight as to whether or not FEMA has encouraged up through the appropriate powers it be to the task force a need to spend as much time accelerating the development of quality testing capability and providing a nationwide distribution of that capability or whether or not it is just still in process what I consider to be a, a, a modest rollout, modest attention but not the same attention that therapeutics and vaccines have been given. Gotcha. I, I don't have visibility into the complete FEMA role, but I come from the preparedness side of the house at FEMA. And I know how we're working through our FEMA regions with our states on uh, mass vaccination planning. What to do when, when this is available? What's the process going to be? How can the state get prepared for this and have thought through what the priorities are, how the distribution is going to be handled. You know, we, we, with, with one vaccination, we have the uh, you know, extremely cold uh, uh, requirements. Uh, in other cases, those aren't there. There are real challenges. Uh, you know, we were talking the other day to Alaska uh, and the, the challenges of uh, vaccination, they're very, very different than they are in Hawaii or where they are in California. So um, that's an area where I know that FEMA is involved up to our eyeballs in helping our state partners prepare for exactly that. Along the way, I know that we're plugged in to um, what's going on at the White House as it's being managed, uh, but I personally am no longer on the White House task force. So I don't know to what extent FEMA is driving that, um, but we're on the calls. And we also know that at the end of the day, we have to work with our SLTT partners to make sure this is done right. And that's a whole lot easier done beforehand rather than after. So we're trying to be as proactive as we can to uh, make sure that we're capturing those lessons learned. You know, when we started community-based testing back in, in March, the day I walked in, um, you know, the, our, our national capability was zero. We didn't have any sites. And we were so proud when we got to 30 pilot sites. And then we shot for 100. And then we shot for 200. And when I left, you know, three months or so into this, there were more than 600 community-based test sites out there. And of course, 
that point, we were working with industry partners. Now it's Walgreens, it's CVS. The same kind of partners now that we're, because it's a mature partnership, we can work with them on how are we going to handle this vaccination? Uh, what's the best way to distribute it? How can we how can we base this distribution on their strengths rather than our weaknesses? So I think we've learned a lot in that respect, sir. Well, I, I appreciate the candid answer. I, I like it when someone says I don't have visibility, which means that uh, uh, you've, you, you've avoided very appropriately giving me a specific answer to a specific question because you're not certain. And I've found that uh, it's best to say you don't have specific knowledge and try to uh, pretend that you do. Your comments with regard to your collaboration with the states have been very effective and I appreciate that input. I'll just conclude uh, that even in, in my limited visibility into testing, some communities can do it quicker than others. Some testing sites you can get there and get an answer within a couple of hours. Some testing sites you wait a couple of days. Some testing sites the cost is modest. Some testing sites the cost is extreme. So before you get to therapeutics and, and vaccines, it would also be good, I think, nationwide to have comparable capabilities throughout this country for testing to determine who needs initially the therapeutics and who should get the vaccines. But that's not in your bailiwick and that's not FEMA's responsibility. I pre appreciate uh, your observations with regard to your sustained work, however, on community-based testing because that's act Actually, when we can build out that capacity, that's where it has to be conducted. So thank you for your input. I'm going to ask my colleagues if there's any further questions to this panel. No, thanks. Well, I appreciate it, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for your continued commitment. Every, both of you have other unique roles in this uh, national response, and we thank you for your public service. Thank, thank you. you for the opportunity, sir. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a, a, a excellent full day. We learned a lot. Um, one, one thing I would say in passing, I, I was fascinated. I thought Dr. Shinoy, who, who as you said, Tom, is really impressive. Wow, what a star. Uh, I thought she said at one point that she set up an, a COVID-19 incident command in the third week of January. Did I, did I hear that right? But I heard that was fascinating. So, I mean, I was, I, it's it's sort of a, a side issue, but all that focus um, on when we knew that this was going to be a pandemic, uh, and uh, how how much we could have, how how much better we could have done if we faced it early on, and of course, then compounded by the conversation that President Trump had with Bob Woodward. But anyway, that was really interesting. One infectious disease expert, a star, obviously, at a great hospital, Mass General, but third week in January, she, she knew enough, I guess, from within the field uh, to uh, set up an incident command. So um, I thought it was a great hearing, and we learned a lot. I think it, 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 enough, everything we hear, to me, says that we were we built a very strong and accurate foundation in our 2015 report, but there's an awful lot left to do uh, in implementing the report and in assimilating uh, the COVID-19 experience. Uh, and I know that's what our team are working on in the uh, report that they're preparing uh, for us to issue in uh, January. Uh, and then now we've moved beyond that in a way, but necessarily so uh, with the um, Apollo project. The other thing I'd say in passing is that, you know, and I worked on this when I was in the Senate, how do you get the pharmaceutical industry interested in developing medical countermeasures to events that are unpredictable? Um, because it takes a lot of money to develop a vaccine or medical countermeasure. And of course, that's part of why we created BARDA. Um, but here, because this was such a, a life-threatening crisis, I mean, the government, not, not only the private sector saw a demand, a market, 
but the government poured an awful lot of money into it, and it's really been amazing what they can do. So I think it sort of says to us that this Apollo project idea is a good idea if we seize on this moment and provide uh, either incentives for private sector funding or continued significant uh, public sector funding. You know, the, our, our technology and, uh, is able, to, not ours, but the skill of the industry is really able to, to prepare us in remarkable ways for the next, um, next time this happens. And then just the last thing, if, if this is in the way of closing remarks, I thought Lamar Alexander was very helpful and um, he's so solid, you know. His three priorities are pretty interesting ones because we have goals way beyond that and the country should too, but you got 53, now 52 without him, but uh, the, the overwhelming majority of Republicans in the Senate is on board this. It's not enough, but it's a good start. Uh, for something uh, positive. So those are my closing comments, my friend. And it's been, a, I thought a very, it's a, a very worthwhile day. And I thank the staff for putting together such a great group of witnesses. Thank you. I want to make a couple of comments, but first, uh, Ken or Jim, your thoughts? Uh, I'll jump in. And just to respond to, to Joe's comment about the pharmaceutical industry, um, the, what we've learned is in, in order to, to incentivize the industry, um, first, the government has to be very clear about what it wants. Um, they can't expect uh, companies to go out and invent things and say, you want this? Do you want that? Uh, right. Government has to say, this is what we're looking for. The second thing is the government has to say, and if you make it, we will buy it. You know, yeah. I, mentioned that, I mentioned that there was something like 197, um, 194 vaccines under development right now, and 54 in human beings. We heard about the, the spectacular results on a couple of them. Most of them will fail. Now, the investors that are investing in those companies know that most of them will fail. So they have to have some confidence that when those that succeed, succeed, the government is going to buy it and stock buy it because nobody else is going to buy it. This, this, is, not a, a, you know, this is not for the marketplace. Um, so that's, uh, that, we, that, that, that recipe works um, when, it's, when it's followed by the federal government. So that's very well said, uh, Jim. Yeah. And incidentally, I think those two asks by the pharmaceutical industry are totally fair and reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Ken? Yeah, just briefly, I guess um, today sort of reinforced our, my belief, our belief that, you know, what we've been doing for the last five years is pretty central to the security of our country. And I, I gotta say that in 2015, I never dreamed that it would be as central as it is today. Um, and I guess all our, our hard work was um, even more critical than I thought it would be. And so this is all very current um, and very, you know, very critical. I guess that then leads me to the point that both Senator Alexander and Senator Liebman made, which is, I can't remember whose analogy was whose, but I think yours was the surfing analogy that uh, we catch the right wave. And, um, and I think that applies to us, right? And we've talked about how we're well positioned to sort of catch that wave and help the rest of the country catch the wave. And look, I took Senator Alexander's remarks as being very heartfelt about um, how meaningful our recommendations are and how, how they're embraced by the people across the political spectrum. All of which I think just counsels as we've discussed in the past few meetings that, you know, we shouldn't be shy about pushing forward our thoughts, our role in whatever goes, whatever happens in the future, and um, the role of both our, our work, our written work, but also us as a group, um, because I think we're well positioned to actually make a difference and we're ahead of a lot of other people on this issue. So just sort of uh, encouraging ourselves to be aggressive. Catch that wave. A couple of quick observations. I want to just, uh, um, on a more granular level, I thought it was a very productive uh, session. Senator Alexander recognized three of the many recommendations uh, that he and his colleagues uh, didn't give them the, the, the view four or five years ago. Um, I mean, I, it's a shame 
that we are only stimulated to think and act anew around crisis. Maybe that's the very nature of democracy. Rarely do you hold press conferences and say we anticipated a problem five or 10 years from now, and this is a solution to a problem that doesn't exist, but in case it ever rears its head, we are prepared to deal with it. Maybe that's just a challenge, but I really thought his notion, I think you're, uh, uh, you're right, uh, Ken, let's, let's catch that wave. Uh, maybe for those three recommendations now, but clearly uh, a more fulsome and comprehensive uh, set of recommendations and maybe under the new administration might be more w willing to embrace it. Mm -hmm.